Justice Kampepe also advised you that the live streaming has started. Tandewe. Good morning. I'm the Registrar Clerk for this hearing. Presiding Justice Kampepe and Justices of the Constitutional Court, all counsel are online. I call the matter of the Lani and South African Human Rights Commission and another for hearing. Council are now invited to place themselves in record. Please note that this hearing is being recorded. May it please the court, Justices, I appear for the applicant in this matter with my learned junior, Douglas Ainsley. May it please the court, I appear together with Ms. Moropa, Mr. Mohoto, and Mr. Ramukhale for the South African Human Rights Commission, the second, the first respondent. As court please, Justices, I'm here on behalf of the second respondent together with my learned friend, Ms. Nembe. May it please the court, my learned friends, Ms. Steinberg, Ms. Kruti, Mr. Sandro Kazana, and I appear for the Holocaust Center. Justice Kampepe, members of the court, I appear with Mr. Smith, Ms. Kasim, and Ms. Buchler for the second amicus curiae, the Psychological Society of South Africa. May I please the court, I appear for the third amici curiae, the Women's Legal Center, together with my learned friend, Ms. Pithy. May I please the court, I appear for the fourth amicus, the Southern African Litigation Center. May it please the court, uh, Justice Kampepe, members of the court, I appear for the Freedom of Expression Institute. May it please the court, Justice Kampepe and members of the court, I appear together with Mr. Ben Winks and Ms. Karabo Raganya for the sixth amicus curia, the Nelson Mandela Foundation. May it please the court, I appear for Media Monitoring Africa, the seventh amicus, together with my learned friends, Mr. Budlander and Mr. Mbakiwa. Mr. Oppenheimer, you may proceed to make your submissions. Uh, thank you, Justice Kampepe. Uh, I'll start by setting out a, a brief background to this matter. Um, and, and then proceed to deal with um, the applicant's main submissions. So the genesis of this matter is that Mr. Polani, the applicant, uh, published an article entitled, uh, Call Me Names, But Gay Is Not Okay. Uh, the article was accompanied by a cartoon of a man marrying a goat. Now, it is common cause that Mr. Polani was not the author of the title, uh, nor played any role in the cartoon. The substance of the article, um, he expresses the opinion that homosexuality is immoral, uh, and he expressed the desire that the constitution be changed um, to um, remove uh, the ability for gay people to be married. He was, uh, the, the, the newspaper, The Sunday Sun, then received a number of complaints about the article, which were then published, in which members of the public expressed um, their disdain for the article um, and their disdain for Mr. Kulani's um, beliefs about the nature of homosexuality. The Human Rights Commission uh, then instituted action in the Equality Court um, and Mr. Kulani raised a constitutional challenge uh, to Papuda, which is the, um, the legislation that was uh, used to institute the charge of hate speech against Mr. Kulani. Um, the, the High Court ultimately found that um, Section 10, the hate speech uh, section of the act uh, was constitutional. Uh, Mr. Kulani then appealed um, and was successful on appeal before the Supreme Court of Appeal. And in that, in that finding, um, the Supreme Court found that the rights of freedom of expression in section 16 of the constitution had been limited in a number of important ways. So firstly, um, Section 16.2c of the Constitution limits um, the number of um, group categories to four uh, in terms of uh, who receive hate speech protection. 
and the Supreme Court noted that the number of categories in uh, Papuda um, far exceeds this and that it includes uh, 18 categories. Um, furthermore, the Supreme Court took the view that um, the list of categories in 10 um, 1A to C had to be read disjunctively in the sense that there was no uh, and between them. Now, what the act refers to is um, speech that is hurtful, uh, harmful, or incites harm, or prop propagates or promotes hatred. Um, and the SDA found that um, um, the disjunctive reading of this would um, mean that speech doesn't necessarily have to include the advocacy of hatred, nor the incitement to harm, um, which is specifically spelled out in the Constitution. Um, it noted then that the, the test for hate speech in the, in the Act was much stricter uh, than that set out in the Constitution. Um, furthermore, there was the concern that the term hurtful um, is, is not a term that is generally found in our law. It is not found uh, in the Constitution, which refers to the terms harm and violence, um, and that hurtful should be underst understood to refer to a person's subjective emotions and feelings. Um, and that this did not equate with causing harm or incitement to harm. And ultimately, this meant that um, the prohibition was an unjustifiable um, limitation uh, on the free speech right and went far beyond um, the, the categories of speech that are not protected by the Constitution. Um, furthermore, the, the court found that the proviso in Section 12 um, was was not intelligible um, and uh, did not safeguard speech uh, in a manner that was in accordance with with uh, the constitutional protections of free speech and ultimately that um, the act then was overly broad um, the court did find however that there was sufficient evidence um, to add to the four categories of race gender ethnicity and religion um, the category of sexual orientation and the court found that there was evidence uh, in the High Court um, about the LGBTI community being a vulnerable group um, that then warranted inclusion um, and ultimately made an order striking down um, Section 10 of the Act as it stands uh, and creating an interim remedy so that, um, that there is still the possibility of, of hate speech being curtailed and that this interim remedy um, would largely mirror the prohibitions on speech in the constitution with the inclusion of the term uh, sexual orientation. So that interim remedy reads that no person may advocate hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, or sexual orientation, and that constitutes an incitement to cause harm. Um, the, the applicant uh, supports the, the finding of the Supreme Court of Appeal. I'll, I'll now turn to um, the scope of um, of the right to free speech as found in um, section 16 of the constitution. And really it's a, it, there's a two stage inquiry. So the first is to understand uh, free speech as set out in uh, 16, one of the constitution. And then the second is to sort of, to see what has been removed from that right by section 16, two. And section 16, two um, prohibits or, or gives parliament the right to prohibit um, um, speech which is either propaganda for war, the incitement of imminent violence, or hate speech, which is the advocacy of hatred on the, the grounds of race, gender, ethnicity, and religion, and that constitutes an incitement to cause harm. Now, those particular terms um, warrant some interpretation so that it is clear um, what exactly Parliament has the power to prohibit. Now, the term harm um, and the particular phrase incitement to cause harm implies that it is not that the words themselves uh, are the direct cause of the harm, but rather that there is a call to action in the form of incitement that um, third parties um, are being encouraged uh, or called upon to cause harm to one of those, those vulnerable groups that are listed in the constitution. Um, in, incitement means that it must amounted instigation or active persuasion of others to cause the harm. 
And in our criminal law, when we talk about incitement, it's the idea that the speaker is trying to uh, reach and seek to influence the mind of another um, so that there is this, um, this call to action. Now, the term hatred um, has been dealt with in the Canadian case of R versus Kirkstra. Um, and the idea is that hatred is not a word of uh, casual connotation. Um, to promote hatred is to instill detestation, enmity, ill will, and malevolence in another. Clearly, an expression must go a long way before it qualifies. So we're not talking about um, mere expressions of distaste, um, that it must be a, a severe um, form of malevolence um, for it to amount to hatred. And in the, in the matter of Moyo before the Supreme Court of Appeal, uh, that court held that unless hate speech, incitement of imminent violence, or propaganda for war, as described in Section 16.2 of the Constitution, are involved, no one is entitled to be insulated from opinions and ideas that they do not like, even if those ideas are expressed in a way that places them in fear. Indeed, in present-day South Africa, many will be afraid of the political and social possibilities that are advocated for daily in high-stakes debates that characterize a transforming society with a violent, racist past. Obviously, this may place many South Africans in a condition of subjective or reasonable fear, but that does not entitle them to expect the state to lock up those whose chosen form of expression place them in, in such a state of fear, or might reasonably but not have placed them in fear. Every exp even expressive acts that create reasonable fear deserving of constitutional protection, unless they are accompanied by threats of violence in which the person making the threat is capable of acting, or they constitute unprotected expression in terms of 16.2 of the Constitution. Um, fear creating expressive acts are lawful, even if they are aggressive and hostile. The court then referred to the matter of HOTS versus UCT, um, where it was said that a court should not be hasty to conclude that because language is angry in tone or conveys hostility, it is therefore to be characterized as hate speech, even if it has, even if it has overtones of race or ethnicity. The court recognized that in guaranteeing freedom of expression, the, the constitution also placed limits on its exercise. Thus, where it goes beyond a passionate expression of feelings and views, and becomes the advocacy of hatred based on race or ethnicity and constitutes incitement to cause harm, it oversteps those limits and loses its constitutional protection. Mr. Oppenheimer, your 10 minutes has expired. Uh, thank you, Justice Compeppe. Uh, Mr. Uh, Oppenheimer, if I, if I may, uh, just before you move on, just to, to, to turn to some of your initial um, submissions. <clears throat> May I just preface what I'm going to ask you by saying that I think in the, in the greater scheme of things, these two matters, matters are of lesser importance uh, in my view. But I want to deal with two aspects, this disjunctive, conjunctive uh, distinction and the finding by the SEA and also this uh, finding uh, of, of, uh, that it's a subjective test. Uh, as I say, I think it's of lesser importance compared to some of the other complexities, but just on the question of con disjunctive. The SEA finds that absent the word uh, and in the subsections of section 10 one, there's a, uh, it concludes that uh, this, must, this must be uh, interpreted disjunctively. But equally, there's no or either. So at best, isn't it just neutral then? What do you say about that? That's the first question. I'll come to the second one shortly. I'm gonna leave you just with the first one for now. What I'm saying uh, is there's no or either. Yes, Justice. Um, it's the, the SEA's reasoning is partly in relation to how um, 10.1b is written as well. So the list says A, be hurtful, B, be harmful, or to incite harm. Um, and they state that the presence of that or in B and the presence of an or in C uh, indicates that the entire list should be read as ors. Um, and that if the legislature wanted to make it clear that this was a conjunctive list, that they would have included the ands. Um, but on that point, uh... If we, as the Constitution implores us to do, should read this in consonance with the, with the, bill, with the rights uh, encompassed in the Bill of Rights, shouldn't we afford it a conjunctive hearing to, 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 to attain that objective? Whether we do obtain that objective is another question altogether, but shouldn't we then turn to a conjunctive reading to, uh, to achieve what the Constitution uh, requires of us as a court? Um, Justice, that may be an option available to the court. It would require um, 
not not merely inserting ands in between a b and c but also including an and in b um, which is that be harmful and uh, to incite harm um, for it to be constitutionally compliant um, there is a distinction drawn between speech which is directly harmful and speech which calls upon others uh, to perform harms and that if the, the the constitution refers to incitement to harm then it must be made clear as, as is made uh, clear in uh, the Kamalo case, um, authored by Justice uh, Sutherland, uh, that there must be that additional and. Um, that, that may be uh, a manner of, of uh, saving those sections to make them more constitutionally compliant, but they're not sufficient. Um, there are other concerns with the section um, that, that deviate um, from what the Constitution requires. Um, namely, the, the Constitution um, refers to the term advocacy um, which is to actively endorse um, hatred, um, whereas the Act um, talks about publication, propagation, advocacy, or mere communication. Um, and so that's enlarging beyond those bounds uh, creates a difficulty, uh, as does the, the uh, subjective question on, on intention and the sort of ambiguity around that torturous phrase um, could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention too. That, that phrase has been interpreted in different ways by different courts. Um, so there is also Sorry, this may, I, may, may I interrupt you because I share those concerns. I'd rather concentrate on the ones where I, where I appear to differ from you. So, so let me back, get back to the second and last question from my side for this uh, first part is this question of uh, an objective and a subjective uh, interpretation of the SEA. The SEA said this is a subjective test. But do the words not mean that a reasonable person could conclude uh, that, it, or, that the, the, the author of those words had the clear intention to cause the prohibited consequences? In other words, an objective test. And with that question, I'd like you to consider the submission made by one of the Amiki, that's the Holocaust Foundation, which says, because this is a statutory delic, one could call it a statutory delic, that the approach in defamation and injuria cases would then be opposite. So isn't this an objective test then? Well, Justice, I would submit that if the threshold um, is to look at delict, then uh, it should just say in, intends, um, as opposed to the use of this phrase. Um, really, what it should be is, um, did the speaker have the intention to advocate hatred um, and incite harm? That, that is what uh, the Constitution really should require. What we have here is this ambiguity as to what, what the test really is. Um, the, the SCA... Um, look at the work of the, um, the academic um, Cathy Albertain. Um, and there the finding is that, that the term could is also of concern um, because it's, in other words, doesn't imply would, but just that it is a reasonable possibility to infer. Um, and, um, and that what we have then is the, the subjective state of the reader as opposed to the subjective state of the person making, making the claim. Um, so at um, page 272 of bundle four of the record um, where the SEA judgment is um, at paragraph 66, the court says, in relation to the words being reasonably construed to demonstrate a clear intention to have any of the results set out in the sections, Albertain et al um, state the test is not one strictly of actual intention. It does not require that a reasonable person would interpret the, con the conduct in such a way only that it is possible that it may construe it in this way. Um, now, what the constitution requires is the actual constitution um, of, of incitement. Um, so it, it must constitute incitement to cause harm as opposed to the idea that a reasonable reader um, could view it as, as hurtful um, uh, or even, even if it was uh, that that full uh, incitement to harm, um, there there is a there is a vast difference between those two tests. Mr. Oppenheimer, thank you, Mr. Mr. Oppenheimer. Uh, if one accepts the conjunctive uh, interpretation, what would happen to para A, that is the hateful part? Would that be redundant, or is it covered under B, be harmful? Where it says be harmful, or does that mean that the hateful part means something more than the head, the harm? Um, I, I think to provide 
if, if it was to be read conjunctively, hurtful and harmful would have to bear different kinds of meanings. Uh, the ordinary meaning of the term hurtful appears to be to cause emotional distress. Um, harm would move beyond that, but to some sort of um, physical harm um, or also to a psychological harm. And the difference between emotional distress and psychological harm is that an emotional distress is temporary. One may feel a flight of anger or sadness in the moment, um, but psychological harm is severe in the sense that someone has something like um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which requires um, treatment from a medical professional. So they are different. Uh, if, there, if there was an and to be included after hurtful and harmful and incite harm, um, then it would, um, it would be adding more protections for speech um, and it wouldn't necessarily require that hurtful be struck out, um, but it is vital to be constitutionally compliant that incitement to harm uh, is a requirement, not mere harmfulness itself. Um, that the, the concern that the constitution addresses is this calling on others um, to harm the vulnerable group. Uh, and that, that is very different from direct speech. Will that not add an extra requirement to section uh, beyond those in section 16.2c? Uh, it, it, would be, it would be adding an extra requirement, um, but the, the constitution um, grants parliament powers to regulate speech. It doesn't create an obligation in section 16.2c on what must be regulated. So parliament would be free to be uh, less restrictive on speech um, than as set out. It's just merely not protected speech. Can I just check? I don't want you to divert from, from your plan. Will you address the meaning of hateful concerning the issue of, or regarding or pertaining to the issue of vagueness? Because as presently advised, I worry about uh, whether hateful in fact is clear at all. And I also worry about whether hateful, what is hateful to A is, could also be said to be hateful to B. So you don't have to uh, address my concern now, uh, but if it's opportune for you, please do. And if, if it's opportune to deal with it later, uh, please feel free. Uh, Justice Chiki, I will deal with it now. Uh I accept that there is a concern that the term hateful is hurtful is vague, um, that it appears to have been interpreted by the parties in this matter in a variety of different ways. Um, some have tried to take the view that hurtful must be read to be the same as harmful, um, and, or that it must be elevated to some sort of uh, severe uh, psychological um, harm. Um, and, and I think the difficulty is that we don't have a legal precedent for that term hurtful. Um, which means that we we're in a situation where it's hard to determine what it actually means and what it's required. And, and that of course is vitally important because when a person speaks or publishes, they need to know in advance whether they're going to be breaching um, the hate speech provision or not. Um, and so that ambiguity uh, creates, creates doubt um, and, uh, and, and ultimately can have a chilling effect where someone might want to say something that would in fact be protected, but they're afraid from doing so because they're unsure about the meaning of the terms. And it seems to me that this is what this court cautioned against in affordable medicines. Yes, Justice. Mr. Oppenheimer, just to revert back to what my system plant uh, posed a question on, if this court were to adopt a conjunctive reading of section 101A to C, what constitutional concerns, I, I, can you hear me? Yes, Justice. What constitutional concerns do you see with the section, if any? Well, the, the additional concern is this use of the term prohibited grounds. Um, now, prohibited grounds includes 18 grounds, um, as in section one, um, but it also goes beyond that. Um, so not only does it include grounds like um, uh, belief and culture and language, uh, marital status. It also, um, uh, there's an ambiguity in that further grounds can be added. So uh, under A, the grounds are listed, and then under B, it says any other ground where discrimination based on the other ground causes or perpetuates systemic disadvantage, undermines human dignity, 
or adversely affects the equal enjoyment of a person's rights and freedoms in a serious manner that is comparable to discrimination on grounds in, in A. Now, the concern there is that a speaker might um, talk about a group that is not explicitly mentioned um, and then still be held liable in that after the fact of the speech, a, a, an equality court can say, well, we're going to create that ground. Um, so, for example, um, it, it may be the case that um, a, uh, a journalist um, feels that they are being targeted and that people have said um, um, uh, things about journalists and that they then ask for that ground to be added um, or any other of any other range of grounds could be added on the spot without the speaking knowing in advance. Um, but Mr. Oppenheimer, Mr. Oppenheimer, but that uh, all that uh, that does is to mirror what our law says with regard to the concept of unfair discrimination. Uh, yes. So you should, you should you should you should complain about that jurisprudence as well. Um, well, to my mind, there there's a, a sharp distinction to be drawn um, between uh, discrimination and the prohibition on discrimination as set out in Section Nine of our Constitution, and uh, restrictions on speech. Um, so the concern is that in the speech setting, the, the constitutional drafters um, made a point of limiting the categories to the four that they chose. It's not that they were unaware of the other categories because they simultaneously included those categories in section nine. Um, now, when it comes to an, an act of discrimination, as I, an example- I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I follow that part of the response because then it would undercut what was held in Islamic unity. Because Islamic unity says, uh, nothing stops the state from going beyond the four grounds stated in uh, 162C, as long as the reasonableness and justifiability factors in uh, Section 36.1 are satisfied. So the first part of your response, I just do not understand at all. Yes. Um, well, Justice, it, it must be added that, in other words, the addition of any other ground does require a justification exercise. And that justification exercise was done by the Supreme Court of Appeal in including sexual orientation. Um, uh, the amicus Selk uh, make the point as well that there is a good basis for including sexual orientation. First of all, there was an enormous amount of evidence put before the um, Equality Court about the position of the, the LGBTI community. Um, secondly, uh, it, it appears to be the kind of characteristic that is fundamental in a way that is uh, different to, let's say, someone's marital status, uh, which can change. Uh, and also that there is a connection, arguably, the case that self makes out is that gender and sexual orientation, um, that there is a, a link between those two. Um, now, uh, the example that I would give in terms of uh, why we ought to treat discrimination differently from, um, from prohibitions on speech, that if someone were to fire one of their employees on the basis that they discovered that they were divorcee, um, we might think that marital status is an important ground to protect someone against. But if someone were to say disparaging things about divorcees, that they have uh, broken their covenant with God or that they um, didn't try hard enough to keep their marriage together, um, and this is said in the abstract about divorcees generally, that we don't think um, that that sort of speech ought to be prohibited while thinking that divorcees ought to be protected from discrimination. And that's why there is a distinction to be drawn between the categories listed in Section 9 of the Constitution and those that are specifically enumerated in Section 16. But Mr. Oppenheimer, what about the right to dignity? You've dealt with equality, but what about dignity? Is that not a competing constitutional right? How does, uh, that, how does that trump freedom of speech? Justice Victor, I would, I would submit that dignity and freedom need to be read together. Um, in the matter of uh, Ferreira versus Levine, Justice Ackerman stated the following um, at uh, para 49 of that judgment. He states that human dignity has little value without freedom. For without freedom, personal development and fulfillment are not possible. Without freedom, human dignity is little more than an abstraction. Freedom and dignity are inseparably linked. To deny people their freedom is to deny them their dignity. Um, that a, a lot of our understanding of the term dignity really is about autonomy. Um, and that if we restrict what people can say um, to express their beliefs, um, we really are intruding upon their dignity. Uh, the dignity is not just about um, one's well-being, uh, it is about more than that. Um, many of the philosophy of Emmanuel Kant's writings on dignity really are linked to the sense of freedom and autonomy, and that is echoed by 
uh, Justice Ackerman's sentiments on the topic. May I just follow up on a question by my brother, Madlanga, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, please. And, and that concerned uh, the question of in Islamic unity, this court said, uh, there's nothing prohibiting the legislature from extending grounds beyond the section 62 grounds, uh, as long as they are justifiable in terms of section 36. I want to postulate the following question, uh, scenario to you. If, 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 we ex if those grounds are extended in section one, uh, if they were extended only to the grounds in section nine, three of the constitution, without the additional analogous uh, grounds or without the, uh, the, uh, the, the addition by saying that other grounds may be added. If they are restricted to section nine, three grounds in the Equality Act, what would the objection be to that? The nine, three of the constitution. Yes, um, justice might be, might be best expressed um, through some examples. Um, now, one of the uh, grounds that are listed uh, is this ground of belief. Um, and we think that it's important that people are able to uh, interrogate uh, the beliefs of others and that some people hold beliefs that others find um, distasteful. Um, now, one of the beliefs that's important to people is their, their belief in, uh, in the existence of God, but also a belief that's important to people is the absence of that. Uh, now, there's a quote from uh, the Reverend Jeremy Collier, where he says that atheism is the result of ignorance and pride, of strong sense and feeble reasons of good eating um, and ill living. It is the plague of society, the corrupter of manners and the underminer of property. Now, we might think that it's important that people are able to express their views quite freely about the beliefs of others. Um, imagine if someone said, um, people who believe in a flat earth are fools, and they ought to be pushed off the end of the earth. Um, we would think that that sort of speech is the kind of speech that we tolerate in a society um, and, and ought to tolerate, even if we disagree with it. Um, and the concern about extending these categories is that they are different in nature to the four enumerated by uh, enumerated in section 16, and that in section 16, they're really immutable characteristics or are foundational to someone's character in a way that is, that is different um, from one's beliefs, which may change. People um, change their faith. Um, they change their beliefs and their political ideology, um, and similarly to marital status, which can also shift over time. Um, now, it, it may be open to Parliament um, to engage in a fact-finding exercise. Um, if, in the event that this court upholds the um, binding in validity, um, it may come up with an interim measure to protect against hate speech, but ultimately Parliament will be doing that exercise. And it may decide that uh, there is enough evidence to allow in certain grounds. Um, but it must engage in that in, a, in the right manner. Um, now, the matter of um, it's Moyes versus uh, the Greater Germiston Transvaal Local Council, um, 2001-4, SA 491, the Constitutional Court of Paragraph 19, um, stated that it is no longer doubted that once a limitation has been found to exist, the burden of justification under section 36.1 rests on the party asserting that the limitation is saved by the application of the provisions of the section. That the weighing of exercise is ultimately concerned with the proportional assessment of competing interests, but to the extent that the justification rests on factual and policy considerations, the party contending for justification must put such material before the court. And we might think similarly that um, Parliament ought to engage in such an exercise, um, calling for members of various groups to explain why they require additional protection. We might also think that all groups, uh, including the ones listed in 9.3 and, and many others, are protected under 16.2b of the Constitution, um, where there is um, the right of ex expression does not include incitement of imminent violence, and that is going to refer to, to all groups. And really what we have is this heightened level of protection for the lower threshold of harm and the removal of the term imminent to just constitutes incitement to cause harm and then to give special protection to those groups. We know, for example, as well, that um, South Africa has had a dark history of racial oppression and that there's a good case to include race, um, that various ethnic groups have been persecuted um, uh, as has there been a, a sort of history of the subordination of women and gender-based violence. 
Um, and if we think about an event like the Holocaust, we know that people were persecuted on the grounds of their religion. And so there are good historic cases for the inclusion of those grounds. Uh, and furthermore, there is a good case for the inclusion of sexual orientation uh, on the basis that um, many gay people have been persecuted uh, and beaten and killed on the grounds of their sexual orientation. Um, and there, a good case has been made out for that, for that ground. Um, and Parliament can do an investigative exercise for the inclusion of further grounds. So on your case, Mr. Oppenheimer, are you saying one would have to present a case and only at that stage will a ground be included under section 16 to C. So it must be dealt with on a case by case basis. Yes, yes. It appears that there's an injunction that, in other words, to justify any departure um, from the protection of free speech, that, that section 36 analysis must take place. Um, it, it may be the case that there could be further grounds as there has been for sexual orientation, but that case must be made. Um, and it has not been made for the inclusion of any of the other grounds um, and, and therefore um, must, must be viewed as, as an unreasonable restriction. Um, but as I say, that this, this court, if it is to introduce an interim remedy, um, would not be the final word on the matter because parliament may engage in a much deeper fact-finding mission to include other groups. Mr. Oppenheimer, if I could take you to another area, please. Did the Supreme Court of Appeal conduct an inquiry as to whether, in terms of the reading in that they adopted, Mr. Quilani could be held liable for hate speech? And if they didn't, should they have? Um, the, the Supreme Court took the view that um, their interim provision was not in place at the time. Um, and therefore that um, if Mr. Kalani was correct in, in that the, the act as it stood was unconstitutional, um, that it would be improper to then um, hold him liable based on a new test, which was not in existence at the time. Uh, I would submit that- why, why would it be improper? I'm, so, I'm sorry to have cut you short. Um, well, it would, it's a test that is not enumerated in, in an act. Um, and the, given the principle of subsidiarity, um, to you, one could not rely directly on the constitution itself. Um, that 16.2 C, or 16 for example, does not create prohibitions. It just creates powers um, for parliament to produce laws. Uh, and if those laws were not in place at the time, um, then it would be improper to hold Mr. Kalani liable under a law that was not in existence. Yes, why would it be improper if in terms of the law that exists in terms of the reading in, Prior to the reading in, well, it, 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 it sets a much higher bar. What, what would the prejudice be? Well, if it were a reading in exercise, uh, if it were a matter of interpreting it um, to say that it is constitutionally compliant, uh, then it wouldn't be improper. Um, then it would be a matter of making it harder to hold Mr. Polanyi liable, um, and then there would be no prejudice. But what the court did was to strike the provision down um, to make it unconstitutional and then create a new um, interim arrangement. Um, I, I would submit, however, that uh, Mr. Kulani would not be held liable uh, under the court's interim test. Um, and there's, there's a, a quite um, simple explanation for that in that the court um, makes a finding um, that the article, um, that there was no evidence laid before the court um, that the article called on anyone um, to um, to, to harm anyone in the gay community. Um, and therefore there was no incitement to harm in the article. It may be that the article was offensive, um, but uh, it, it would not meet the, the threshold of the new test. Did, did the Supreme Court of Appeal engage in the factual examinations that the High Court did? Um, well, the, the Supreme Court does go and assess the uh, trial transcript um, which um, that, that full bundle before the court was, was 1,300 pages. Um, at, at page 256 of this bundle and in volume four, uh, at paragraph 33, which is of the SEA's uh, judgment, uh, it's stated there that um, what is set out above is the essence of the evidence adduced in the court below, and is against that evidence the complaint by the HRC was adjudicated. No evidence was presented to show a link between the article and any subsequent physical or verbal attacks on members of the LGBTI community. Um, 
So once that finding has been put in place, that there was no um, causal connection between the article and any harm, and and there not even just physical harm, but verbal attacks, um, the implications of the article could not um, could not meet that threshold. Um, uh, another. I, sorry, Mr. Oppenheimer. I have a problem. I have a problem with that finding um, because there was extensive evidence led by victims of. Uh, uh, of this kind of abuse against the LBGTI plus community, uh, and also the evidence of Professor Nell. Professor Nell's evidence was more theoretical, but there were practical examples given by victims. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, can you isolate that evidence from the article when you know that the evidence shows that people of the LBGTI plus community were not only verbally abused, but also physically, they were raped and murdered, in fact. Can you isolate that from the article to say, well, they didn't follow the article, hence uh, the article, uh, that evidence is, uh, is irrelevant. Surely that is the wrong way of approaching that kind of evidence. Um, well, Justice, the evidence shows that a lot of those um, awful things that the community um, suffered uh, predate the article. Uh, in other words, the, the point of the evidence is to show that that community is a vulnerable community that has been subjected uh, to corrective rape, to violence, um, to discrimination, and also there's this concern that when they reported those cases to the South African police service, that they were then uh, either ignored or further humiliated. Now that evidence is important to, to take into consideration about why as a group um, that community warrants further protection. But that is very different from whether there was any link between that and the article itself. Um, oh, sorry, that, sorry, Mr. Oppenheimer, that's exactly the point that I'm making. This, that evidence didn't sh uh, wasn't meant to show that uh, the article ignited a fire. That evidence showed that there was a, there was a conflagration already. And what this article did was to add fuel to that fire. That's the point that I'm making. Uh, wasn't it wrong to approach the matter by saying that evidence predated the article, the instances in the evidence predated the article and hence it's irrelevant. That's my difficulty. Yes, on the question of whether it adds fuel to the fire, we must draw a distinction between what the article uh, mentions and what was happening to that community. So at no point in time does the article ever call for any harm to be perpetrated against gay people. And uh, what Mr. Kolani does is express a concern about gay marriage. Now we must remember that um, gay marriage had been um, made legal in 2006 um, after a, a finding by this court that South Africa was the fifth country in the world to do so. Um, and that Mr. Kolani's article comes a few years after that. Um, and so really there is a a, a call for legal reform on that basis, um, but there is no call for any action to be taken against the gay community. Uh, Mr. Kalani specifically um, denies that he was calling for any, any harm to be perpetrated against the gay community. Really what he is expressing is uh, a firmly held moral belief. Um, one which I might add that one of the reasons why free speech is so important is that people are able to change their minds. So for most of human history, people have held the view that uh, gay marriage was, uh, was anathema to their firmly held beliefs. Um, and that through the power of speech, people were able to persuade others um, about the righteousness of that cause and why they could persuade um, this court and uh, ultimately parliament to produce a law which allows for gay people to marry each other. And up until that point, both sides were free to speak. In other words, those that were in favor of allowing gay marriage were, were free to speak and those that were against it were free to speak. Now, it, it cannot be the case that after a legal proclamation occurs that the one side is then forbidden from speaking. Um, so, <laughs> Mr. Oppenheimer, you say there are no consequences to Mr. Kolani's speech, but in the very same article, you have a cartoon of a person marrying a goat. Is that not uh, unacceptable? So that, that, is a, that in itself is a consequence. Well, Justice Victor, how is that? How, is that uh, how hurtful is that? It uh, may be that the cartoon is hurtful. Uh, Mr. Kolani played no role in the production of that cartoon. But you say there are no consequences to the speech. Now, what about that very uh, cartoon? Ah, in other words, is the the production of the cartoon a consequence of the speech? Uh, well, it's there. It's yes. Almost an instantaneous consequence, is it not? Uh, yes, um, if, if, if let, in other words, that someone else um, thought that they would produce a cartoon. Um, the, the question is what the cartoon does. The, the cartoon, I think many people will find offensive. Um, 
but in and of itself, um, it, it would be protected speech. Um, the, the cartoon doesn't call for any, any harm to be perpetrated against any group whatsoever. Um, it, it appears to be that the purpose of that cartoon is some sort of uh, slippery slope style argument um, or some kind of reductio ad absurdum. Um, now that that argument might not work. In other words, if the if the cartoon is meant to um, make the view that well, if we have um, gay marriage, then eventually we'll lead to a situation where people marry animals. We might just think that there's no good connection because you know um, in the gay marriage case you have two adult human beings who are fully consenting, and in the animal case you have a, a non-agent, and so the reductio fails. Um, so Oppenheimer, thank you for that. Let me uh, put my next question to you. I want to take you back to the limitation analysis. Uh, if the uh, infringement can be justified, uh, why should Section 10.1 be invalidated? You say the 18 grounds in Section 10.1a. Uh, if any one of those 18 infringements can be justified in terms of the limitation analysis, why is it necessary to invalidate Section 10.1? Well, at, at this juncture, there is there is no evidence to make out a case that those additional grounds ought to be included. Um, there, there has been an enormous amount of evidence on sexual orientation as a ground, um, that we have uh, testimony of members of the gay community talking about immense persecution, um, that we know that it, is, it can be connected to um, one of the four grounds mentioned in 16.2c, namely gender, that is a fundamental characteristic. And none of that evidence has been placed with regards to the other grounds. Um, there has been no case made why uh, belief ought to have that heightened protection or, or language or, um, uh, or marital status. Um, that, that could be done by parliament. Um, in other words, if um, it, this, this legislation is referred back to parliament, parliament could engage in that exercise and it may very well be the case that there is some ground that requires justification, um, but that, that is not before this court. Mr. Can I just perhaps uh, it's a perhaps it's a it's a, it's a follow up on 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 my sister Victor's question. Um, is Perpuda not the national legislation envisaged in Section Nine Four of the Constitution? Um, yes, um, Section Nine deals with. Um, equality and discrimination. And the thing with Papuda is that it, it really has two different objectives. Um, the one is to deal with equality and um, prohibitions on discrimination. And the other is to deal with uh, hate speech. And the... the um, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I, so that you can answer me fully? The reason I'm asking this question, it goes again to the whole approach but by the SCA, the fact that they looked at Pepuda uh, against uh, the backdrop of, six, of section 16.2 only. And, and it seems to me it did not consider section nine. Yes. Um, well, I would submit that the act fulfills these different functions. Um, section two of the act talks about the objects of the act. Um, and says, A, that it's to enact legislation required by section nine of the constitution, and that the act does very much do that. It has various prohibitions on discrimination. Um, but then at 2B5, um, um, uh, it says that the, that the object is um, to enact, well, it's, it's on the prohibition of advocacy of hatred based on race, ethnicity, gender, religion, that constitutes incitement to cause harm as contemplates in section 16.2C of the constitution. Now, there it makes it clear that really the hate speech provisions um, in Papuda are meant to be drawn from section 16.2c and not to be drawn from section 9. Um, that throughout the act, distinctions are drawn between discrimination, harassment, and hate speech. Um, and the, the act has these two different purposes. Um, it's, it really is drawing from two different um, constitutional sources. So section eight deals with the prohibition of unfair discrimination on the grounds of gender. Um, um, whereas um, 10 is really about something totally different being hate speech. But, but then should, should section nine of the constitution be ignored when you then analyze the provisions of section 10? Uh, yes, discrimination is, is a different matter in, in, in entirely uh, from hate speech. Um, 
and partly part of that is because um, speech is different from an act of discrimination. Uh, as I stated earlier, when we deny someone a job opportunity on the grounds that they are divorced, um, that has a fundamental impact on them. Uh, and um, unless there is, you know, some justification um, as to why um, someone should not be a divorcee in a particular job, you know, it should be prohibited. But that's very different from expressing in speech um, disdain about divorcees. Um, so really there's good reason to have all those prohibited grounds in the realm of discrimination uh, and that the constitution does require that. But it's very clear that the drafters um, were trying to curtail that in the grounds of speech, especially at least at the threshold of incitement to harm. On the question of incitement to imminent violence, well then all of those, all of those grounds are necessarily included by implication because there's no limitation to particular groups. Mr. Oppenheimer, I'm sorry. I may have missed your answer to my initial question. If we are to assume that Mr. Kulani's article would fall foul of section 10.1 as amended by the Supreme Court of Appeal, which sets a higher bar for what constitutes hate speech than the original section one, would it not then be the case that Mr. Quilani's rights would not be adversely affected and he would not be prejudiced if we were to consider whether he should be held liable under, text, under section 10.1 as amended by the Supreme Court of Appeal? Because he would not be able to say, I didn't know that, that this was part of the law. Um. Just throwing, from what I understand, in other words, if it is the case that Mr. Kalani's speech would be protected under the new test by the SCA, um, then he would suffer no prejudice. Um, that, that would be the case. If his speech is not protected under the new test, what, what would you say to that? Well, then he'd be put in a position where he's being held liable from um, a test that was not in place at the time. Um, that the, the test at the time... Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That would have been part of the test at the time. The reading in sets mm. a higher bar, but what remains would have still have been part of the original test. Yes, I understand. In other words, that one way of seeing the replacement is that it is um, some kind of extravagant uh, extraction exercise um, and a tightening exercise, um, yes. Um, yeah, so, so in that sense, as in other words, if the bar was only raised and that it would, would have been um, a much, much, much harder um, to find him liable. <coughs> no prejudice. Mr. Oppenheimer, just to belabor the point, if this court decides that section 10 is unconstitutional, and chooses to adopt an interim reading in similar to that of the Supreme Court of Appeal, can this court find Mr. Kolani liable for hate speech under that interim provision? Well, I'll, I'll deal with that in two ways. The first is to say that, uh, as I've stated before, that there'd be a breach of the retrospectivity, but assuming that um, I'm wrong on that, um, then with regards to the merits, if that test is the one which Mr. Kolani should be held liable under, um, then he would not be held liable. Um, that the nature of that speech uh, may have been uh, shocking or offensive, um, but that it, it would never have amounted to either the propagation of hatred uh, or the incitement to harm. Um, it, it might be useful um, to get a, a sort of a, a bar in terms of the kind of speech that we tolerate in, in, in South Africa um, and around the world, in terms of the kinds of speech that um, that is said, and as much as people might dislike it, um, we, we, we accept that it has a right to be published. Um, I'd like to make reference to the, uh, the Good News um, Bible, and I'm going to refer to two sections of that Bible. Um, the, the first is in the Old Testament in the Leviticus. Uh, it is Leviticus uh, chapter 20, uh, verse 13, uh, where it is stated that if a man has sexual relations with another man, they have done a disgusting thing, and both shall be put to death they are responsible for their own death. Now, if we look at that speech, um, what we have there is a quite clear case of the advocacy of hatred to say that um, homosexuals are uh, doing something disgusting. 
and furthermore that it is so disgusting that they deserve death um, now in the new testament um, at first corinthians um, verse 9 um, it is said by paul surely you know that the wicked will not possess god's kingdom do not fool yourselves people who are immoral or who worship idols or are adulterers or homosexual perverts or who steal or are greedy or who are drunkards or who slander others or are thieves none of these will possess god's kingdom again we have speech that um that implies that um, gay people will be denied access to heaven um, and as much as many people may disagree with this speech um, they have that ability to disagree with it um, that we think that there shouldn't be a prohibition on the publication of the old and new testament um, even if that speech is is hurtful um, and arguably um, advocates hatred against that group. So we have some sense of the bar of the speech that we tolerate. And if we then compare that to what was said by Mr. Kolani, um, we have a situation where he um, says that, I pray that politicians would have the balls to change those parts of the constitution that allow a man to marry a man and ditto a woman. Now, really what he's talking about there is a belief about uh, gay marriage. Um, and there is no, uh, no, no sense of saying that gay people ought to be put to death um, or that they deserve death. Um, he's talking about something much, uh, quite different from that. Um, and furthermore, on the question of incitement, um, um, what we have is a situation where there is no active call to action um, that um, in, the, in the matter of economic freedom fighters, and another versus Minister of Justice and Constitutional Development, um, a full bench of the of the High Court um, said the following um, at paragraph, the, the full citation of that is um, 2019 ZAGPPHC 253 um, at uh, 21, uh, paragraph 21. Um, the court says that it is apparent from this definition that the mere voicing of one's opinion will not be enough for incitement. Uh, the textbook author Sneiman provides the example of a person expressing the desire that it would be a good thing if X should die is not falling under the crime of incitement. Um, and so here what we have is the expression of a desire from Mr. Kulani, uh, not that anything happened to gay people, but that there be legislative reform, um, that the law be changed. Uh, and we also know that in a, in a democracy um, that people are free to call for changes to the law. Um, that there are often frequent calls for the law to be changed to allow uh, the death penalty um, or to prohibit um, abortion uh, or to change the property clause in our constitution. Um, and and, and that the way it's... Mr. Oppenheimer, sorry, can I ask you this? Um, if the threshold is to be the two verses in the Old and New Testament that you've um, drawn our attention to, how is that consistent with the ethos of our constitution? There are some... Uh, citizens who do not describe to the Old or New Testament. What about them? We are a constitutional democracy. How does that threshold then uh, affect the rest of the citizenship? Well, that is the point, that we, are, we live in a diverse country um, and that if we are to, to, to see each other as equals, uh, we must be allowed to, to express our differences and to engage, uh, to, to engage in speech. Uh, really to point out those differences and to express our disagreement um, that um, one of so the reasons even even if it causes um, harm psychological harm because 16 to uh, C talks about incitement to cause harm is that only physical harm or is there is there psychological harm uh, I think psychological harm can be taken into account in that um, but we must again bear in mind that psychological harm must be of a sufficient threshold that it is not mere um, emotional distress, that it is the kind of harm that requires uh, treatment. And then again, that it's not, the constitution doesn't talk about direct harms, but incitement to harm. Um, so if we look at what Leviticus calls for, um, really there is not a, the, it falls short of a genuine incitement to harm. Uh, Leviticus sort of makes a very strong moral judgment that um, homosexuals deserve death. Um, a judgment which I think many people will disagree with and will use their words to show why that why it is an incorrect judgment. Um, we've while while the Bible has been in print, 
we have managed to um, achieve many victories for, for the gay community, that we've removed um, legal prohibitions on sodomy, that we um, have gay marriage as a legal right. Um, and this is despite the fact that this text has been publicly available, um, that is taught from the pulpit, that it can be bought um, in, in many bookstores around the country, um, because people are not um, slaves to speech. Uh, they can use their words to critique it. Um, they can make up their own decisions about what is right and wrong. And really that is at the core of, of dignity and autonomy is this ability to be able to weigh up the arguments on both sides uh, and make a decision of one's own. Uh, and, and that is why free speech is so important that we can change our positions. If we don't allow speech, um, we have this concern that you know, things that everybody believes in will remain. And, and for much of human history, everybody believed that gay marriage was immoral. Uh, or incomprehensible. And through the power of speech, people were persuaded otherwise, um, despite the fact that um, the Bible has been in, in wide circulation. Um, people were able to see that view and change their minds. Mr. Oppenheimer, may I ask this question? <clears throat> Shouldn't the intention uh, in the Equality Act be read and interpreted generously to include the primary as well as the secondary meaning. Uh, I'm saying this against the backdrop of the passages that you've quoted in the Good News Bible, as well as taking into account the speech by, uh, not the speech, yeah, the speech by Mr. Kwelani, which you have extensively taken us to. I have a problem in attaching words only their literal meaning. When this court in Leroux versus Gay uh, emphasized that we should have the primary, we should have regard to the primary as well as the secondary meaning, your so-called innuendos in the law of delict. Yes. Um, well, it, it may be the case that if we have a, a, a firm intention test and that we're able to determine that the speaker was using, uh, let's say, coded language um, to, um, in, a, in a way that would that would clearly be um, advocacy of hatred on one of those grounds and incited harm. Uh, that that would be that, that would be a fair exercise to do, um, if it can be shown that that really there is this um, obvious obvious secondary meaning. Um, now, I suppose the difficulty becomes this: in other words, if we look at Leviticus, is there an obvious secondary meaning that um, when the Bible says that gay people deserve death, that that implies that gay people should be rounded up and put to death. Um, if if that secondary meaning is to be drawn from the text, you know, then it um, it would be interpreted to be falling foul um, of the SEA's test. But that would be a, a very dramatic limitation on free speech. In other words, to prohibit the publication of the Bible or or people. Well, excuse excuse me to interrupt you. Uh, I I do not seem to be suggesting that the SEA draw inspiration from the passages in the Bible that you've quoted. I think the point of departure here would be to look at the Equality Act itself, what its purpose, what its objectives are, and ask ourselves whether having regard to those purpose and objectives, the speech by Golani, does it amount to a hate speech or is it hateful? harmful or inside harm or propagate hatred? It yes. Okay. Um, yes, well, in other words, if the question is to first of all determine what the objects of the act were, um, as I stated earlier, um, the act makes it clear that it draws inspiration from section 16.2c, uh, but it then just promulgates it in a, in a heavily distorted manner and, and, and greatly departs from uh, section 16.2c. Um, if, if the SCA uh, test, the interim test is to be used, um, uh, as I've stated earlier, uh, Mr. Polani would, um, would not be in breach of it, um, that, that his speech um, doesn't, doesn't incite harm, um, that, that it is so distant from any kind of call to action, um, being a mere expression of a desire for legislative reform. Excuse me, was it correct for, for, for the SCA uh, to look at the, the impugned section 
vis-a-vis -vis section 16.1 or 2. If one looks at the both sections, uh, one may be interpreted to be overbroad, the other one is more limited. So what's that exercise or that examination, a proper one to undertake or not? Um, if I understand the question, um, the, the exercise was to state that Section 10, um, as it currently, or as it, as it is in Papuda, um, is overly broad um, for the reasons identified by the SCA um, and does not survive scrutiny after um, a limitations analysis has been done. Um, and, and therefore, uh, that court took the view that it, it ought to have been struck. Um, uh, there is also what, what the SEA does as well in terms of deciding what the correct remedy was, um, was faced between this choice of a, a, a very um, delicate reading in and reading down and severing exercise um, drew from this court's um, pronouncement in the case of Moyo, um, where the, the following was said, um, Um, so, in its um, Moyo ZACC um, 40, of, um, 40 of 2019, at paragraph 57, um, when attempting to interpret legislation by reading down a section in order to bring it into conformity with the Constitution, care should be taken to stay within the boundaries of a reasonable and plausible construction that does not rewrite the text. To overstep this mark would be tantamount to the actual reading of words into the statute, to do so would be a clear breach of the separation of powers. So much so was said in Abakhali, where an approach that sought to add at least six qualifications to the text was held to be an intrusive interpretation that offends requirements of the rule of law and the separation of powers. Um, and so ultimately the court found that there are so many defects um, with the way that section 10 is drafted um, that going through that exercise really would amount to the court becoming a, a legislator, um, which would be improper. Um, and that the remedy that it came up with, which is really the, the remedy drawn from Islamic unity, which is to say, well, there should be an interim prohibition, which um, largely mirrors the constitution, um, but not entirely because it adds in this extra ground of sexual orientation, um, because there was evidence to suggest that, you know, that is a reasonable limitation, while all the others were not reasonable limitations. Mr. Oppenheimer. What is your submission with regard to the vagueness of section 10.1 of Pepuda? Um, Justice Kompepe, it, it is a difficult statute to interpret, and this has been um, the, the bane of many academic uh, commentators for, for a number of reasons, which I'll try and set out. Um, the first is whether the section was co is conjunctive or disjunctive, and that could be resolved. Um, the other is that it makes reference to the proviso in section 12. And section 12 um, uh, has, its, has its own difficulties. Uh, the version of the proviso says, provided that bona fide engagement in artistic creativity, academic and scientific inquiry, fair and accurate reporting in the public interest, or publication of any information, advertisement or notice in accordance with section 16 of the constitution is not precluded by the section. So the court ultimately found that the section was unintelligible. Uh, there are a couple of concerns with it. The one is to determine what that operator bona fide refers to. Um, one interpretation is that it only refers to uh, artistic creativity, academic scientific inquiry, and the reporting. Um, and that there's a separate requirement about um, publication of any information uh, in terms of section 16. Now, if information is given um, it's a, a broad and generous reading, then what it does is circle back to the constitution itself. In other words, to say that everything in section 16 of the constitution is all the rights of free speech, um, including but not limited to the ones set out in 16.1 A to D, um, except for um, the, the, the portions that are, that are excluded by section 16.2. So what the exercise would then do is to say, well, provided that the speech is protected speech in terms of the constitution. In other words, does not amount to hate speech, propaganda for war, or the advocacy of incitement to imminent violence. Well, then it is not precluded by the section. Um, what's, what's difficult is for someone to know in advance um, whether that is the correct interpretation, whether what they need to say must be bona fide or not. Um, so there is this, this vagueness difficulty. Um, 
if if ultimately what we have is a situation where the um, Section 10 can ultimately be understood and through this elaborative interpretation exercise as really just proclaiming exactly that which Section 16 of the Constitution says, well, then the SCA has a much more elegant solution to that, which is to say, let, let's remove all the ambiguity. Um, just make it just make it the prohibition or the just use the phrase in Section 16 2C because maybe that's what's meant um, by the proviso in any event. Um, but as it stands, it, it is enormously difficult to work out what is expected of a speaker. And furthermore, if it, if it is the case that it is vague, then, um, and someone could not know in advance whether their speech will be prohibited, well, then it could not ever be justifiable um, because we expect our legislation to be comprehensible, that it must be uh, subject to the principle of legality and to the rule of law. Um, and that if it is so vague that no one could know what's required of them, well, then it can never survive a limitations analysis. Mr. Justice Kampepe, you are muted, Justice Kampepe. Sorry. Are you contending that the vagueness of parts of Section 10 is unconstitutional as it would amount to self-censoring? Well, it may have that implication. In other words, if it is so vague that um, a speaker would not know in advance whether their speech will be prohibited, um, then that may lead to a chilling effect. Um, it, it must. So there's the self-censorship problem. Um, but there's also a sense in which someone may say something totally innocently um, and that the section could then be interpreted through this convoluted manner to hold them liable. Um, and, and so that seems like a problem in and of itself. Uh, may, may I raise just for the last one from my side, Mr. Oppenheimer, maybe a small matter, the greater scheme of things, but maybe not so small for the commission. And that's the costs order against the commission. Surely that is inappropriate given their section nine state as, as constitutional status. Um, Justice, I would submit that um, the Human Rights Commission is, a, is an organ of state um, and that the idea that they could uh, litigate against individuals um, with impunity um, and lose time and time again with hopeless cases uh, which require those individuals to cover all of the legal costs and then to then turn around and say, well, we're not going to be held liable. That strikes me as enormously dangerous. Um, that The Biowatch principle really means that in a, in a matter where someone raises a constitutional, a constitutional issue um, and are successful, they should get their costs against the state. Um, and as I say, the Human Rights Commission is an arm of the state. Um, the minister is also present in this matter. Um, and I would submit then that the SCA's finding on costs uh, was perfectly correct. Um, we must bear in mind as well, it was earlier alluded that, that Papuda is, uh, really just creates uh, delicts. Um, and when we think about delicts, we think about two individual parties who have the limited funds that individual parties have. Um, really what we have with Papuda is something quite different in that um, the Human Rights Commission is given the special status of being able to bring matters in its own name, not just on behalf of individuals, um, and that the powers of that equality court um, really include imposition of fines, but also um, other kinds of um, sanction. So, for example, at um, its 21 sub 2L, um, uh, uh, the court has, has the power to provide an appropriate order of a deterrent nature, including the recommendation to the appropriate th authority to suspend or revoke the license of a person. So we have a situation where it really does go well beyond um, the powers of a court in a mere civil matter, uh, that someone's license to operate could be taken away. Um, an order of a deterrent nature could be, you know, uh, all, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of orders that go beyond mere financial sanction. Um, so we have something that-, that well, so, Sorry, may I interrupt you? I mean, section 181 specifically accords them the status of an institution uh, established to strengthen constitutional democracy in 184, section 184, 2B of the constitution pertinently says that they must take steps to, that's the commission to take steps to secure appropriate redress where human rights have been violated. In other words, that implies that they have to go to court probably on behalf, sometimes and often uh, on behalf of victims that cannot 
afford to do so themselves for financial or other reasons. So why should they be marketed in cost as an, as an entity of this nature? Well, in, in the event that, that, that rights were actually violated uh, and a court makes that finding, um, well, then they ought not to be held liable for costs. Um, in an instance where uh, the commission goes after someone where there was no rights violation, and that person then had to spend an enormous amount of money defending themselves when they were innocent, um, they would then be, would be heavily out of pocket. And we must bear in mind as well that there are not parity of resources. Um, if we look at the number of counsel um, employed by the Human Rights Commission in this matter, it is four, including one senior counsel, um, that individuals don't have the funds um, to, to pay for the kinds of um, legal assistance that the state has. Um, and so then to be mulked in those costs, and um, while the state can litigate really with, you know, um, with unlimited impunity, with you know, the access to access to public funds, um, there should be some limits on that. And the advantage of that is really that the Human Rights Commission must, must properly decide whether a matter um, warrants um, a complaint. Um, if there is no costs um, stop, and then there is nothing stopping them from, from acting in a harassing manner for people who are perfectly innocent, um, people who said things that are perfectly protected. Um, so in order to protect rights, and the, the state has an obligation to uphold uh, rights. So if we look at um, section 7.2 of the constitution, um, the state must protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. And one makes reference to human dignity, equality, and freedom. Um, freedom is conveniently left out as a right by the minister in its, in its um, submissions. It constantly talks about human dignity and equality while neglecting to mention freedom that if free speech is a right that must be upheld by the state, well, part of that means um, not litigating with impunity against people's speech and being, you know, you know having to pay the costs um, when, when there was no, um, no conviction or no, uh, no finding of, of liability. Mr. Oppenheimer, I don't want to take up too much time on this aspect. All I can say in conclusion is that Given the avalanche of complaints to the press ombud and to the commission itself, in this instance, it's hard to imagine a matter more deserving of having to go to court with a complaint than this one. That's all I want to say. Thank you. On that question, I mean, it appears that at the time there was much ambiguity about what was hate speech. So there's the matter of Herselman versus Galeba, um, which took a disjunctive reading while finding that that was permissible. In other words, that hurtful speech amounted to hate speech. Um, and so the commission may have taken the view at the time that it was entitled to have acted in this manner um, because they saw the speech as, as, as hurtful um, in the sense, the low threshold sense of causing emotional distress. Um, but ultimately, you know, Mr. Kolani raised uh, you know, a constitutional challenge, um, which was successful in the Supreme Court of Appeal um, and, and should be entitled to his, to his costs on that matter. Mr. Oppenheimer? You had 45 minutes to present your argument. I know that we took most of your time with the questions from the bench. Do you have any further submissions to make? Um, if I might just confer with my Lynn Jr. Um, there, there is one um, submission I'd like to make, which is that in doing the uh, limitations analysis, one of the questions is whether there is a rational connection between the legislation and its purpose. And if part of the purpose is to protect vulnerable groups, um, by restricting speech, we may end up making those vulnerable groups um, less able to protect themselves. So. For example, um, the uh, Women's Legal Center Trust um, call for um, sexist speech, everyday sexist speech to be prohibited by the act. Now, one of the most um, compelling public protests uh, in the last year has been the fight of women um, to alert the public to gender-based violence um, and to express um, why that is such a danger to South African society. And there has been the use of the phrase, hashtag men are trash. Now, uh, 
the implication of that hashtag is to say that um, men are, are not human, that they're being dehumanized, that they are garbage. Uh, it is uh, clearly uh, hurtful speech. Um, one might think that it advocates hatred against uh, people on the grounds of their sex. But nonetheless, um, that uh, women ought to be entitled to use this speech um, to show their disdain for gender-based violence. And if um, they are not able to do so, then they are left unprotected. And so the concern with um, with section with with Papuda as it stands is that it actually leaves vulnerable groups without a voice. That one of the enormous advantages of speech um, is that one is able to resolve disputes without recourse to other action. Um, so instead of people being muted and then having to respond to um, uh, to, to constraints on themselves with violence and and uh, actual harm, instead they're able to use words. Um, and that's why words really matter. Words help us resolve our moral disputes. They help us speak out against injustices. And if we rob women of that ability to speak out against injustice, we really aren't protecting them. Um, and so there's something inherently irrational. Similarly, one might think, for example, that the uh, letters column um, that the Sunday Sun published um, a week after Mr. Polanyi's column was published gave voice to the many people that were offended by his column. Um, people wrote in um, saying that they found Mr. Kulani um, disgusting, um, that, that his views were abhorrent, um, and they were able to express themselves. Now, as the legislation is currently drafted, uh, belief is a protected ground. So a belief um, that homosexuality is wrong would be protected. And to say that um, people that have that belief are disgusting um, would be hurtful. And so again, the vulnerable community is then denied the opportunity to speak back um, and so that, that becomes irrational because it's, it ends up undermining the interests of that, that community that we sought to protect in the first place. The Oppenheimer on remedy, if we are with you, is the remedy that was uh, granted by the SCA appropriate under the circumstances? If you look at it, it appears to be substantially different from the original section 10, and they are said to be harmful or to incite harm. But the new section 10 one uh, doesn't mention anything about the harmful part. It only says incitement to cause harm. Is that appropriate under the circumstances? Shouldn't we rather? Okay, let me hear you on that first. Uh, yes, Justice, I would submit that it is appropriate, um, that it is important to draw that distinction between speech, which is directly harmful, and that speech which incites harm. Now, bearing in mind, we must think that hate speech is a particular kind of category of speech, that really the kind of speech that amounts to genuine hate speech. And I'll make it clear that the applicant opposes genuine hate speech, um, that we ought not to be enlarging that category to include other things. But there are remedies for other kinds of, let's say, um, directly harmful speech. So for example, if we think about um, someone who is in an abusive relationship um, where they are verbally abused um, and to the point where they suffer a psychological injury um, where they have PTSD, well, they have remedies. Um, they can, uh, you know, they can sue in, an, uh, in, in a delictual setting under the actuary in your arm, um, or they can, they can seek relief under a protection order or an anti-harassment order. Um, but hate speech is different. Hate speech is not targeted at a particular individual. It's targeted abstractly at a group. Um, and there really the concern is that that group will be harmed by third party listeners, that people will go and round them up uh, and abuse them and harm them. Um, and that is the kind of speech that the, the constitution says is unprotected. And so it is vital that that distinction is made. Um, that in, in other realms where we're talking about individuals interacting with each other, we might very well think that um, directly harmful speech um, um, can be dealt with. Um, but that is very different from this elevated realm of hate speech, especially where we have the power of the state um, prosecuting people. What is your response to the minister's suggestion that the order of invalidity should be suspended and already uh, be made? Um, I, I, would, I would submit that it, it is important that if this court does strike down um, Section 10 as it stands, that there be um, some kind of safeguard 
And now in the matter of um, Moyo, the Constitutional Court decided not to do that, not to create an interim remedy and just strike the section down and let Parliament um, create its own section. I think there is good reason to say that um, we don't want to create a vacuum where people are able, are able to freely engage in genuine acts of hate speech um, and that the remedy, um, the interim remedy um, put forward by the Supreme Court is appropriate in the circumstances. It, um, it adds the additional ground of the vulnerable group of sexual orientation um, and, and makes it clear that the threshold is constitutional. As I say, really, that the correct language ought to be decided by Parliament. Um, and then Parliament should be given, I think the period of time that the SCA recommends was, was 18 months from its judgment uh, in November last year. Um, but it may be fair for this court to say that it is 18 months from the handing down of its own order um, to give Parliament that opportunity um, to then craft a section that is actually constitutional. Um, but that really what this court will be doing is just creating a mere interim measure to ensure that those that um, perform genuine acts of hate speech can still be held liable during that time. Thank you, Mr. Oppenheimer. Uh, thank you, Justice. I have no further submissions. Thank you. The court will take a short adjournment for 10 minutes. Court will adjourn until 11.38. Please note that during the adjournment, you are welcome to switch off your video and mute your microphone. And then we join with video and sound when the hearing recommences at 12, 11.38. Should you exit, you may use the same link to rejoin the hearing.
And Iwe, you may proceed. Presiding Justice Kampepe, all counsel are online. Mr. Siboto. Uh, thank you, Justice Kampepe. Um, just to note my appearance again, it's for the fifth um, amicus, uh, the Freedom of, Freedom of Expression Institute. Uh, Justice uh, Kampepe and the members of the court, mine is to do three things really. The first is to set the parameters of the debate. That's the first point I'm going to deal with. And having done that, I'm going to get into a discussion about the obligation on the legislature to pass clear laws. That is a very important debate uh, in front of this court, particularly in relation to section 10.1 and its vagueness. You've canvassed the debate with uh, my learned friend, counsel for the applicant, and I'll add a couple of points in that regard as well. Suffice for now to just make the point that we're in agreement that section 10 is vague and it is one of the many challenges um, that beset section 10. And for that reason, it should be struck off as unconstitutional as was found by the Supreme Court of Appeal. The third point I'm going to deal with is a question of the limitation, the limitation exercise, section 36 of the constitution, which of course is tried that if you find that section 10 is inconsistent with the constitution, the question that must be asked is, is that limitation justifiable in an open and democratic society? Those are going to be the three themes of my submissions uh, to this court. The very first point perhaps I should make, uh, which I think is a very important point, is that as, as we understand it, this case is no different from the Islamic unity uh, matter. And it's fundamental to make that point simply because for the very same reasons that the code was found to be unconstitutional are the same reasons that we said section 10. Now, if you undertake the exercise that was undertaken in Islamic unity, you must, we respectfully submit, come to a conclusion that is similar to the Islamic unity um, decision. So that's the first point I wanna make um, as a starting point. Now, having said that, let me go back to my three main themes, starting with the question of um, the parameters of the debate. It appears to me, and I do not know what the current position is, but as I understand it in the notice of appeal uh, on behalf of the South African Human Rights Commission, there are three grounds that were set out as to why the decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal is incorrect. Now, as we understand it, the first two are certainly a misnomer. As a starting point, they make the point that the decision of the Supreme Court of Appeal is incorrect insofar as it required section 10 to mirror section 16. We read the decision differently, particularly with regard to section or rather paragraph 59 of the Supreme Court of Appeal decision which makes the point that the legislature is empowered to go over and above the strict provisions of the constitution. That's how we understood the decision. So really the question is not whether it should have mirrored or not. The real question is the trite one, which is an exercise of testing constitutional validity of legislation, which is, is it consonant with the constitution? To an extent it is overbroad or limits the rights in the constitution, is it justifiable in terms of section 36? That's the question this court should be asking itself. In relation to the second misnomer, as I call it, of the notice of appeal on behalf of the Human Rights Commission is the idea that the Supreme Court of Appeal found that, well, the inclusion of sexual orientation renders section 10 unconstitutional because it is a ground that is not envisaged in the constitution. Now, I mean, of course that is, with I respectfully submit is a, is a mischaracterization of the findings of the Supreme Court of Appeal. As a matter of fact, at paragraph 60 of its decision, it makes the point that sexual orientation is one of the grounds. I suppose the misunderstanding stems from the order itself, which makes no reference to sexual orientation, but it bears mention that in section, section one, which lists the grounds, has not been struck off. So for all intents and purposes, section one, which includes sexual orientation remains and has not been struck off by the Supreme Court of Appeal. Now, having dealt with that, and if the bench has no questions in that regard, I'll move to the second point, which is an obligation of, on the legislature to pass clear laws. Now, there's, 
innumerable decisions coming from this court and the lower courts as well, dealing with the question of why it is important from a- Sorry, sorry, Mr. Sabato, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm just looking at the order. Did I hear you say, did I hear you correct? You said that uh, the misunderstanding arises with the commission interpreting the SCA order wrongly uh, because uh, the order does not make, does not include sexual orientation. Did you make that submission or did I hear you incorrectly? Thank you, Justice Majid. The point I'm making is simply this. In fact, if I could just draw your attention to the exact uh, text I'm making reference to, it appears on page 291 of uh, the, the record, and it is entitled Notice of Appeal in Terms of Rule 16.2, and this is on behalf of the Commission. Under paragraph four, under the heading Grounds of Appeal, they make the point, and I'll quote, the Supreme Court of Appeals criticism against Section 10 of Purpura can be summarized on the following grounds. Section 10 is unconstitutional for, and sub numeral two, its inclusion of a broader category of prohibited grounds other than those in section 16.2. Now I'm saying that's a misdirection of what the SCA actually found. The SCA in fact, in paragraph 60 of its judgment said, sexual orientation is there permissibly because the legislature is entitled to go over and above the grounds that are listed in 9 and 16. So the point I'm simply making is that we need to understand what the parameters of the debate are. And to do that, we need to understand what the findings of the SCA are. And that is a point I was simply making, Justice Majid. Yeah, but the point, the point is that uh, the SCA specifically included sexual orientation in its order, uh, uh, in the reading in, in paragraph D. 10.2 is uh, sexual orientation is included. Are we, are we on the same page there? Indeed so. Just okay, it. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the second point I said I was going to deal with is a question of clear laws. Uh, this court's uh, decision of Hyundai dealt with the question of how legislatures are to pass laws and the philosophical underpinnings for it, which we are in absolute agreement with that it has a duty to pass legislation that is reasonably clear and precise. Our submission is there's innumerable uh, academic debates, judicial debates around the question of what section 10 actually means and how it reads. It's precisely because of that, that we make the submission that you, it is difficult to comprehend section 10. And I think it is common cause at this point that we cannot agree on what it actually means. Is it conjunctive, disjunctive reading? Is section 12 to be read in total in line with 10 or is it a provision, a part of uh, section 10 of Pepuda that is to be read in conjunction with section 10? Now it is because of precisely that vagueness, that lack of certainty that we submit that even if we're to go into an analysis as, or, as to whether the the Section 36 justification analysis, even if we were to get there, we have a difficulty of ascertaining what it is that we are testing. So in other words, let me try to be clearer. You can't get into a section 36 analysis until you have a clear understanding of what the provision provides. In other words, you must understand this is the extent of the limitation provided for in section 10 in contrast to section 16 of the constitution. To an extent you can't make that determination, in other words, to what extent does section 10 go beyond the proviso of the constitution? Then you can't even begin the exercise of justification limit, uh, the limitation exercise in terms of section 36 of the constitution. We submit that section 10 for reasons that have been set out in the Supreme Court of Appeal decision along with those that have been alluded to by my learned friend on behalf of Mr. Koyolani, uh, are the very foundational failures in section 10. And because of that failure, it is for this court to then ask itself the question, what must happen? Now we submit that the Supreme Court of Appeal took the proper approach. And the proper approach was to mirror as it were, section 16 for an interim period. And that is important to understand because it does not do away with the power of the legislature to make determinations, policy considerations as to what it is that they will limit in terms of section 10. It says in the interim, 
And in light of the fact that we can't make heads or tails of section 10, this is the placeholder we're going to put in place. We can't even begin the exercise of justification because, and I quote, the Supreme Court of Appeal found that the minister gave sparse reasons for the limitation. Now, absent valid grounds for the limitation, absent a proper interrogation and justification for the limitation, we can't even begin to have the exercise of justification. But assume for a second in favor of the respondents that you can. The question must be, well, then let's look at the limitations and look, let's look at what is provided for in section 36. We're looking at the nature of the right, and this is now me flowing to the third and final aspect of my address to this court. What rights are we dealing with here? I'm not going to regurgitate and take this court through the principles of freedom of expression. They've been well enumerated and documented in the previous decisions of this court. The first is the, the nature of the right in question. Mama Bulo, along with Lafitte Off and so on, have, have, have made reference to the importance of the right in light of our history, thought control, and so on. So we're clearly dealing with a very important right here. And I mean, of course, we'll make the concession that it doesn't elevate beyond or above dignity and all the other important Bill of Rights uh, uh, protections. But the point is simply that freedom of expression is important. That is what we're dealing with. And this court in Islamic unity made the point that the further you move away from the provisions of the Bill of Rights, in this instance, 16, the more likely it is that the limitation is not justified more so if no grounds are given for the limitation or justification is given for the limitation. And I think that is a very fundamental point to understand. Whether you read, and I would respectfully submit, the provisions of uh, section 10 conjunctively or disjunctively the debate we've been having, ultimately you cannot get to a point where section 10 is justified. And I make this point for a simple reason. Let's postulate for a second that it is to be read disjunctively. The first challenge with that is the clear limitation of the protection in section 16. For example, let's take hurtful. If we were to read section 10 disjunctively, hurt in itself would be basis to say this amounts to hate speech. I mean, of course, there's a difficulty with that and it's quite apparent I respectfully submit for reasons that have been alluded to earlier on. For example, the issue of what does that mean for religious belief? If you were to make an opinion, you were to give an opinion that is merely hurtful, is that what is envisaged in section 16 prohibitions? I submit not. So perhaps it could be perhaps that the conjunctive reading is closer to the provision of section 16 than the disjunctive reading is. But of course that would lead to absurdity in itself. As a starting point, we don't know what hurtful means. But let's assume for a second, it speaks to emotional distress. It speaks to that is which is not physical. And then let's postulate that harm means physical. If we were to read the provisions of section 10 conjunctively, what that would mean is you do not violate section 16 and section 10 unless your violation amounts to both psychological and physical harm. Those are the difficulties we have with section 10. Now, having made those points, our respectful submissions are these to this court, that whatever interpretation you give, and again, I need not remind the court that we must be careful not to give it an overly strenuous interpretation for the sake of just uh, aligning it to the constitution because of the philosophical underpinnings I made reference to earlier on. But ultimately, whether you give it a disjunctive reading or a conjunctive reading with respectfully submit, you cannot remedy the challenges that are faced by Section 10, particularly in light of the fact that these are laws that must be clear, such that the citizens are clear on what it is that they're permitted to do and not permitted to do. Mr. Kassiboto, you said uh, the freedom of expression is important. What is the relationship between the freedom of expression and the right to equality and dignity. Uh, thank you, Justice Nshant. Uh, this court has pronounced on this before, and they said there are a web of rights that are married to each other. And I suppose to take the point further, none of those rights trump the other. In other words, freedom of expression does not rate above that of equality and dignity and vice versa. And ultimately, and I suppose this is where the justice is leading me to, I 
accept that freedom of expression cannot, or rather dignity cannot be sacrificed at the altar of freedom of expression. But with that being said, in making the analysis, it still has to be consonant with the constitution. And our respectful submission is that as currently crafted, 16.2 does exactly that. In other words, what is protected in 16.2, regardless of how offensive the speech may be, the legislature in the wisdom have come to a conclusion that notwithstanding the offensive nature of the statement, if it does not incite harm, then the right to dignity has not been violated. I don't know if I've addressed Justice Mclanter's question. Yes, you may proceed, Mr. Siboto. I think that is a sum total of my uh, submissions, uh, uh, Justice Akampepe, unless there are further questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Siboto. Mr. Marcus. Uh, thank you, Justice Kampepe. Uh, we propose to address three topics which we submit should inform this court's approach to the present case. First, we will deal with the need for intelligibility and certainty in legislation as a requirement of the rule of law. Second, we will address the constitutional principle that underlies the protection of speech that offends, shocks, and disturbs. And third, we will deal with the balancing of freedom, dignity, and equality. As a prelude to these topics, we make certain general points about our client's stance. As its previous engagements with this court demonstrate, Media Monitoring Africa believes in appropriate and constitutionally permissible limits to freedom of expression. The focus of our client's concern in this case is not whether Mr. Quilani's vile utterances were unlawful under the statute or even a narrowly crafted statute, but we do not suggest that there is any legal impediment to a finding that he is liable on the reading in suggested by the SCA. Vile as his utterances undoubtedly are, this should not obscure the true debate as to whether Section 10 of the Act is constitutionally compliant or can be read in such a way. The proper interpretation of the section and its constitutionality are not dependent on the facts of this case, but the decision of this court will determine the future course of those who choose to speak with stridency on controversial topics like morality, religion, and politics. Let me then turn to my first topic, the need for intelligibility and certainty as a requirement of the rule of law. The sharply differing views across the many submissions in this case, as well as the academic commentary, is indicative of a serious problem of intelligibility flowing from a poorly drafted statute. All the parties rightly resort as they must to section 39.2 in an endeavor to read section 10 in a constitutionally compatible way. We make three points in this regard. First, the process envisaged by section 39.2 does not permit doing violence to the language employed by the legislature. The endeavors to invoke section 39.2 in our respectful submission in relation to the conjunctive and disjunctive reading, in relation to the attempt to give an, a, a, an intelligible understanding of the proviso in section 12, in our respectful submission, cross the threshold of what the language permits. The second point we may to make about section 39.2 is that it cannot be invoked in a partisan way. When a court applies section 39.2 to promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights, this means promoting the spirit, purport, and object of all the relevant rights. And that much was made clear by this court 
in Pumalela Gaming versus Grundling in pa at paragraph 35, in which this court said that one cannot simply pick the rights to promote if there are more than one right at issue. The third point we would make in this regard is that there are intractable problems with the choice of language, particularly in relation to the use of the word hurtful, which has attracted the most difficulty. The problem is well illustrated by the submission from the Holocaust and Gender Foundation. Our learned friends say in paragraph 12 of their heads, and I quote, the words hurtful and harmful ordinarily carry a wide range of meaning from merely unkind and spiteful to repulsive and intolerable. Our learned friends are absolutely correct, both as to the meaning of these words and the spectrum on which they operate. So the question becomes a different one, and that is how they can be intelligibly applied given the range of possible meanings, and that is where one hits another intractable problem. Our learned friends seek to resolve this problem by arguing that the words must be understood as referring only to the most egregious speech. The problems with that approach, Justice Kampepe, are threefold. First, that is not what the section says. It amounts to a rewriting of section 10. Second, this court has recognized from its earliest judgments that constitutional rights cannot be made dependent on the exercise of a benign discretion by those who enforce a statute. That observation was most recently uh, reiterated in Teddy Bear Clinic versus uh, the Minister of Justice at paragraphs 75 to 76, referring back to the earlier decisions of this court in State versus Ambata and State versus Zuma. And a similar point is made, of course, in Dorwood versus the Minister of Home Affairs. The problem in the present case in relation to discretion is particularly acute because of the wide rules of standing in section 20 of the Equality Act. It is private individuals in the main who have the power to trigger the act. The third point we would make in this regard is the incompatibility with the rule of law. In this regard, Justice Kampepe, the courts will be assisted by the seminal work on the topic by the late Lord Justice Bingham entitled The Rule of Law. He addresses the principle that the law must be accessible so far as possible, intelligible, clear, and predictable. And he advances a number of reasons for this. First, and of, of, of relevance to this case, although he makes the point in the context of the criminal sphere, but we say it applies equally here. If people are liable to be prosecuted for an act or omission, he says, and I quote, we ought to be able without undue difficulty to find out what it is we must or must not do on pain of criminal penalty. And he points out this is not because bank robbers consult their lawyers before robbing a bank but because the deterrent function of the law is meaningless, and I quote, if we do not know and cannot reasonably easily discover what it is we should not do. And I point out in this regard that this statute has an explicit deterrent impact by virtue of the power under section 21.2L to order, uh, to make an order of a deterrent character. Secondly, says Lord Bingham, and quite unrelated to the criminal law, he says, if we are to claim the rights which the law gives us, or to perform the obligations which it imposes on us, it is important to know what our rights or obligations are. Otherwise, we cannot claim the rights or perform the obligations. Sorry, Mr. Marcus, can you just give us, Mr. Marcus, sorry, just give us the page numbers of, the, of Lord Bingham's work, please. Yes, uh, it's on pages 37 to 38. Uh, and uh, Justice Majit, I'm working off this volume uh, published by uh, Penguin. But if there is a need for me to make the pages available, I will most certainly do so. That should be in order. Thank you. Turning then to 
the constitutional uh, rationale for protecting speech that offends, shocks, and disturbs. This court has twice quoted with approval the observation by the European court in the Handyside case that freedom of expression extends not only to information or ideas that are favorably received or regarded as inoffensive or as a matter of indifference, but also to those that offend, shock, or disturb. Those observations were adopted by this court, not as a merely abstract proposition about the importance of freedom of expression. They were adopted in the context of speech that did indeed offend, shock, and disturb in the context of hate speech in Islamic unity and in the context of child pornography in Dariuk. More importantly, though, is the philosophy which underpins the need for tolerance of that which disturbs, shocks, and offends. We submit that philosophy is part of a broader constitutional principle. It is that constitutional protections are not reserved only for the good and the virtuous. They extend also to the worst among us. Were it otherwise, we would still have a death penalty. And it is not surprising we submit that this constitutional principle was articulated in the case concerned with the death penalty, but was recently reiterated by this court in Gavrich versus the Refugee Status Determination Officer at paragraph 26. The court said this, quoting from Makwanyani, the test of our commitment to a culture of rights lies in our ability to respect the rights, not only of the weakest, but also of the worst among us. And this case engages that principle squarely. The court is confronted with an article which we have deliberately described as vile. And history has taught us that it is in the areas of acute difference, like morality, like religion and politics, that differences are likely to be sharpest and the rhetoric most intense. And that too is not hypothetical. In this very case, the SCA records the evidence of Professor Nell at, page, at paragraph 32 of the judgment, where they say, significantly, Professor Nell said that the teachings of churches were hurtful, particularly when they tied in with the hurtful stereotype that same-sex orientation equates with bestiality. The sinfulness of same-sex relationships was repeatedly referred to. Now, once again, we know from our history of censorship under the Publications Act that this too is not merely hypothetical. Under that regime, there were attempts, ultimately unsuccessful, for example, to ban the Jehovah's Witness publication, The Watchtower, because of its rejection of the dogma of the Holy Trinity and of the conviction that Jesus was the Son of God. There was likewise an attempt to ban a publication by a Muslim author who argued that the crucifixion of Jesus was a fictional event. These cases and many others are documented by Van Royen in his book, Censorship in South Africa at page 98. And it is a fallacy to assume that this legislation will only be used to protect vulnerable groups. As we in fact point out in our heads at paragraph 48, the existing case law under the Equality Act shows that those who invoke its provisions are not only members of vulnerable groups. Let me then turn to my last topic, which is the balancing of freedom, dignity, and equality. Several of the submissions correctly recognize that Section 10 of the Equality Act uh, is required to strike a balance between freedom, dignity, and equality because all three are foundational values of the Constitution and all three are requirements of limitation under Section 36. The starting point, and this is in answer to, I think, Justice Victor's question uh, and Justice Mschlantler, is recognition that these values should not be seen as being in conflict with each other. It's because the Constitution gives individuals 
the freedom to speak and to think for themselves and not to suppress their views, that it recognizes their autonomy as human beings and their dignity. That point was made in Kumalo versus Holomisa. It's in our heads at page four, paragraph 13, but it was also made relatively recently in Democratic Alliance versus African National Congress at paragraph 123, where the court said, being able to speak freely recognizes and protects the moral agency of individuals in our society. We are entitled to speak out, not just to be good citizens, but to fulfill our capacity to be individually human. Now, of course, none of this means that speech is without limits or that hate speech laws are incompatible with an open and democratic society. All depends, however, on whether such laws are crafted in a way which permits the coexistence of freedom, dignity, and equality. Several submissions point to the fact that the Equality Act is mandated by section nine of the constitution. While that is correct, it does not mean that the legislation produced may unjustifiably violate any right in the Bill of Rights or that such legislation affords parliament any greater latitude to do so. Of course, parliament can give effect to its obligation in many different ways. But the one thing parliament cannot do in constitutionally mandated legislation or in any other legislation is to violate unjustifiably any right in the Bill of Rights. And of course, this is not the first time that this court will scrutinize legislation that is mandated by the constitution. It did so in Brummer versus the Minister of Social Development, in which it held that section 78.2 of PIA, which is constitutionally mandated legislation, was unconstitutional because it unjustifiably limited the right of access to courts guaranteed by section 34 of the constitution. There is no suggestion in that judgment that because the legislation is mandated by the constitution, the test of constitutionality is any different. In conclusion, Justice Kampepe, the importance of this case lies not in Mr. Quilani's obnoxious article. It lies, we submit, in recognizing that the targets of his article and the targets of other similar diatribes must be empowered, should they so choose, to exercise their freedom of expression, to expose, to contradict, and to condemn, and to do so should they so choose in a manner that offends, shocks, and disturbs. Thank you, Justice Kampepe. Subject to any questions, those are our submissions. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Mr. Mugai Tobi. Thank you, Justice Kampempe. Um, you I propose, thank yes. you. And I propose to cover uh, four themes. The first is to conduct an analysis of the relevant. Before you proceed, Mr. Mugai Tobi, may I know what your election is now? Do oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I'm electing to exercise my uh, protection, uh, Justice Kampempe. Okay, Kampempe. fine. Thank, thank you. you. I, I had forgotten. Um, so the first theme is to undertake an analysis of the relevant constitutional uh, provisions. The point we are going to make there is that PEPUDA is mandated by section 9.2 of the constitution, the regulation of uh, degrading speech, which is really what we are dealing with. It's degrading speech, not merely speech that shocks, offends, or disturbs, but it's, it speaks that targets dignity. That's the first theme. The second theme is to focus on the act itself and to try to answer the questions of intelligibility. And the third theme is to focus on a section 36 analysis. And then finally is to look at the errors in the Supreme Court of Appeal judgment. There are three primary mistakes that I want to draw the court's attention to. But before I do this, it is necessary to just put the court in the atmosphere of the trial. 
Because on appeal, one can easily lose the sense of what the evidence was at the trial. And this is a point that was raised earlier, I think, by uh, Justice Majid, who asked whether or not the evidence did not show the not just vulnerability, but that that vulnerability was in fact um, uh, uh, exposed by this article. If one looks at the evidence of Ms. N, um, she has been named in the article, but she had asked for her identity um, not to be disclosed. Only two passages uh, for now. The first one is at volume six, page 886. And particularly at page 887, where she is asked to explain why she draws the link between what Mr. Kolana said and her own experience. She says, the link I am drawing from the article is based on the experience I had. I know for a fact that the article presented us in a way that would make the thinking of the community not to regard us as equal to other people. And at the same time, we are equated to animals. It becomes worse when it is done by a person of influence like Mr. Kolani with a famous newspaper where the article appeared. The second portion is at page 898, where in the third paragraph, she emphasizes the point in reference to where Mr. Kolani said he supports the reference to gays and lesbians by Robert Mugabe. We will remember that Mr. Mugabe said that they were like dogs. And then this is what she says. She says, these are painful words which show hatred to the LGBTI community. It creates the perception to the other members of society in that they find it within their right to treat the LGBTI community as dogs and non-humans. Mrs. Mukwena, who was the director of the People Against Women Abuse, also gave evidence. And at, at page 854, I just want to draw this, the court's attention to one passage that she makes because she is also asked on the question of the linkage between the article and actual violence. In other words, the transition between speech to action. And she says, for us, there is a direct link between a lesbian woman who is raped in the community. Before she is raped, firstly, she is raped by someone that they know and that someone is someone that has been harassing them about being lesbian. Someone that has called them names before, either Ui Stabane or Ui Trans. Those are the names that they are being called. Sometimes they would go to the tavern with the very same person. Sometimes you find that they know it's a community person. But that one day when they are in a tavern having a good time, that person is there. That night when they leave the tavern, that person rapes them. For us, this is a direct link because that person didn't say that you are a beautiful woman and I'm interested in you. That person said you are a stubborn or a trans or that you know what it's like to sleep with a man or you don't know what it's like to sleep with a man. If you sleep with a man, that will change you from being a lesbian. So we are not dealing with abstract notions of speech. We are dealing with people's experiences in areas that are most vulnerable in the townships, in the villages. And we are dealing with speech that transitions from words into action. What does the constitution require of this? There are two provisions that are directly relevant to the case. The first one is section nine, and that is the provision dealing with equality. The court is aware of that section. The general provision is section nine one. Everyone is equal before the law and has the right to equal protection and the benefit of the law. Section 9.2, equality includes the full and, and equal enjoyment of all rights and freedom. But here is the injunction on the legislature to pass laws to promote equality. And it says to promote the achievement of equality, legislative and other measures designed to protect or advance persons or categories of persons disadvantaged by unfair discrimination may be taken. And then section 9.3 sets out the grounds of discrimination. And might I say on this point that the prohibited grounds in Pepuda are almost the exact replication of section 9.3, except for HIV AIDS. Pepuda has added HIV AIDS as a prohibited ground, but section 9.3 doesn't. 
and Pepuda has also extended it by reference to analogous grounds. But that should present no controversy because analogous grounds were extended by this court in Huxon versus Lane. The second section that is important, of course, section nine is to be read with section 10, which is the protection of dignity. And the second section that is important is section 16 of the constitution. Now, some time was spent by the SCA, I counted eight paragraphs on the baseline argument. Basically what the SCA held was that section 16.2 contains the baseline for any law that will impinge on speech. And then in paragraph 70 of the judgment, it said that section 16.2 contains the limitation to section 16.1. But it's crucial on an analytical level to explain the distinction because this has already been done by this court in several judgments. One starts with section 16.2 because that section explains speech that enjoys no constitutional protection. The legislature can do anything it wishes with that speech. It may ban it, it may criminalize it, but it's speech that does not contain any constitutional protection. That is speech that is about propaganda to war, incitement to imminent violence or advocacy of hatred that is based on race, ethnicity, gender or religion or constitutes incitement to cause harm. So that is on a definitional level, speech that is outside of constitutional protection. Anything else is in section 16.1. So anything that is not in section 16.2 is constitutionally protected. Now, once we are there, where we are dealing with speech that is constitutionally protected. How can the legislature deal with it if it wishes to limit it? If it wishes to limit that speech, it must make sure that it complies with section 36 of the constitution. And I should emphasize this, section 16.2 plays no role in the justification analysis in relation to laws that limit section 16.1. It plays no role because its function is to explain speech that is outside of constitutional protection. So the real question that was before the SCA, which it actually paid very little attention to, was whether or not section 36 of the constitution saves section 10, one of the Equality Act from constitutional invalidity. Instead, where the SCA fell into error, was to assume that section 10.1 is to be measured against section 16.2. And because it did not fit the so-called baseline, therefore it was unconstitutional. And there were two reasons why they found that it did not fit the baseline. One was that it extended the grounds that are in item C, section 16.2C. The second was that it included vague terms like hatefulness. But both of those should not have been inquiries undertaken by the SCA. The SCA should have limited itself to the inquiry as to whether or not section 10.1 can be saved by reference to section 36 of the constitution. The now I will- I have the by Chobi. Thank you. This is the, the, the right time for the, for the 10 minutes because I'm now going to deal with the third topic of the items. Mr. Mugai Tobi, can I ask you a question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Section 10.1 is said to be, to use the language of the SCA, barely intelligible, vague. And how is it possible then that it could be saved by section 36? Yes, there are two, this, this is part of the conceptual problems. There are two uh, possible attacks to a law. The one is the vagueness attack. That is not a Bill of Rights limitations analysis. It is a vagueness based on the rule of law, section 1C attack. And there is another attack, which is that the provision infringes a right in the Bill of Rights. Now that is to be tested under section 36 of the constitution. Where I am dealing with right now, is not on vagueness, and I'll come to vagueness on the issue of intelligibility. But the vagueness is to be distinguished from an undue infringement of a right. And the two concepts, in fact, in the SAA judgment overlap to the extent that no distinction is drawn whatsoever. It is assumed 
that vagueness also implies infringement of a right, whereas vagueness is simply a subset of the rule of law. So if we then go to the section itself, uh, section 10 of the uh, of Pepuda. Now I'm just dealing here with the extent to which it justifiably limits the right that is contained in section 16.1 without regard to what is outside of that right in section 16.2. Here, we've got to look at what the words of the section mean to begin with. So we begin with this, the proviso. It is subject to section 12. If we forget about the proviso for now, because that's a different issue, because that is what is outside, it's subject to section 12. But the substantive part of it is to prohibit any person from publishing, propagating, advocating, or communicating words based on one or more of the prohibited grounds against any person that could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention and then hateful, harmful, propagate uh, hatred. Now, part of the problem with the analytical process undertaken by the SCA is taking the words hateful outside of the full section itself, because hateful must be understood against the other two elements in section 10.1. One, the propagation or advocation or the communication of words, but secondly, on one or more of the prohibited grounds. So it's not a mere subjective head of emotions, but it is the effect of degrading. The reason I use degrading deliberately the effect of the degrading, it is because when you are insulted, not by reference to something you have done, you are stupid today in court, but you are insulted on the basis that you are black. So it's, that is the key to the understanding of the section. It is based on one or more of the prohibited grounds because that immediately colors the rest of the section because our understanding of what reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be helpful. If you are merely helpful, but not merely not helpful on the grounds that are prohibited by law, that is outside of the reach of the statute. And therefore there will be no breach of the section. If you are harmful or you are inciting harm on a prohibited ground, then you are violating the section. If you are propagating hatred on a prohibited ground, therefore you are violating the section. So the problem is the lifting of the word Sorry, helpful. Mr. Nugai, Toby, can, yes, I, can sir, I just sir. interrupt you? Would an ordinary citizen know then whether the conduct they are alleged to have been guilty of is indeed propagating a hatefulness? Indeed, they would. In How? fact, because the statute says, if you are engaged in hateful, but based on one or more of the prohibited grounds, so there would obviously be a link, a necessity for a link. If a person says, I acted in ignorance, which is a different part of the section, I acted in ignorance, I didn't know what the law is. I mean, the law in this country is quite clear of what. I mean, everybody always says, I didn't know. Or sometimes someone would say, I had no intention, right? But that can also be interpreted by reference to what the language says. But that's a different part of it, it says, could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention. In other words, an objective person looking at what you've said, can they draw the inference that you had a clear intention? That of course does not mean your own intention is not a defense. But there would be no problem in an ordinary person knowing that if I had someone else on the basis of a prohibited ground, I would be infringing the act. I mean, that much we say is reasonably clear if you look at section 10.1 ABC holistically. The so-called vagueness is introduced by lifting the term hateful outside of the context of 10.1 as a whole. That is where the problem is. But as soon as it is understood in the light of the preceding sentence, then the vagueness completely disappears. One may ask almost everything about ordinary people, 
Would they know what disability means under section nine? Would they know what discrimination on the grounds of gender under section eight means? So a statute by its nature always gathers meanings over time by construction and interpretation and reinterpretation by the courts. Intelligibility does not mean a, a section is difficult to interpret. It means a section is almost impossible to interpret. It's that extent of vagueness that means impossibility. Where a section is reasonably capable of bearing a meaning by a reference to its own words, one should not easily reach the uh, conclusion of lack of intelligibility. And here I've made the, propo the proposition to the court that if you look at the section holistically, the hurtfulness must relate to a prohibited grounds. In other words, it must be a debasing, in other words, a dignity debasing speech or a degrading speech, a speech that identifies an element of you that is unchangeable. And this is why Mr. Oppenheimer is quite wrong when he draws comparisons between race and belief and says that belief is something that can be changed. Because belief at that point that it is held is genuinely held as a matter of conviction. And it is not up to me to debase you, to degrade you on the basis of your belief. The same thing as sex. Sex today is something that itself is transient. But Mr. Oppenheimer will have us believe that sex is fixed upon in time. And yet we know that it also can be a transient thing. And that is why this idea of something being fixed or transient does not help us in the analysis. The question is, does this go to the dignity of the person against whom the words are being communicated? And this is why we submit that actually on a proper construction of section 10.1, there is no ambiguity whatsoever. Uh, Mr. Nikol Toby, may I ask you uh, on that uh, question you're dealing with now, as you see the section, uh, is there a difference between to be hurtful and to be harmful? And I guess that's tied in with a question of is this a conjunctive or a disjunctive reading uh, in this section, in the subsections? Thank you, uh, Judge, just, Justice Majid. It is true that there is an overlap between hurtful and harmful. But that overlap cannot render the section unconstitutional. So it's not necessary to draw a distinction between hurtfulness and harmfulness in the context where we are not dealing with physical harm. So that the fact that there is an overlap between the two concepts. But despite that overlap, uh, Justice Majid, one can imagine various forms of harmful speech. One can imagine various forms of what some people have referred to as deep psychological distress, which emanate from one's experiences, insults that are based on your race, insults that are based on the way you look, that may themselves generate anxieties. And that may probably not be hurtful, but harmful in the sense that it might require medical attention. But sometimes hurtful and harmful will be extremely difficult to draw a distinction because the two would actually overlap. But the point I was trying to emphasize here is that the fact that hurtful and harmful ultimately on a grammatic level overlap does not mean that the section itself is unconstitutional on the grounds of vagueness because they are overlapping does not mean that they cannot be given an intelligible meaning. And of course in B, as you, as you know, there is incitement to harm. In other words, when you are inciting people to cause physical harm or sometimes inciting people to regard, I mean, the two examples I've shown from the transcript where what they say their experience is in the communities is that rape sometimes does not just occur so-called corrective rape, it begins by labeling. In other words, it begins by hurtful statements that are based on dignity. It begins by harmful statements, but then it can transition. So I would say the reality is that hurtful and harmful may be used interchangeably in particular contexts, but that is no ground to say the section is therefore unintelligible or unconstitutional on that ground alone. Well, doesn't that leave, if you, if you concede that, doesn't, doesn't that lead to superfluity? Yes, it, it, I would say, suggest that no, because you see hurtful is a particular form of speech 
that sometimes does not have to amount to harmful because hurtful does refer to an individual, but hurtful on the construction I proposed to the court, which is the position of an individual within a group that is protected. So it's not just the position of Dugai Tobi, but it is his position in relation to others that are similarly situated. But harmful itself may be that sometimes it is physical harm. And when understood together with the balance of, the, of that portion, which is incitement to harm, sometimes it may be incitement to physical harm. So take something like harmfulness, which is an example of what may be harmful, may be a statement that is made which causes post-traumatic stress disorder because it is a reminder of a previous traumatic experience. But once it is based on, say for instance, someone was tortured on the grounds that they were a terrorist or someone was raped on the grounds that they were a lesbian, that speech is harmful to the entire community, but it also causes harm that requires medical attention. But it is something clearly higher than hurtfulness because it's, it's causing actual harm to that individual. It's not just... So, sorry, Mr. Nkukotobi, can I, can I ask you this? It seems to me that hurtful and harmful in fact intersect. Yes, they do. And in section 9.3, there are various uh, rights that intersect, for example, race and sex. Indeed. Um, you know, the argument is that that is vague. I, I, I don't understand it. If two, if two aspects of section 10 intersect, why does that make it unconstitutional or vague or unintelligible? No, precisely, Justice, uh, uh, Justice Victor. The fact that there is an overlap, because one can obviously imagine hurtful instances which target an individual, but it's by reference to a characteristic, what we've referred to as immutable characteristic. But one can imagine something that is harmful without, I mean, most things that are harmful will generally speaking be hurtful. Although most things that are hurtful will not all, always be harmful. So what we are dealing with is that level of overlap. But that level of overlap does not mean that the section itself is unconstitutional. Nor does it mean that, that it is of the level of superfluity that should invite this court's uh, powers to declare it unconstitutional on that basis. But on harmful, one can think of many things that will disparage, that will degrade on the grounds that are listed in the section. So we would submit that even if one were to come to the conclusion that hurtful and harmful intersect or overlap, that would not be a ground for declaring it unconstitutional. So if one, so that is the central problem that the SCA seems to have identified with section 10.1a. It's that hurtful is difficult to explain, but we've shown that once hurtfulness is understood in the context of a prohibited grounds, then one is dealing with something that targets one on the grounds of dignity, and therefore there is no constitutional problem. Now that is perfectly compatible with the primary object of the legislation. This legislation is intended for, to give effect to section 9.1 of the constitution to achieve equality. But what is crucial about this legislation is unlike, for instance, the Employment Equity Act, which will regulate relations between employers and employees. This act applies also on a horizontal level. It also is intended to redress discrimination that remains embedded in social structures. And you see this in the preamble, in the second paragraph of the preamble says, although significant progress has been made in restructuring and transforming our society and its institutions, systemic inequalities and unfair discrimination remain deeply embedded in social structures. And this is a unique legislation regulating the social sphere. It's regulating the ways we speak to each other. And the reason it does so is obvious. You know a person is racist when they tell you the K word, it's not when they refuse to give you a job. You know the racism 
when they tell you about your own position. And that is why it's crucial to look at the intention is to resolve the ongoing systemic racial discrimination at social level. And then it says practices. And then it says attitudes as well. Attitudes undermining the aspirations of our constitutional democracy. And those two concepts, a social structure and attitudes show us that what the legislature has decided is that it's not enough to remove structures towards employment and it's not enough to remove structures towards economic empowerment. If you want to achieve equality in society, you have to focus on the social sphere as well. You have to focus on attitudes as well and you must do it by law. Now, this we would say fits the intention behind section nine. And that's why when uh, Mr. Oppenheimer says there is a difference between actual discrimination and hate speech, that is an illusory distinction because the purpose behind section 10 is to remove discriminating, degrading, debasing speech from social discourse and to know that there are statutory consequences for engaging in that form of speech. South Africa is not America, it's not Canada, it's not Europe. South Africa's very foundation is racial discrimination. When this country was established, it was established as a country of white people, where the majority of the people in this country were told that they were non-citizens. The legislature has decided it will not tolerate this anymore. There is no prohibition towards the decision taken by the legislature that to achieve equality, in the social sphere, they must regulate what we say to each other, which is what section 10 is intended to achieve. So bearing in mind those objects, bearing in mind the obligation to pass a law that will achieve equality, and bearing in mind the correct analysis of section 16.1 and section 16.2, we can see manifestly why the SCA fell into error it never considered, gave any meaningful consideration to section nine. It never gave any meaningful consideration to the distinction between section 16.1 and section 16.2. And that is why it did not undertake a meaningful section 36 analysis. If one reads the judgment of the SCA, you will discover that the section 36 analysis is limited to a survey of comparative uh, countries but it never engages our own homegrown jurisprudence on limitations. And that is the next topic I want to now address, which is the section 36 uh, analysis. Now the court will remember section 36.1 says, the rights in the Bill of Rights may be limited only in terms of law of general application to the extent that the limitation is reasonable and justifiable in an open and democratic society based on human dignity, equality, and freedom, taking into account all relevant factors. And then it lists those factors. If we start with what section 36.1 entails, the first is that the court must have a conception of what society is intended to be established by the constitution. It is a society that is based on human dignity, a society that's based on equality, and a society based on freedom. Against that conception of society, we should then ask ourselves, does that society tolerate degrading speech on the grounds that constitute unfair discrimination or not? If it doesn't, then the legislature is at large to pass a law to regulate what we say to each other. And then this next question is, is this limitation itself reasonable and justifiable? Which really is where the debate ought to have been. Given the society we are trying to establish, a society we must admit that is free of racism, which is the basis of the establishment of the South African society. Given that that is the telos, the object of the constitution, is it reasonable and justifiable to regulate insults, calling people baboons among society? Now we would say, of course it is reasonable and justifiable to do it. We 
can look at these factors, nature of the rights. We've got two competing rights. We've got a clash between expression and equality. Where there is that clash, it must be resolved by reference to dignity and equality and freedom. Why? Because those are also the values in section one. Those are also the values in section 36, but they are also rights in themselves. So there is no contest that where speech is degrading, debasing, and humiliates, quite frankly, humiliates on the grounds that one is a lesbian. There is no contest between allowing that speech and regulating it. The nature and the purpose of the limitation, we've already spoken about that, that the primary intention behind this limitation is to give effect to a constitutional mandate to create equality, not just on vertical relations, but on horizontal, personal, and social spheres as well. The nature and the extent of the limitation, we are not dealing with the greatest of respect with a sledgehammer that has been employed to smash a, uh, a fly. We are dealing with civil penalties. This is not the criminalization of speech. And I had my learned friend reading the EFF case. The problem with section 16.2 of the Reuters Assemblies Act, which is why it's unconstitutional, is because it criminalizes speech. So we are not dealing with a disproportionate response to a societal menace. We are dealing with civil penalties. So the extent of the limitation is an attenuated encroachment into the ability to say one's mind. And we are not dealing with people who want to say things that are controversial. To say this speech is controversial speech is to sugarcoat it. And then the relation between the limitation and its purpose, we've already made submissions on that. And then less restrictive means to achieve the purpose. What is so crucial here on less restrictive means, because it's a very important part of the inquiry. The only less restrictive means, now uh, uh, those justices who were here last week when I addressed the court, this is the point where less restrictive means actually applies. So the only less restrictive means that the SCA could think about was that the section must mirror section 16.2. But that reflects a deep-seated misunderstanding of the role of section 16.2, because that section is simply to tell us on a definitional level what is outside the scope of interpretation, I mean, sorry, the scope of protection by section 16.1. It has no role whatsoever in a section 36 analysis. So that is the proposal given by the SCA that the section must mirror. And what they then did is that they imported from the definitions sexual orientation and imposed it here. But think about Mr. another- Toby, Sorry, Mr. Nuka Toby, just that point, that's an important point for me, the one that you're just making. It seems to me that that approach where you, where you then revert to, or you advert to a section 16.2 limitation, that is exactly what uh, this court said in Islamic unity, you should not do. 16.2 okay. has, got, has got nothing to do with limiting 16.1 uh, uh, as, as a limitation. Uh, the limitation is to be section 36. Isn't that direct, diametrically opposite to, to the dictum in, in, uh, in Islamic yes. unity? I can't uh, recall the exact passage now. Yes, precisely. It, it is, in fact, the, the, the odd thing about the judgment is that they do quote the right passages. They, they actually yes. quote the right passages in Islamic unity. But immediately after that, at paragraph 59, they stray away from the injunction in Islamic unity because they start by saying, the baseline, those are the words they use, the baseline to measure any section is section 16.2. And yet they have just said it's actually not the baseline. And so this is where the, the real problem is with the, with the um, 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 yes, yes, yes. Um, so you will see this, uh, just open the judgment now you will see this, the entire reasoning on the limitations is based on the fact that there is no strict correlation between this section 10 and section 16.2, but it's completely against what was held in Islamic unity. And this is where the real problem actually is with the analysis of the, uh, of the SCA. So, and that is why they are less restrictive means approach is an unhelpful approach 
because it's an importation of section 16.2 to an analysis that should be undertaken as section 36, which then blinded them from considering whether or not the regulation of speech by section 10 could have been achieved by means other than the civil sanctions. Our learned friends uh, for Mr. Kolani have not given nothing at all. They have not proposed in their heads of argument, in their oral argument, even in their own um, uh, founding affidavit, they never gave less restrictive means that would be necessary to achieve the purpose. They left the issue totally blank. And the SCA also did not educate us because it did the, uh, the uh, incorrect thing of just applying section 16.2c. And even that application is arbitrary in a sense because it in includes sexual orientation, which we accept, of course, or sexual orientation ought to be included, but it excludes everything else which is where the arbitrariness is. My learned friend says the reason for that inclusion and exclusion is because other grounds are transitional, are transitional. But that can be illustrated to be totally false by reference to the provision itself. If you look at the definition of prohibited grounds, one of the grounds that are unique in the Equality Act is the inclusion of HIV status as a prohibited ground. Now, is my learned friend seriously suggesting that HIV AIDS is a transitional thing. Now one can see the difficulty with the, with, the, with, the, with the argument. So there are in fact no less restrictive means. This is in fact the right balance that has been struck by the legislature to balance out the necessity for us to speak our minds, but not to do it in a way that causes harm to others, that causes deep distress emotional suffering, psychological anguish on the grounds that they just happen to be black. Mr. Mugai Toby. Yes, uh, Justice. Uh, please, please uh, take you back to um, the question of the prohibited grounds and refer you to paragraph 54 of the SEA judgment. Yes, Justice Tero, I'm at 54. Yes, the first sentence says there, the first question therefore, is whether the extension of prohibited grounds to include sexual orientation is constitutionally permissible. If yes. I understand your argument, that was not the central question before the SEA. No, it wasn't. The, that was not, the, the legislature has chosen the grounds in the definition section to the act. It has then done section 10.1 and then it says all of those grounds are applicable. The central question before the SCA was whether section 10.1 is consistent with section 36 of the constitution. In other words, does it pass the limitations analysis? In fact, I'm glad Justice uh, Teron, you've raised this point because that paragraph 54 is one of the best illustrations of the error of analysis because it talks about in relation to the extension of prohibited grounds beyond those such stated in section 16.2, because its mindset was that section 16.2 sets both the baseline and the ceiling. What it forgot is that actually Islamic unity has long rejected that analytical frame. So, so the point then that I make Sorry, the point then uh, that I make here is that on the section 36, a proper section 36 analysis would have come to the conclusion that the section 10.1 read disjunctively, we accept read disjunctively is constitutionally permitted. In fact, that section is constitutionally mandated. We don't make the argument. We've never made the argument that Mr. Marcus is responding to. Don't know who made the argument. No one has made the argument that simply because a section is mandated by the constitution, it should escape close scrutiny under section 36. We've argued that it must be scrutinized like you would do in an apartheid era legislation. We've simply argued that it passes master. The fact that it's post-constitutional and it's constitutionally mandated is a neutral factor in the section 36 uh, uh, analysis. And it is not, entirely accurate. And I think this is a suggestion that was made by um, uh, uh, the Freedom of Expression Institute. It is not entirely accurate that 
there was no justification given for the uh, infringements. There was an extensive affidavit by the minister, which you will find at volume two, the portions that are relevant will be at volume two. There was also an extensive affidavit by the Human Rights Commission. Uh, the relevant portions from the Human Rights Commission you will find at volume two um, from page 107 under the heading response to the constitutional challenge to section 10 hate speech. And the interpretation is provided there in full. The justification for the limitation is provided there in full. The minister also did the same. They say that the justification was not enough, but whatever the rights or wrongs of the minister's approach, this was a unique case because we also led actual evidence of experiences of uh, lesbians in the townships. We led actual evidence of a person who runs an outfit whose primary function is the experiences of lesbians in black communities, Powa and Mrs. N. We led expert evidence. So this was one of those unique cases where you didn't just have the benefit of the pleadings, but you had two weeks of actual evidence led, which is why a law like this is necessary and why speech, particularly by people that are influential and senior enough, like Mr. Kolani, ought to be regulated through civil penalties. So whatever one thinks about the pleadings, once one reads the full scope of the oral testimonies by the witnesses, and this was in the context where Mr. Kolani left the trial, he just never showed up. And the best evidence that was called on his behalf came from the owners of News 24, who in fact admitted that it was an error to publish this article, they should never have published it. So there is in fact no problem of the evidence in this case because there is extensive evidence about the necessity for this kind of protection. Mr. Marcus says there will be cases of abuse. Surely our courts are able to weed out cases of abuse where the hate speech provisions are not utilized to achieve the goals that should be achieved. But one cannot have a scenario like the current one on the propositions that are made. Basically, you know, Mr. Kolane walks free. And what happens then to the project of uh, the, 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 the equality project in the constitution? That leaves then one final point, which is the mistakes in the judgment. I've already referred to the one fundamental analytical mistake which was the baseline argument. And I've shown that the error there is this repeated refrain to the baseline argument is that it's inconsistent with this court's jurisprudence. But I've also referred to another error in the judgment, which is the approach to section 36. It is with respect very superficial and it does not engage with the right questions that are contained not in the jurisprudence of this court, but in the text of section 36. And of course, there is another error, which is that the evidence, particularly the evidence of Mrs. N and the evidence of Mrs. Mukwena was just overlooked completely. I mean, you find extensive references to the evidence of Mr. Nair, but you have no references to the evidence of Mrs. N, to the evidence of, uh, but those were crucial witnesses because they gave face to the abstract constitutional points. Then of course, there is the problem of costs. And Justice Majid uh, had a debate with my learned friend about why the Human Rights Commission was ordered to pay costs. One of the things that was said by Mr. Oppenheimer is that the Human Rights Commission is paying for advocates. Might I say that we ran this case at the High Court pro bono. We ran it at the Supreme Court of Appeal pro bono. We are still running the case here pro bono. So I don't follow where he's coming from with the idea that we're getting paid. But more importantly, on questions of principle, the problem is that if you are going to award costs where a statute is declared unconstitutional against the Human Rights Commission, you are going to chill its ability to discharge a constitutional function. Um, a year ago, I tried to persuade this court in the case of uh, the, uh, the, the amendments to the Electoral Act. Justice Madlanga gave a judgment in which he said, it's crucial not to award costs against the Electoral Commission because doing so 
might chill its ability to fulfill its constitutional obligation. That is salutary and clearly applicable here. But this would not be an issue because even on my learned friends, hypothesis of the instances where costs would be necessary, it's cases of abuse, but he is unable to show that this is a case of abuse. In other words, this has been pursued other than as a genuine bona fide response to a deluge. I mean, the Human Rights Commission gave evidence that said this was one of the cases where they received the highest number of complaints. So it was a deluge of complaints. So to assume that the Human Rights Commission faced with a deluge of complaints would have just folded its arms. I mean, it's a bit irresponsible. So, and Mr. Toby, sorry, I think Mr. Oppenheimer, as I understood him, he's, his argument is that he calls the commission an organ, of, uh, an organ of state and he says that therefore BioWatch applies. That's, I think, is his argument. But that would apply uh, in relation to the minister. We would have no problem there. But what we are dealing here, we are dealing with a, a constitutional organ of state whose primary function is to prosecute cases such as this. So there, there is a distinction. And if they win on the constitutional invalidity, there is the minister. We are precisely in the same zone, Justice Majid, as we were in New Nation Movement, where I was asking for costs against both the minister and the Electoral Commission. And uh, the, the salutary finding by Justice Madlanga was that in order not to chill the Electoral Commission's ability to uh, pursue uh, its function, costs should not be awarded. This is precisely the same. Uh, the, Human Rights Commission and the Electoral Commission are in the same position there. So that would be the answer to the, to the BioWatch uh, to the BioWatch principle. I have one last question uh, from my side, Mr. Nkotobi. It's, a, it's an aspect that some of my colleagues, including Justice Theron, had, had uh, debated with Mr. Oppenheimer, and it's this. If for, on one or other ground we are against you on the question of the constitutional and validity of the section, and we do declare the section uh, invalid uh, and unconstitutional and we adopt a remedy of reading in, what do you say should happen with, with Mr. Kulani's case uh, here? In, the, yes. in that scenario, I'm not saying, I'm just uh, postulating a hypothesis, of course. Yes, no, I appreciate that. Just, Mr. Mugai Toby, Mr. Toby, I was just about to ask that question and also please to ask you um, with the leave of my brother, Justice Majid, um, he'll apologize, I apologize for, but I think it's, it's a follow up to that question. To perhaps when you're answering that question, if you can have regard to paragraph 33 of the judgment of the Supreme Court of Appeal, as well as paragraph 49 and following of the judgment of the High Court. If, if we were to find, um, if, we were, if, if we were to be against you, on the constitutional invalidity of section 10. Wh what do we do then? And what do we make of the, in particular, those portions of the judgment? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice uh, Teron. What we argued in the SCA was that the mere fact that the threshold would have increased or gone up would not necessarily mean that Mr. Kolane walks free because the question would still arise as to whether on the new test, his conduct uh, necessarily falls foul of the new test that has been proposed. Now, we still submit that that indeed on the evidence, Mr. Kolana's conduct would fall foul also of the element of propagation of hatred. Now, I've referred to some portions of the evidence of Ms. Mukwena, it will, the court will find that at, part, at volume five. And I've also referred to the evidence of Mrs. N. The court will find that at volume six. Elements that are crucial about that evidence are that they showed that it's true that one cannot draw a straight causality line. Mr. Kolana said this and I was attacked. But one could conclude that these utterances fueled the fires, they added into a climate that was already hostile. But the other problem is that Mr. Kolan never gave evidence, never gave evidence of intention, never gave evidence that what he was simply trying to do was to ignite a debate, never gave any uh, evidence that said, actually, I regret my actions, nothing. He did not come to the trial at all. Initially, he said he was sick, 
Later on, he just didn't show up without any reason. So you have evidence by witnesses who are experiencing the deep psychological distress as a consequence of his utterances. And you have no countervailing evidence on his part. He calls a journalist who regrets having published the article. So the evidence was uncontested. The evidence against Mr. Golan as to the impact of the article was uncontested. You have findings that have been made. Can, by can, I, can I just jot in, uh, Mr. Ngugai Tobi? I'm just looking at section 10. Does it really need that there must have been harm? Or does it simply need that there must have been a clear intention to cause that harm? Yes, I, that's true. That, that it doesn't re really say that there should be harm. But what we tried to do in the trial was to say the article objectively construed does not require actual harm. But in reality, people's experiences of harm themselves coming, I've read the article, it's been distributed. It's causing me deep distress, particularly in the light of my experiences. So we had both elements established on the evidence. And once you weigh that against the total absence of Mr. Kolani, it didn't show up at the trial. Once you weigh that against, what I'm suggesting is that then you have a totally uncontested case on the evidence. And then you have the findings made by Justice Moshidi, who evaluates all of the evidence and comes to the conclusion that not only does the article reasonably cause harm properly construed or reasonably demonstrate an intention to cause harm a properly construed, but it also did as a matter of fact cause harm because I have witnesses telling me they've been harmed by it. And then against that, you have the SCA analyzing the evidence of Mr. Nair, Professor Nair, and never paying attention to the evidence of the witnesses on the ground and never weighing what to do with Mr. Kolani in the light of his own uh, findings. And it seems to have assumed that simply because it had amended the uh, legislation, therefore Mr. Kolani was not guilty of hate speech. So we would say in that respect, that was another error that the SCA committed in failing to analyze the conduct of Mr. Kolani and in deciding whether or not that conduct nevertheless falls far of the newly read in provision. So we would say it still remains the case that this court should on its own find that Mr. Kolani, even on the newly wedded provision is still guilty of hate speech because there's just no evidential problem in this case. This is one of the most unique aspects of it is that the evidence is against him. He didn't contest it, he didn't show up. Um, thank you, Justices. That is the end of what I have to say. Thank you, Justice Khampem. Thank you, Mr. Ngubai Tobi. The court will take a 30 minute adjournment. Court will adjourn until 13, 37. Please note that during the adjournment, you are welcome to switch off your video and mute your microphone and then rejoin with video and sound when the hearing commences at 13.37. Should you exit, please use the same link to rejoin the hearing.
Presiding Justice Campepe or Councillor Online. Thank you. Ms. Pillay. Thank you, uh, Justice Campepe. In, in oral argument the before- The Minister Protection. Thank, thank you, Justice Campepe. Uh, we intend to deal with the following issues in the following sequence. Uh, firstly, we provide the Minister's position on section 16 of the constitution and its interrelationship with section, six, section 10 of Papuda. Secondly, we will address the court on the justification analysis. While we address all the components of the analysis in our written submissions, in oral argument, we will focus specifically on 36A, 36B and 36C. And finally, Justice Kampepe, we will deal very briefly with the question of remedy. If I may then begin by setting out the minister's approach to the question, uh, so, sorry, to section 16 and the interrelationship between section six, 16 of the constitution and section 10.1 of the act. The minister accepts that section 10.1 of the act is broader than section 16.2c of the constitution. And there are two key respects in which the section 10.1 is broader. Firstly, it includes prohibited grounds which are defined in the Equality Act and therefore extend beyond the four grounds listed in section 16.2c. And secondly, it prohibits the publication of communication of words that could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, harmful, or to incite harm, promote or propagate hatred. This is of course distinct and much wider than what's provided for in section 16.2c which not only requires the advocacy of hatred, but it also requires that such advocacy constitute incitement to cause harm. We, we agree with the, SA, with, the, with the HRC where they say to, your, to the court that the real issue before the court is a proper analysis of justification. And we agree with the, with the, the crit criticism of the decision of the SEA in its approach to how it conducts the, the justification. The court will see that the SEA employed what they call a baseline analysis, where they use section 16.2c 16 as a baseline from which they measured all of the uh, justificatory um, analysis and information placed before the court. And we submit that this was a flawed approach. Once the court had identified that the purpose of section 16.2c was merely to carve out from section 16.1 expression which is not constitutionally protected. We submit that beyond that exercise, section 16.2c then is no longer relevant. What is then before the court is a pure justification analysis, 
where the court would then look at section 36 and measure whether or not the limitation, which is section 10.1, meets the requirements of section 36. Now, in dealing with section 36A, and that's the first step of the justification analysis, Justice Khampepe, it's tried that the that free speech plays an important role in our constitutional dispensation. That much we submit is indisputable. We have dealt with this in, in paragraphs 22 and 23 of our heads of argument. And the Constitutional Court on Authority, authority on this point we submit is unanswerable. But what is before you is a slightly different issue. And that's what was recognized in Islamic unity, where the court referred to the threat posed by speech to the exercise and enjoyment of other equally important rights. Now, in, in Keekstra, which is the, the Canadian Supreme Court case, quoted in our heads of argument at paragraph 31, we, the court deals, dealt specifically with free speech and its implications for the right to dignity. And the court held a person's sense of human dignity and belonging to the community at large is closely linked to the concern and respect accorded to the groups to which he or she belongs. The derision, hostility and abuse encouraged by hate propaganda therefore have a severe impact on the individual sense of self-worth and acceptance. The impact may, may cause target group members to take drastic measures in reaction, perhaps avoiding activities which bring them into contact with non-group members or adopting attitudes and postures directed towards blending in with the, with the majority. Such consequences bear heavily in a nation that prides itself on tolerance and the fostering of human dignity through amongst others, respect for, for many racial, religious and cultural groups in our society. Now, Justice Khabibi, the applicants urge us to practice tolerance and to encourage what they refer to as the acceptance of the public airing of disagreements and the refusal to silence unpopular views. And you would have heard in the course of the morning that these sentiments also find reflection in the submissions made on behalf of the Media Monitoring Africa. In fact, I ask the court to turn up the applicants' heads of argument. They refer in, that, in those heads of argument at paragraph 94 thereof. to a paper by Denise Myerson, in which she identifies the dangers of suppressing race, race speech. So what Ms. Myerson says is the following, to drive an evil view underground can actually increase its strength, whereas to debate it out in the open is more likely to bring home its aberrant nature. It is precisely those who after all believe that there is a truth about the awfulness of racism we should be optimistic about the power of debate and argument to demonstrate their truth. They came to their views by reason and since they do not believe themselves to be intellectually superior, should trust in reason rather than the police force as the better weapon against falsehood. Ms. Meinsen says it is only too easy for censorship laws to be put to different uses from those originally intended. And if we are happy for them to be deployed in one way, we make it much easier for them to be deployed in other, more frightening ways later. And a final consideration here is that, to the extent that racial animosities will continue to plague us, it is better to let them be played out at the level of words, rather than to bottle them up, thereby not only increasing their virulence, but making them more likely a more dangerous kind of discharge. Now, with respect, my lady, uh, Justice Khampepe, the very sentiment which Ms. Myerson articulates in that, in, in that passage, the very basis, the pillar of the applicant's arguments before you this afternoon has already been dismissed by this court. And this court has done that in the case of SARS versus CCMA, where the Chief Justice writing for a unanimous court said the following at paragraph 10 of that judgment. Another factor that could undermine the possibility to address racism squarely would be a tendency to shift attention from racism to technicalities. Even where racism is unavoidably central to the dispute or engagement, the, tend the tendency is, according to my experience, to begin by unreserved unreservedly acknowledging the gravity and repugnance of racism, 
which is immediately followed by a de-emphasis and over-technicalization of its effects in a particular setting. At times, a firm response attracts a patronizing caution against being emotional and an authoritative appeal for rationality or thoughtfulness that is made out to be sorely missing. The court then went further and said the following, that in my view is a nuanced way of insensitively insinuating that targets of racism lack understanding and they tend to overreact. That mitigating approach would create a comfort zone for racism, for racism practitioners or apologists and is the most effective enabling env environment or fertile ground for racism and its tendencies. And the logical consequence of all this gingerly or reasonable approach to racism, coupled with a neutralizing reference to the word kaffir as the K word, is the entrenchment, and this is the important lines, is the entrenchment and emboldenment of racism that we now have to contend with so many years into our constitutional democracy. Imagine if the same approach or attitude were to be adopted in relation to homophobia, xenophobia, arrogance of power, all facets of impunity, corruption, and other and similar societal ills. That somewhat exculpatory or sympathetic, sympathetic attitude would, in my view, ensure that racism or any gross injustice similarly held, handled becomes openly normalized again. Those who should help to eradicate racism or gross injustice could, with that approach, become its unintending, unconscious, or indifferent helpers. Now, that, that's a powerful sentiment from this court, my lady, and it taps into the very purpose of the legislation before you today. It is precisely the entrenchment and emboldenment of unfair discrimination in the form of racism, of homophobia, of misogyny, of xenophobia, and the harm that it causes that has resulted in the state drawing a line in the sand, which it has done through the enactment of this legislation. And this, you will see Justice Khampepe, the minister himself says this. In the minister's affidavit at page 98 of the bundle, at paragraph 46.1, the minister is at pains to locate section 10.1 within the scheme of the Equality Act and indicate that, it's that the act is designed to give effect to the guarantee and the, of equality and the prohibition of unfair discrimination. And the minister says expressly that the prohibition is intended to protect vulnerable groups against words that are intended or calculated to hurt them. And this harks back to what Mr. Mr. Nukaitubi submitted before you this afternoon. It's about degrading speech, speech that is meant to demean on one of the prohibited grounds. The minister says that the prohibition is to protect vulnerable groups against words intended to hurt or, or calculated to hurt them, to incite harm against them, or to promote or propagate harm against them. And we would submit that that's an important context within which this court must view the, the, the section 10.1. It serves an important constitutional function, and that is the protection of vulnerable groups against undue harm. Within that, within that background, Justice Khampepe, the, the purpose of Section 10.1, which fits into Section 36B of the uh, limitations and analysis, it must be viewed as a measure introduced by government to meet its, meet its obligation under Section 7.2 of the Constitution. To respect Delay, your protection time has expired. As the court teases Justice Khampepe, we, we would submit that the importance and purpose of the, of the limitation is twofold. The first is what I've just addressed the court on a few minutes ago, and that's it's an important tool under Section 7.2 to protect and promote vulnerable groups. But importantly, it seeks to further government's commitment to create a society that is the one described in the preamble of the of the act. And if I may ask the court to turn up the, the act. The court will see that the preamble of the act states describes the kind of society that government wants to create. 
it says the consolidation of democracy in our country requires the eradication of social and economic inequalities, especially those that are systemic in nature, which were generated in our history by colonialism, apartheid and patriarchy, and which brought pain and suffering to the great majority of our people. Although significant progress has been made in restructuring and transforming our society and its institutions, systemic inequalities and unfair discrimination remain deeply embedded in social structures, practices, and attitudes, undermining the aspirations of our constitutional democracy. The basis for progressively redressing these conditions lies in the Constitution, which amongst others upholds the values of human dignity, equality, freedom, and social justice. So the legislature makes it clear, Justice Hampepe, that Section 10.1 isn't introduced in a vacuum. It's introduced for a specific purpose, and the purpose is to bring us one step closer to the society that we all yearn for, which the Constitution promises. And that's the society one finds reflected in the preamble to the Equality Act. If I may then move to 36C, which is the, the nature and the extent of the limitation. Now, we would submit that the, the, there are four factors which limit the extent of the infringement. And the first is the fact that the, the, the section does have embedded within it specific requirements that have to be met before speech qualifies as hate speech. And the first requirement is that it's limited to the use of words based on prohibited grounds. Now, we've, we've heard my little friend, Mr. Mukai Tubi address the court on this point. We, we, we merely want to emphasize the following. The prohibited grounds that are reflected in section 10.1 are not grounds which the, the legislature has just taken from the air and replicated in section 10.1. Those are the specific grounds on which the legislature has indicated that discrimination would become unfair. So in other words, these are the prohibited grounds relevant to unfair discrimination. And that's the very same basis on which the legislature has indicated that speech would then qualify as hate speech if the words are on the prohibited grounds. The, the second specific requirement requires the demonstration that the words could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, harmful, or to propagate hatred. Ms. Pillay, yeah. can I ask you this on that point? It seems to me that uh, Section 10 one sets a very high bar uh, to prove that there was a, a clear intention. Yes. So does that not allay the fears of those who say that it will uh, defer, deter free speech, it will deter debate, and it will have a chilling effect. Uh, Justice Victor, we submit that it does. And it's the very, it, it's the very issue that when one hears, listens to the applicant argue, you don't quite see a reflection of the, the strict requirements of Section 10 reflected in his argument. Because as, as Justice Victor correctly points out, that it does set a high bar in order to demonstrate that in a particular case, that the person concerned, that they, it could be reasonably construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful, to be harmful, or to promote, to propagate or promote hatred. We would submit that in fact, it is a high bar and that does lend itself to saving the constitutionality of the section rather than the opposite, because it does narrow the ambit of the, of, of the section. Coupled to that, uh, Justice Victor, we must emphasize that what is required to be proved is not only that it should be reasonably be construed to demonstrate an intention, but it's a clear intention, which is an even stricter requirement. So an applicant who wants to bring a cause of action within section 10.1 would have to demonstrate that the person who uttered the words yeah, had to would, would, would intention be intention if it's not clear? <laughs> Well, <laughs> Justice Nalanga, there, there could be instances where one would infer intention and that would not necessarily meet the requirements of demonstrating a clear intention. We would submit that a clear in intention does set a higher threshold than or, an, an inference of intention. The, 
we, we've set out in our heads of argument that the words reasonably be construed does incorporate an objective standard. We know that the SCA found the contrary and with respect, we could not find any sufficiently reasoned explanation for why the SCA held that there is an, an, a subjective assessment rather than objective. The, the, the language of the section is clear. We would submit the use of the words reasonableness together with a clear intention does import a, a standard, an, an objective standard rather than a subjective one. The assessment of the, of the reasonable reader or hearer is what is at stake here. And it's what the reasonable hearer or reader would do is to look at the effect of the words on readers or hearers generally. So th that we submit is the first factor that the court must take into account that there are defined requirements that need to be met. And as we submit that th that sets a high threshold for falling within the ambit of section 10.1. The second factor is what we describe as the potential for a constitutional disjunctive reading or a conjunctive reading of the three, of the three requirements of section 10.1 namely section 101A, section 101B, and section 101C. And perhaps I should explain the, the submission a bit further. If this court, what's clear is from a textual analysis of section 101A, B, and C, that the, the text is neutral on whether or not the requirements are to be read disjunctively or conjunctively. There's no clear indicator either way, which we would submit places this court in a a good position to either adopt a disjunctive interpretation or a conjunctive interpretation. To the extent that this court is inclined to adopt a disjunctive interpretation, we would submit that coupled with that would be a requirement that the court narrow the, the interpretation of some of the requirements, particularly the requirement of, of hurtful that coupled with a disjunctive interpretation, the court would have to narrow the interpretation of the term hurtful. Alternatively, this court could ad 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 adopt a conjunctive interpretation of the three requirements, in which event we submit that it would, would not be necessary to bring a special interpretation to any one of the three components. Just as Majid, perhaps it's, it's an appropriate point to, to respond to a, a concern you had raised about the, the superflu, superfluity of the, of the section, the use of the word. Yeah, you, read my, you read my mind, Ms. Pillay, I was going to ask you, uh, just to repeat, it seems to me that if one strives for a conjunctive reading in order to meet the uh, requirements of the constitution to read it consonant with the rights in the Bill of Rights in terms of section 39.2, if we adopt a conjunctive reading, it does lead to problems with regard to hurtfulness and harmfulness, is there a distinction? A, is there a distinction between those two? And we B, would, if so, I'd, I'd like you to enlighten me about what those, what hurtfulness means, please. Justice Majid, we would submit that hurt, hurtfulness is a, but a small component of harmfulness. It cannot be that it means something different from harm. So while all hurt must be harm, the court must also accept that all harm is not necessarily hurt. But having said that, we submit that the fact that hurt does fall within the ambit of harm wouldn't prevent this court from adopting a, a conjunctive interpretation. And we say so for the following reasons. As we understand the presumption against superfluity, it is nothing more than an interpretive tool to assist a court with approaching a particular provision and opting for an appropriate interpretation of that provision. And it's nothing more than a presumption. What we're dealing with here is an interpretation under section 39.2 of the constitution. We would submit that that interpretive approach displaces the presumption. So in other words, put differently, a 39.2 interpretive approach we would submit is not barred by a presumption against superfluity. Ultimately, the test is whether or not the 
uh, interpretation which the court arrives at is a constitutional one. Um, I must tell you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Pillay, sorry to interrupt. My, my, my superfluity is but one of my problems. My major problem is the question of vagueness. What does hurtful mean? Does the average citizen, will this average citizen understand what it means? We would submit, Justice Majid, that when one approaches section 10.1, it's important not to identify words used in isolation. So for example, if one looks at the section and just extracts the word hurtful, in and of itself, it does raise red flags about whether or not a person on the street would be able to understand wh what conduct is allowed and what conduct is not allowed. But if one considers hurtful within its context, context if one considers the requirements to section 10.1, which I've already addressed the court on, that no person may publish, propagate, advocate, or communicate words based on one or more of the prohibited grounds against any person that could reasonably be construed to demonstrate a clear intention to be hurtful. So once you couple the word hurtful with the fact that the words must be on a, pro on a prohibited ground, we would submit that it does remove the concern around vagueness. In any event, Justice Majid, the provisions like section 10 cannot be too prescriptive because of course they must lend themselves to a variety of factual instances, innumerable factual instances, which cannot be anticipated or contemplated by the legislature in advance. And what the court will see is that over a period of time, through the development of jurisprudence, these words will begin to take shape in a manner which the court deems constitutional. And so it will become clearer over time as it has be started becoming clearer over time. We now do have the beginning of judgments where the courts have begin to, began to interpret section 10.1. While I'm on the, on the topic of a conjunctive interpretation, if I may just deal with a submission that was made by the applicant earlier this morning. And it was put to the court that in relation to section 10.1b, that this court, as part of its conjunctive interpretational exercise, should interpret the word or to mean and, so that one would read be harmful conjunctively with and to incite harm. Now, we would submit such an, such an interpretation would radically change the meaning of the section as well as the reach of the section in a way would, which would completely undermine its purpose. And I can do no better but to refer the court to the, the, S, the CCMA case, the SARS versus CCMA case, where this court found that the very use of the, the K word, and I know I'm, I'm becoming a, a culprit by using the word K word, it's just too painful to say the full word, but, but the use of the K word in and of itself was sufficiently harmful to constitute hate speech. So in other words, irrespective of whether or not that word incited harm, the court had held that the mere use of the word was sufficient. So we would submit on that test, the interpretation which the applicant contends for, which is that there always has to be the incitement for, of harm in order to, to qualify as hate speech is a flawed interpretation. Moreover, it does reintroduce into the debate the problem with the baseline argument because the court will remember that the question of incitement to harm features prominently in section 16.2c. And I've been at, at, play, at pains to point out to the court that in an assessment of justification analysis under section 36, that section 16.2c plays no role. 
And if the court was to introduce the requirement of incitement of harm, what it would actually be doing is introducing a section 16.2c requirement into a section 36 process. Excuse me, what is the role of the proviso in section, section 12 and how to interpret it? Yes. Uh, Justice Infanta, I was literally turning to that point, and that's, that is our third, uh, third factor which we want to draw the court's attention to. And that's the fact that Section 12 imposes additional restrictions and that it expressly carves out certain types of conduct from the ambit of hate speech. Now, Justice Infanta, perhaps I should turn, ask the court to open Section 12 of the, of the Act. The court will immediately see that section 12 performs two functions. Firstly, it imposes a prohibition on the dissemination and publication of information that unfairly discriminates. But secondly, and more pertinently for the purposes of a section 10 debate, it introduces a proviso but in order to understand the proviso, one needs to read the section holistically. And the section says the following, no person may A, disseminate or broadcast any information or B, publish or display any advertisement or notice that could reasonably be construed or reasonably be understood to demonstrate a clear intention to unfairly discriminate against any person. So that's the, that's the prohibition. The section then goes further to introduce the proviso. It says, Provided that bona fide engagement in artistic creativity, academic and scientific inquiry, fair and accurate reporting in the public interest, or publication of any information, advertisement, or notice in accordance with section 16 of the Constitution is not precluded by the section. And the court will immediately be alive to the fact that the, the wording used in the proviso is very familiar. And the reason why it is familiar is it because it harks directly back to section 16, 1A to D. So if the court were to conduct the exercise of going through the proviso and ticking off each of the items listed in the proviso, for example, engagement in artistic creativity, you will see that that's reflected in section 16, 1C. Academic and scientific inquiry, you will see is reflected in section 161D, fair and accurate reporting in the public interest would be section 161A. And then lastly, publication of any information advertisement or notice is reflected in section 161B. So all that section 12 does is it incorporates what's listed in section 161A to D into the proviso but it has a very important requirement. And the requirement is that this must be demonstrated, it must be demonstrated that this is bona fide. So the short answer to your question, question Justice and Plantla is the following, that the proviso introduces what's set out in 161A to D into, a, into the section 10 analysis, but it introduces the requirement that those items must be bona fide. So in other words, if somebody has to raise section 16.1a to d as a defense to a claim of hate speech, they will need to demonstrate that it was engaging in bona fide activity. Now we note that the, the court was, the SEA was scathing in relation to section 12. I'm sorry, Ms. Pillay, on the last statement that you've made. Yes. Would it be your submission or are you saying that section 12 in fact limits or prescribes the limits of section 16.1? No. The, 
what, what we are submitting, um, Justice Tehran, is that for purposes of Section 10, the proviso to Section 12 um, carves out the ambit of hate speech that's set, set out in Section 10. But specifically that it imposes the requirement of bona fide, which in a sense does limit uh, Section 10 1 HD. That is my question, Ms. Pillay. Yes. Yes. Because there's no mention of bona fides in Section 16 1 of the Constitution. Yes. And then Section 12 brings in the limitation of bona fides. What do you say about that? Well, we we is submit that. that it, it, it is an additional requirement that you now have to demonstrate your bona fides, but we would submit that that requirement would meet the, uh, the test of Section 36. Anyone who would in any event have raised any of those defenses, section 10.1a to d, would need to demonstrate to the court that it's a genuine defense. And we would submit that genuine and bona fides is, is really the same thing. Can I ask you about section 12, Ms. Pillay? Um, there's a reference to the publication of any information, advertisement or notice in accordance with section 16 of the constitution. That presents difficulties to me in the following sense. It seems to me what is meant there that as long as speech is, doesn't fall under section 16.2c, it would not fall foul of the, of the prohibition that's set out in section 10.1. That's how I understand it. Um, as long as it's an information advertisement or a notice. If it is so, then it means that every inquiry that we make under this section 12 would be whether the hate speech falls within section 16.2c or not. Yes. Now, it seems to me that that cannot be so because the Equality Act clearly uh, has as its objective to extend the grounds uh, beyond section 16.2c. Do you see my difficulty? I, I do, Justice Majid. Can I just take, take the court back to our interpretation of section, the proviso to section 12? We've, we've been at pains to demonstrate to the court that what section the proviso to section 12 does is that it replicates what's set out in section 16.1a to d. So whether, whether section says in accordance with section 16 of the constitution, that with respect relates to all of the items which appear before it, because all of those items are set out in section 16.1a to d. So it's not only limited to the last item, which is the publication of any information, advertisement, or notice. So in other words, all that the legislature was trying to do here was to, to give effect to section 16, 1A to D of the constitution. When we accept the point raised by Justice Tehran that there is an additional requirement and that additional requirement is that you have to demonstrate bona fides. We would submit that there's nothing untoward in that. Any litigant would in any event have to demonstrate that it's the defense is a genuine one. And then just on the proviso again, uh, that could reasonably be construed or reasonably, reasonably be understood to demonstrate a clear intention to unfairly discriminate. Yes. That's very difficult to understand uh, for me. Uh, and uh, I may be obtuse, but it seems to me that the average citizen would have difficulty understanding what is meant by reasonably be construed or reasonably be understood to demonstrate a clear intention. Justice Majid, the, the section that you've just, the sentence that you, you've just taken us to now precedes the proviso. So in other words, in a discussion in relation to section 10, where, the, where section 10 one says subject to the proviso in section 12, it would pick up from where the words provided that. So in other words, the preceding words are not relevant to an analysis of section 10. Yeah, but that's a, that's a different inquiry. I want, I want you to explain to me whether this isn't vague, uh, section 12, this, this part of section 12. That, that's my problem. I understand it's not part of the proviso, but what does it mean, those words? As, as we understand it, it, it relates to the dissemination of broadcast of information and where it can, no, the, the prohibition is that no person may disseminate or broadcast information that could reasonably be construed or reasonably be understood to demonstrate a clear intention to unfairly discriminate. So in a sense, it mirrors the, the hate speech provision, but makes it applicable to the dissemination of broadcast of information. And of course, it, 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 it casts it very clearly in the context of unfair discrimination rather than hate speech. 
which is what section 10 specifically focuses on. Ms. Pile, what do you say about uh, the problem that uh, Mr. Oppenheimer referred to with regard to bona fide? Um, he, he seemed to argue that uh, if you apply bona fide to all the activities, uh, there may be a problem. Um, or or um, I might have misunderstood his argument, but, uh, but I thought he made that argument. What do you say to that? Uh, I, I recall my learned friend making the argument, and the difficulty I have with it is quite simply this. We know that where these items are couched in a proviso, that what it does is it extends a defense to somebody that faces proceedings under Section 10. So in the ordinary course, someone who raises the defense would have to demonstrate that the defense is genuine. And we would submit that we understand bona fide to, to mean merely that, that you have the added obligation of, you cannot just claim it because it's reflected in the constitution. You must demonstrate to the court that it's a genuine defense factually. That's what we understand the word bona fide to mean in interpreting that against section 10. So we, we've addressed the court on, on three factors, which we say are relevant to the extent of the limitation. The fourth factor, um, Justice Khampepe, is the fact that there is no criminal sanction for non-compliance with Section 10.1. And we submit that this is a weighty consideration. Section 10.1 does not criminalize hate speech. All it does is provide civil remedies for transgressions of section 10.1. These are set out in section 21.2 of the act. And what the act makes clear is that a court granting a remedy under the act must grant an appropriate remedy, which we know means effectively that the court must grant a just and equitable remedy. Now that drags with it or carries with it the abundance and the rich jurisprudence of this court on what constitutes just and equitable re relief or what constitutes appropriate relief. And what it does mean is that ultimately any remedy that's granted by a civil court or the equality court will be one that is suitable to the facts and circumstances of the case. And so one is unlikely to get a disproportionate outcome from what the facts demand, simply because the legislature has ensured the power and the constitution does it as well, the power of the equality court and the obligation to grant an appropriate remedy or just an equitable remedy. Justices, that, that leads us then to deal with our, the last issue which we wanted to, delve, to deal with, which was the question of remedy. We would submit that a proper justification analysis, which is what was severely lacking in the SEA, must re lead this court to the conclusion that the limitation is justifiable and justified. But in the unlikely event that the court finds that the section is unconstitutional, the minister asked that the matter be, the, the section be remitted to parliament and that the legislature be, be given 18 months to correct the defect. But in the meantime, the, it is necessary for this court to put some sort of regime in place to provide the much needed protection to vulnerable groups. The SEA has suggested a remedy. To a large extent, the suggestion is, is, is inadequate because all it does is it replicates section 16.2c. And we know that that provides little or no protection 
because it's not really relevant to section 16.1. But if this court were inclined to, uh, to embrace the SCA interim solution, we would ask the court to expand the prohibited grounds of the pr prohibited grounds to those set out in the Equality Act. The legislature has deemed it fit to provide wide protection to vulnerable groups against harm deliberately inflicted or harm which can reasonably be inferred to have been deliberately inflicted. And we would ask the court to honor that by including the wide prohibited ground set out in the Equality Act. Alternatively, at the very least, we would support the suggestion that the court should do it on the ground set out in section 9.3 of the constitution. I think that's a submission made on behalf of one of the amici. I think it's SAHGS. But that would be, on our submission, that would be a, a last resort. We do uh, say- but sorry, Ms. Kapale, sorry to interrupt you, but just on that submission, based on the separation of, print, uh, of powers principle, and given the fact that this is a, is a temporary solution until parliament legislates, uh, legislates as it must do, uh, and not this court, would it not be safer uh, and better in terms of our jurisprudence and separation of powers to simply limit it to section 9.3 of the constitutional grounds and not to to go beyond that, because then you're on constitutionally sound ground in the sense that you are acting within the parameters of the constitution and you're not seeking to prescribe to parliament what to legislate beyond section 93 of the constitution. Justice Majid, we would sub submit that that is a competent approach. However, it is not insignificant that what we are dealing with here is protection of vulnerable communities. And it's protection of vulnerable communities in instances where someone deliberately seeks to inflict harm. And with that in mind, we would submit that the, the wider protection which the Equality Act seeks to confer is not inappropriate. And that given the fact that that didn't really feature very much in the case, the question whether or not the full range of prohibited grounds should be included or not that the court should defer to the legislative choice on that issue. Well, it seems to me that it's more appropriate for parliament yes. to have its uh, hearings in the portfolio committee, to have its full deliberations and then, then to legislate. All I'm saying is that as a court, we would be on a safer ground uh, within the, the realm of, the, of separation of powers to simply stick to the constitution is all I'm saying. We, we, would, we would accept that as, as, a, as a last resort if the court were not inclined to, to include the prohibited ground set out in the equality. Justice of, of the court, um, we are very aware that you've got a very long day ahead of you. We are loath to repeat any of the arguments made by the Human Rights Commission and by Mr. Nukaitubi on behalf of the Human Rights Commission, or repeat what's set out in our heads of argument. Unless there's anything specific that the court wishes to raise, those are our submissions. Thank you, Ms. Pillay. Mr. Trenkov. May it please you, Justice Confepi, members of the court. I propose to confine our oral submissions to the implications and impact of Section 9.4 of the Constitution. And what I propose to do is to deal with Section 9.4 and its impact on the constitutional validity of Section 10 and then secondly, its impact on remedy. But may I start then with the significance of section 9.4? It reads as follows. No person may unfairly discriminate directly or indirectly against anyone on one or more of the grounds, uh, grounds in terms of subsection three. And then the important part, national legislation must be enacted to prevent or prohibit unfair discrimination. That is the only legislation 
required by section nine. Its other provisions, for instance, sub two, permits of legislation. But subsection four requires national legislation that prevents or prohibits unfair discrimination. And that is a very significant provision. Um, firstly, because that was the legislation which the constitution itself required to be given effect to, to be enacted within two years. Schedule six, item 23.1 of the constitution provides that the legislation required by section 9.4 must be enacted within two years or three years. And that was then in fact also what um, gave rise to the enactment of the Equality Act. And the Equality Act in terms recognizes that its purpose is inter alia to give effect to section 9.4. It does so in section two Firstly, in section 2A, which reads, the objects of this act are, A, to enact the legislation required by section 9 of the constitution, that is 9.4. But then also, and again, in section 2B4, another object is the prevention of unfair discrimination and protection of human dignity as contemplated in section 9 and 10 of the constitution. That is again, the prevention of unfair discrimination. That's again a reference to section 9.4. So we must accept that one of the main purposes of the Equality Act is to give effect to the, not only the mandate, but the injunction of section 9.4, that parliament must enact legislation um, to prevent or prohibit unfair discrimination. Now, the question then is, how does that um, reconcile with Section 16? Unfair discrimination obviously doesn't mean unfair discrimination only by conduct. It means unfair discrimination by word or conduct. In other words, Parliament is under a constitutional obligation to prohibit unfair discrimination by word or conduct and by conduct um, and by word I mean unfair discrimination by speech. So Parliament is under a constitutional obligation to prohibit speech by which people are unfairly demeaned on the enumerated grounds. Speech by which people are demeaned for, for what they are and not for the choices they make. That is a constitutional obligation imposed on Parliament, and it was pursuant to that obligation that it enacted these pro prohibitions in, um, in the Equality Act. Now, our learned friends for the applicant and the SCA assume that that legislation would then be permissible only if it can be fitted into the um, scope for limitation of freedom of expression allowed by section 16.2. But frankly, it's impossible to accommodate the legislation required by section 9.4 into the parsimonious and very narrow um, slither of um, permission given by section 16.2. Section 16.2 is for obvious reasons, creates a far narrower gap than required for the legislation in section 9.4. So there is frankly, on the face of it, a contradiction between 9.4 and 16.2, because 9.4 requires legislation that prohibits unfair discrimination by speech. Section 16.2 simply doesn't allow for uh, so wide a limitation on freedom of expression. And the question then is, what does one do with that apparent conflict or contradiction between these two provisions in the Bill of Rights? And the answer 
that this court has provided again and again and again is that the constitution must be taken to be in harmony with itself, internally harmonious. Its provisions must be interpreted in a way which avoids conflict between them. Now, this court has very often um, subscribed to that principle. Most recently in its judgment in the New Nation Movement case, that's the judgment um, handed down on the 11th of June this year. And in that case, the court, Justice Madlanga, speaking for unanimous court, endorsed this principle again in paragraph 18 by citing the judgment of Chief Justice Ntorbo and Doctors for Life, and then again repeated it in paragraph 63. And if I may just read you what he said in paragraph 63. The constitution is one composite whole. As such, it could not have been framed to be contradictory. That is exactly why the court is held that it is not to be assumed that provisions in the same constitution are contradictory. To the extent that there may be tensions between its provisions, everything possible must be done to harmonize them. So, we are required to harmonize the injunction of section 9.4 with the general protection of freedom of expression in section 16.1. We submit with respect that the only way in which those provisions can be harmonized is to recognize that section 9.4 in fact creates a further carve out from the general prohibition in section 16.1. You cannot interpret section 9.4 otherwise than to qualify the very wide and all encompassing freedom of expression created by section 16. So that the only way in which to give effect to this court's fundamental understanding and interpretation of the constitution namely that all its provisions are in harmony with one another, is to recognize that se although section 16 on its face confers a very wide and all embracing right to freedom of expression, section 9.4 in fact creates uh, a carve out from that general right. So that we submit with respect that the constitutional, uh, that the Supreme Court of Appeal was mistaken and that the applicant in this case is mistaken by their contention that the constitutional validity of section 10 must in the first place be measured against section 16.2. We submit on the contrary, the act and its prohibition of um, hate speech is, gives effect to the injunction of section 9.4. So the first question is, whether it does what section 9.4 requires it to do. And as long as it goes no further than the requirement of section 9.4, that is the end of the inquiry, because that is not only what the constitution permits, that is also what the constitution requires. So the first um, requirement we would submit, the first inquiry is whether the prohibition of hate speech in section 10 uh, uh, prohibits hate speech within the parameters of the injunction of section 9.4. And if it does, then that is the end of the inquiry. And if one then gets to section 10, we uh, will not engage, uh, at least not with any energy, in the debate about objective, subjective, conjunctive, uh, disjunctive and so on. But we do submit that when this uh, section is tested for constitutionality, firstly that the test is one measured against section 9.4 and secondly that the test must be done as this court has often held in the manner prescribed by section 39.2 and the Iundai case. In other words, 
if the section is open to more than one interpretation, one of which would render it unconstitutional and, and another not, then the court would prefer the interpretation that would um, save it from unconstitutionality. And so, for instance, in the, in the uh, conjunctive disjunctive debate, we don't advocate the one interpretation over the other, but what we do submit is that if disjunctive were to render it unconstitutional, then conjunctive should be preferred in order to save it from unconstitutionality. We submit with respect that if one uh, interprets it on the basis that the test is objective, and secondly, that at worst the, requir the requirements must be read conjunctively, then it meets the requirement of section 9.4 in that it does no more than to prohibit unfair discrimination on the enumerated grounds. Or to put it differently, what it prohibits is speech by which people are demeaned for what they are and not for the choices they make. And so we submit with respect that the section is entirely constitutionally compliant because it must be measured against section 9.4. Only if we, uh, only if, if you were to find that the section exceeds the bounds of section 9.4 and uh, prohibits speech beyond its parameters, then you would go to the justification inquiry. That's an inquiry that our learned friends have eloquently um, addressed and we won't go there. But let we, let we emphasize this, that in this inquiry, what we submit is the proper inquiry under section 9.4, what would, is at the forefront of the inquiry is the constitutional uh, project of prohibiting vulnerable people against demeaning discrimination by word or conduct. We heard our learned friends um, speak very eloquently of the importance of freedom of expression. And the applicant argued and supported by some of the amici that vulnerable people should be afforded the freedom to speak for themselves. But with the greatest of respect, that is an unrealistic approach. I understand the theoretical underpinning of it. But are you saying that in South Africa, the lesbian who gets correctively raped every now and then, who is too afraid to go to the shops by day, should be left exposed to that violence of words and conduct on the basis that that is what she requires to speak for herself. She has no voice. And the purpose of the prohibition of discrimination is to protect vulnerable people who can't speak for themselves and do not have the social power, the social platform to speak for themselves and to try and defend freedom of expression on the basis that those vulnerable people should not be pampered, but should be allowed to speak up for themselves is entirely unrealistic and out of keeping with the choices made by our constitution itself. May I go lastly on the question of remedy? If you were to hold contrary to our submission. Before, before that, uh, Mr. Trengo, I, I don't know my sister presiding uh, whether uh, Mr. Trengo took uh, his protection and whether that's not up yet. No, it, it, he, he did not enjoy any protection. No, thank, you, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank uh, you. Mr. Trengo, um, your argument uh, sounds very much like what this court held in Van Yerden, but I've not heard you once refer to Van Yerden. Is, uh, is, is the principle along uh, whose lines you are arguing in any way related to the Van Yerden approach or not at all? No, we submit that that is the same approach, but here, of course, what we're concerned with is discrimination by speech. But yeah, 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 no, I understand that the scenarios are different, but uh, whether there's any analogy at all, yeah. Indeed. 
Okay. Then, uh, secondly, secondly, Mr. Triangle, uh, does uh, demeaning people through speech on the basis of uh, the listed grounds, does that uh, equate or always equate to discriminating against them on those grounds? So, yeah, I'm sure you get me. No, I, uh, let me say, um, I, uh, I would submit that it ordinarily does. Whether it always does is not a question I have sufficiently carefully considered. But, I, uh, but when I speak of demeaning people on the enumerated grounds, I am merely paraphrasing the Constitution. If my paraphrase is an inaccurate one, then I do accept that the ultimate test is not whether you demean people, but whether you discriminate unfairly uh, by word as opposed to conduct. So that the legislation required by section four is a prohibition of unfair discrimination by word and conduct, in this case, by word, by speech. Why I'm asking is, uh, even though I don't have any ready examples, Conceptually, one thinks that there may be instances where one could demean by speech on what uh, the act refers to as prohibited grounds or what section 93 refers to, or rather what we have come to refer to as uh, listed grounds for purposes of section 93. Mm -hmm. But that not necessarily also qualifying as discrimination so I'm interested to hear what your argument would be, you know, in those instances where it's only a speech, and yes, it's speech uh, that, uh, that is covered by or that is envisaged in Section 10.1, um, but, but perhaps not necessarily qualifying as discrimination. What would well, your argument be, if conceptually there is that sort of distinction? Yes, let me say, of course, that the discrimination prohibition in itself uh, prohibits not mere differentiation, but unfair differentiation, unfair discrimination. So that I, I wouldn't suggest uh, discrimination by, by word or conduct means treating people differently based on the enumerated grounds, but it becomes unlawful only if it is unfair. And you know of the test that uh, the, this court has laid down to determine that unfairness. So it is not um, an easy or mechanical test that one applies. The test for unfair discrimination is a nuanced test and it doesn't simply generalize about treating, treating people in uh, differentiating between people. We all differentiate, but it is only when it becomes unfair and is based on the enumerated ground that it becomes unfair discrimination. But what is clear is that the act does require uh, a prohibition of speech that unfairly discriminates. And insofar as it sets that requirement, Section 9.4 is the benchmark for the adjudication of the constitutionality of Section 10 and not Section 16. May I turn... Mr. Trengov, sorry, Mr. Trengov, may I just, uh, while you're on that topic, um, you say that we must examine whether the Equality Act provisions go any further than what the legislation is uh, envisaged in uh, Section 9.4 of the Constitution. But surely, when it comes to hate speech, we should zoom in on Section 10.1 then and see whether in its terms uh, it is compliant with the Constitution. And then it, it brings to bear considerations, for example, like vagueness, overbreadth, and so on. Is that is that correct? I absolutely accept that. My now, my nine, sorry. Would you like to make any submissions on the on the aspects that we've de debated with, with with some of your colleagues about uh, hurtfulness, harm, etc. Uh, beyond those in your heads, of course, in your written. Let Let me just say this, uh, Justice Majid. If 
uh, we do submit that at worst for section 10, the conjunctive reading is a constitutional one and not unduly vague so as to meet the constitutional requirement for reasonable certainty. Uh, on the conjunctive reading, the speech has to be objectively adjudged hurtful, uh, objectively adjudged to be intended to be hurtful, harmful, or incite harm and pr promote hatred. And there, hurtful may mean hurtful to people's feelings, harmful is physically or psychologically harmful, and promote or propagate hatred. The accumulation of those three factors we submit is sufficiently clear. And le let me just make this clear that the, um, the suggestion, I accept that a word like hurtful is, uh, is capable of many shades of meaning, but that's why courts have often interpreted other statutory provisions, even criminal prohibitions, um, not by giving little effect to their language, but by interpreting them in their context and in order to give effect to their purpose. And this language is equally capable of an interpretation of that kind. And may I give a, a, a small example? Uh, in the criminal law, for instance, we know that criminal, statutory criminal prohibitions very, very seldom say anything about any requirement of mens rea. And yet our courts do not strike them down for vagueness. Our courts interpret them then either to require dolus or in exceptional cases, uh, negligence, or in very exceptional cases, no requirement of mens rea at all. So that the mere fact that the meaning is not plain to the citizen on a literal reading is with respect not the test. The question is whether the court can meaningfully interpret it with reference not only to the text, but context and purpose to render it reasonably clear. And we submit with respect that on a conjunctive reading, it is not so hard to find sufficient meaning in that prohibition. That it is uh, unhappily worded is clearly so, but we submit not fatally so. Mr. Trenkov, I, I would be the last one to, to venture uh, some examples, but I'm always worried when we, when we uh, deal with examples in the criminal law, because as I see it, it's, it, it's fairly uh, clear that for offenses, uh, some sort of mens rea is required. Uh, very few instances where there's a, a faultless liability in criminal law. And then in some instances, of course, or a few instances, it, uh, it stands to reason that what is required is negligence. For example, culpa, culpable homicide, uh, as an example. And uh, it, it does present problems for me if you, if you, do, if you draw that kind of examples uh, where we're dealing with a statute which is really, as I've said to one of the other council, and it was called in one of the sets of heads, it's a statutory dealing. Uh, it, it's a bit of a different kettle of fish, isn't it? A statutory delict, but for that reason, perhaps uh, justifying a, a less stringent test than a criminal prohibition would, because nobody's going to be sent to jail for hate speech. These, the remedies are civil. And if you take other rules of law, if this court's own jurisprudence, which firstly draws on the constitution, a just and equitable remedy, we uh, realize how vague that term is but we don't disqualify it and the constitution in fact uh, legislates for a, a definition of this court's powers in those wide terms. Uh, the interests of justice is an equally uh, flexible term. So that we would submit that as long as the language uh, meets the need of the particular purpose sought to be achieved by the prohibition, uh, precision, greater precision than that is not required. Justices, may I turn lastly to the question of, uh, of remedy? If you were to hold that the section is unconstitutional, then we submit with respect that the issue of remedy uh, should also take account of section 9.4. I'll make two submissions. The one is that section 9.4 uh, 
requires there to be a prohibition of speech which unfairly discriminates. And if you were to adopt, uh, unfairly discriminates on any of those grounds enumerated in section nine. So that is important that you uh, adopt a remedy which keeps in place a prohibition of hate speech on all of the grounds enumerated in section nine. If you were to uh, devise a more anemic remedy, which falls short of that constitutional injunction, then your remedy would be unconstitutional because it would not give effect to section 9.4. So that we are concerned here, not only with a remedy that meets the needs of and the rights of transgressors like Mr. Kulani, what we need is a remedy that also recognizes and affords the constitutional protection of vulnerable people demanded by section 9.4. So that we would submit that you are not constitutionally permitted to put in place an interim rule which is narrower than the prohibition required by section 9.4. The second is this. Um, I have no view about the final judgment that you pass on Mr. Kulani's conduct. Well, I have a view, but it's a private view. My submission to you is not on his guilt or innocence. My submission to you is, however, that he should not escape liability merely because you narrow down the prohibition under which he was prosecuted. If you find that the prohibition was too wide and you narrow it down, but also find that he was guilty with the core that remains, then you're, you should uphold the High Court's finding that he was guilty of a contravention of the, of the rule. And the mere fact that you might use new words to define this, this new rule, as long as this new rule incorporates within it a core of the old rule, which Mr. Kualani contravened, then there is no unfairness in upholding his conviction because the new rule, whether by new words or old words, has not created liability where none existed before. It has merely narrowed down a broader prohibition to a core prohibition of which Mr. Polani is still guilty. So that the SCA's approach of acquitting him simply because it has put in place, it has used new words to put in place a narrower prohibition is with respect to elevate uh, form over substance. The question is whether what remains was part of the original prohibition and whether Mr. Kulani is guilty of that part of the, of the prohibition, old and new. Thank you, uh, Justice Kampepi. Those are our submissions. Thank you, Mr. Trenkov. Ms. Hofmeyer. Thank you, Justice Kampepe, members of the court. Most of the argument before the court today is about the abstract and complex question of the constitutionality of Section 10 of the Equality Act. What the Psychological Society of South Africa is here today to do is to emphasize that that question should not be asked in a vacuum. It is actually not an academic question. It is a question that will have an impact on whether the LGBTI community finally, after 12 years, gets an apology from Mr. Kulani for his hate speech. Justices, on the 20th of July, 2008, readers of the Sunday Sun opened their newspapers to find Mr. Kelani's column. At the time, he was a person of stature. He was a struggle hero. He was an experienced journalist and he had the most popular talk show on Radio 702. His readers took his views seriously. Mr. Kelani did not simply in the words of my learned friend, Mr. Oppenheimer, write an article that expressed a concern about gay marriage 
or expressed a desire to change the law or expressed an opinion that homosexuality is immoral. Mr. Trelawney, on the contrary, told his readers the following. He told them that homosexuality was responsible for the rapid degeneration of values and traditions in society. He scoffed that you regularly see men kissing other men in public, walking, holding hands. With those words, he took an intimate moment, shared between people in love, and debased it. He dehumanized the community. He likened homosexuality to bestiality, and he asked rhetorically when some idiot would demand to marry an animal. He called in aid Robert Mugabe, who a few months before the article was written, had said publicly that gays and lesbians were animals, that they were like pigs and dogs, and that they should be turned over to the police. He used the technique of othering. He referred to the group he targeted as these people. And he said what these people do is against the natural order of things. And finally, he said that their sexuality is a lifestyle choice and he thereby invited the notion that homosexuality is not part of a person's identity, but rather something that could be corrected or fixed. Justices, he wrote his article at a time of unprecedented levels of violence against the LGBTI community. The evidence presented before the High Court showed that lesbian women in South Africa were literally having their identities beaten out of them at the time he wrote his article, while they were either gang raped or murdered. His words had a profound impact on the LGBTI community. There were hundreds of complaints lodged with the Human Rights Commission and over a thousand with the press ombudsman. Mr. Clelani made it quite clear that he did not care. In his own words, he wrote, quite frankly, I don't give a damn. Wrong is wrong. Justices, jurisdictions all over the world recognize that speech like that undermines the pursuit of equality and the eradication of discrimination. And experts around the world have written, like the Psychological Society's former president, Professor Nell has written about a series of implications of hate speech for the target groups. And I'd like to highlight just three. They've highlighted the strong correlation between the prevalence and tolerance of hate speech in a society and the prevalence of hate crimes in those societies. They've written about the internalization of hate speech and how it impacts on a victim's sense of self-worth and often results in self-doubt and suicide ideation. And in the words of Professor Nell, they've also looked at how dehumanizing speech sends a strong message about whose experiences count and whose don't, who has value, who does not, who is welcome, who is not and whose life is normal and acceptable as compared with those which are branded as unnatural, abnormal and abhorrent. Justices, against that factual background, I'd like to make two legal submissions to the court today. We've dealt extensively in our heads of argument with the different tests that different jurisdictions have devised in order to regulate hate speech. I'd like to focus on one of those jurisdictions and one of their judgments, and that is the Watkit decision of the Canadian Supreme Court. I'll explain in a moment why I commend it to this court as being particularly useful in the task that you have before you. And then the second topic I'd like to address is one of remedy. If I may commence with the Watkit decision, 
Justice Compepe and members of the court, I will submit that it shows three important things relevant to the issues before the court today. The first is that it shows that the Supreme Court of Appeal was incorrect with respect in its treatment of comparative law. The second thing it will show is the fundamental error in the approach of my learned friend for Mr. Quilani, when he says that regulating hate speech and the promotion of equality are somehow distinct notions. On the contrary, what Watkins shows is that they are inextricably linked in a society that is committed to eradicating discrimination. And then finally, what could provide some very useful, I will submit insights on remedy, which will then lead me into the final submissions. So if I may just begin with Watkins and what it was about, it's a, 90, it's a 2013 decision of the Canadian Supreme Court. Justices, you'll recall that at paragraph 85 of the Supreme Court of Appeals judgment, and you'll find that in the record at page 281, the Supreme Court had the following to say about its comparative research. It said, none of the democracies referred to by Webb, I'll come to a moment about Mr. Webb's article, have regulation in a form that is akin to or even comes close to Section 10 of the Equality Act. Now, I'm sympathetic to the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal referencing Webb and not having looked at Watkins because Webb's article was written in 2011 and the Watkins decision was a 2013 decision. So, so far, I understand the limitation of the comparative analysis. But nonetheless, the Watkins decision was about the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code that had been in existence since 1979. And what I'll show you in a few moments is that its provisions are strikingly similar to the Section 10 provision of the Equality Act with which you are concerned about its constitutionality. Just to place Watkins in context, it was a case involving flyers that Mr. Watkins had distributed. And the flyers said, said numerous things about homosexuality, including that homosexuality should be kept out of Saskatoon's public schools and likened homosexuals to sodomites in our public schools. There was an outcry pursuant to the distribution of his flyers and complaints laid with the Human Rights Commission. And there the Human Rights Commission convened a tribunal that found that his uh, pamphlets had breached the terms of the Human Rights Code and they ordered that he be prohibited from distributing flyers, those flyers and any with similar uh, uh, statements conveyed and that he pay compensation to the four complainants. And that case then went on appeal and ended up in the Canadian Supreme Court and the challenge was that the section of the Human Rights Code, in terms of which he had been found liable, was in conflict with the right to freedom of expression. Usefully, the case, in fact, attaches as an annexure the relevant excerpts of the Human Rights Code. And so one can look at it readily to see its parallels with Section 10. I'd like to highlight just two points about the code. The first is that its objects are distinctly similar to the objects of the Equality Act. Section three of the code says the following, that the objects are to promote recognition of the inherent dignity and the equal inalienable rights of all members of the human family. And secondly, it's to further public policy in Saskatchewan that every person is free and equal in dignity and rights and to discourage and eliminate discrimination. The important section is section 14. It is a lengthy section, but for purposes now, I'll simply paraphrase it to show its similarity to section 10. Section 14 said, no person shall publish any representation that exposes or tends to expose to hatred, ridicules, belittles, or otherwise affronts the dignity of any person or class of persons on the basis of a prohibited ground. And like our Equality Act, there was a definition of prohibited grounds. Justices, in a detailed and careful analysis of the constitutionality of that section, 
there were five points made by the court, which I submit have particular relevance for the task before this court. And so I'd like to just highlight those, if I may. The first was the value of linking hate speech regulation to its legislative objective. In paragraph 48 of the judgment, the Supreme Court of Canada said the following, a, a prohibition of hate speech will not eliminate the emotion of hatred from human experience. Employed in the context of human rights legislation, these prohibitions aim to eliminate the most extreme type of expression that has the potential to incite or inspire discriminatory treatment against protected groups on the basis of a prohibited ground. So it's manifestly, one looks at what hate speech does to a society in the retardation of the achievement of equality and the impact that it has in discriminating against persons. And that guides the proper limits of its regulation. The second point that the court made is a valuable insight on how to reconcile hate speech regulation with freedom of expression. And it did so in the following terms at paragraph 51. It said the distinction between expression of repugnant ideas and expression which exposes groups to hatred is crucial to understanding the proper application of hate speech prohibitions. Hate speech legislation is not aimed at discouraging offensive ideas. It does not, for example, prohibit expression which debates the merits of reducing rights of vulnerable groups in society. It only restricts the use of expression, exposing them to hatred as part of the debate. It does not target ideas, but their mode of expression in public and the effect that this mode of expression may have. Usefully, when the court comes to understand what type of speech it is that constitutes hate speech, it identifies two requirements. It must be speech that vilifies or in respect of whom detestation of the target group is conveyed. Those are the two requirements for hate speech. My learned friend, Ms. Nkuai Tobi for the Human Rights Commission talked in language of demeaning. That's intrinsic to the notion of vilification as that is set out by the court uh, in its paragraph 42. But those are the cardinal aspects of hate speech. It vilifies, debases and it demeans. And finally, the court was very clear to reject the very link that both my learned friend, Mr. Oppenheimer today in his argument and the Supreme Court of Appeal in its judgment said is required for these limitations of speech. That's the link between the speech and some consequent causal impact. Justice, as you'll recall that at paragraph 33 of the Supreme Court of Appeals judgment, the court held that there was no evidence presented to show a link between the article and any subsequent physical or verbal attacks on members of the LGBTI community. Well, this is what the Supreme Court of Canada had to say about that type of approach to hate speech regulation. At paragraph 131 of its judgment, the court said the following, such an approach, however, ignores the particularly insidious nature of hate speech. The end goal of hate speech is to shift the environment from one where harm against vulnerable groups is not tolerated to one where hate speech has created a place where this is either accepted or a blind eye is turned. And so this requirement of causality is resolutely rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada. And why that is, comes in the next paragraph. The court is entitled to use common sense and experience in recognizing that certain activities, amongst them hate speech, inflict societal harms in and of themselves. And I know that that's an argument which my learned friends for the Nelson Mandela Foundation will pick up. But the issue is not that you must prove some consequent harm. The harm lives in the speech itself because it retards the achievement of equality. 
And so just Ms. Hoffmeyer, I... sorry, Ms. Hoffmeyer, sorry, Ms. Hoffmeyer, as I said to, to Mr. Oppenheimer, it seems to me that even if there is a causal link required, the evidence compellingly shows that there was already a conflict, conflict flagration and uh, all that the article did was to add fuel to the fire, is it not? In any event on the evidence, which by the way, Mr. remains uncontested because Mr. Kwilani did not testify. Indeed, Justice Majid. We, we agree wholeheartedly with your assessment there with respect. The point of principle though, is that we would submit it is incorrect to set as a standard for constitutionally compliant hate speech regulation that you must prove such a causal link. Because jurisdictions like Canada and many others that we've traversed in our heads of argument recognize that there is harm in the speech itself. Not because it's offensive, not because it shocks or disturbs, but because it communicates hatred on a prohibited ground in circumstances that constitutes discrimination. Justices, we submit that there can be no doubt that Mr. Kailani's speech did just that. It vilified the LGBTI community by invoking Robert Mugabe, by likening homosexuality to bestiality, by taking a moment of intimacy between people in love and reviling it, by referring to homosexuality as unnatural, invoking words such as shameful and ridiculing the children of gay couples. And justices, that brings me to the question of remedy. The Psychological Society of South Africa submits that this court should overturn the Supreme Court of Appeals dismissal of the equality complaint and reinstate the order requiring an unconditional apology from Mr. Trelani. Justices, for the same reasons that my learned friend, Mr. Trengove indicated that this would not in any way mean that Mr. Trelani was being held to account for a standard that didn't apply when he wrote his article. We similarly make those types of submissions because even if this court is concerned with some aspect of the overbreadth of the section and consequent upon that decides that a declaration of invalidity is required. The court will of course be mindful of the injunction in section 1721A of the constitution to declare it invalid to the extent of its inconsistency. And that's the point that I'd like to go back to Watkett on because just as you'll recall that when I read section 14 to you, I read it in its full expanse before the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada. In its full expanse, it was targeting not only speech which exposed to hatred, but speech which ridiculed bel and belittled. And what the Supreme Court of Canada did in its judgment is it regarded those parts of section 14 as overbroad. It said regulating speech that just ridicules or belittles does not pursue the legislative objective of eradicating discrimination. And so it in fact found the section unconstitutional to the extent that it had crossed a permissible boundary and regulated belittling and ridiculing speech. But it kept intact that call which is constitutionally compliant and it found Mr. Watkett guilty on that call, which was constitutionally compliant because his flyers exposed the target group to hatred. And we submit a similar result could come from this court. Uh, it could do so with an interim reading in order that removes, if this is the court's concern, the overbreath. And I give just an example. Before I give the example, I should be clear what we would suggest is not the appropriate reading in order, is the reading in order that the Supreme Court of Appeal gave. Because for all the reasons that my learned friend, Mr. Kuai Toby, for the Human Rights Commission has shown that section 16.2c is the wrong starting point for a debate about the constitutionality of section 10 of the Equality Act. The right question is, in the language of my learned friend, Mr. Trengo, does it do the work of section 9.4 of the constitution? And it can do that work by simply taking the language of section 10, for example, as an interim measure, 
and having it read as follows. The publication or communication of words based on a prohibited ground against a person that can reasonably be construed to indicate a clear intention to promote or propagate hatred. Justices, I should be clear, there's a lengthy debate that has to be engaged with before you get to that result. But that is a reading on an interim basis of section 10, which we submit deals with the issues of vagueness, deals with the issues of overbreath, deals with the issue of potential subjectivity. And even on that more reduced version of section 10, we submit Mr. Kailani fell foul. Mr. Kailani justices knew exactly what he was doing when he wrote his article. He knew that he was engaging in hate mongering. He was clear about it. In his own words, he said, and by the way, please tell the Human Rights Commission that I totally refuse to withdraw or apologize for my views. Justices, we submit that it is now time for this court to order Mr. Kailani to give an un unconditional apology for the hatred communicated in his words that has no place in our constitutional scheme. Justice Kampepe, if there are any, unless there are any questions, those are our submissions. Thank you, Ms. Hofmeyer. Ms. Hobden. Thank you, Judge Kampepe. Justices of the Court, the Women's Legal Center is joining this litigation today as the third amica curiae in order to demonstrate to the court the way in which section 10 of the Equality Act can act to promote the equality, dignity, and safety and security of women in South Africa. And it intends to do so by emphasizing the unique impact of speech on women in this country, the obligations of the state to do something about that, and by stressing the way in which this impact must be taken into account when considering the constitutionality um, of section 10. We have two broad submissions. The first is a standalone submission, but also fits within the limitations analysis. And that submission is that the state should regulate certain kinds of speech that fall outside the section 16 to exclusions. And that misogynistic speech is one of those kinds of speech, that it is a constitutional imperative. The second point we seek to make is to look at the question of whether in this instance, the state has done this regulation in a constitutionally permissible manner. And there we engage with the section 36 analysis and we engage with the crux of it, which is really the proportionality inquiry. And we submit that when one looks and keeps at the front of one's mind, the purpose of this legislation, its constitutional objectives and the consequences of this kind of speech, the Equality Act in Section 10 in particular provi provides a clearly proportionate response and any infringement on freedom of expression that may arise is justified. So on the first issue, the submission of the Women's Legal Center is that the state should re regulate misogynistic speech. And we submit that this is really the starting point. One should not start the inquiry in this case at, with the rights of the perpetrator. One should start the inquiry with the rights of the people who are the targets of the speech. Now, the Human Rights Commission and the minister and some of the amici have explained that the regulation of certain kinds of speech outside the internal um, hate speech limitation is the constitutional imperative and that arises from section 9, 4 and section 7. And, and we wholeheartedly agree with that. The Women's Legal Center submits, however, that this constitutional imperative is heightened when in respect of speech directed at women. And there are two reasons for that. The first is because of the unique nature um, of misogynistic speech directed at women and its serious impact on the rights of women. And the second is because of the particular obligations that the state has towards protecting, promoting, and fulfilling the rights of women in this country. So in respect of the first issue, we submit that misogynistic speech on its own undermines equality, dignity, and the safety and security of women. I don't need to tell this court about the high levels of physical violence and sexual violence experienced by women in this country. It has been accepted um, countless times by this court. Sadly, it's something that one could almost take judicial notice of. 
And the courts have accepted that physical violence threatens, undermines, and infringes constitutional rights of women. In Masia, Justice Inkabenda pointed out that privacy, dignity, and equality are, are infringed by sexual violence and rape. In Carmichael, this court said that violence is the single greatest threat to the self-determination of women. And in the Western, he Western Cape High Court in Bridgman, the High Court spoke about the way in which gender-based violence undermines the very founding values and enfeebles our democratic enterprise. Women's Legal Center submits that those statements by the courts and this jurisprudence um, in respect of physical violence applies equally to verbal violence against women. And this is what we refer to as misogynistic speech. Misogynistic speech infringes rights in the same way that physical violence does. It forms part of the continuum of violence against women in this country. Misogynistic speech aims to exert control. It tries to instill fear, it threatens, it humiliates. We accept that in not in every case, misogynistic spe speech may not comprise an actual threat of violence to a particular woman, but its effect in every case we submit is to create an environment of fear. As this court has mentioned, it adds fuel to the fire and we submit in respect of women in this country, it is not just um, a simmering fire, it is a, it is a massive blaze. And the courts have accepted that, it, that the threat of the infringements of these rights is in itself um, an infringement. This court has recently um, cited and mentioned the, the dic well, one of the statements in, in Chapman, um, in a case in 1997, where this court said, the rights to dignity, privacy, and integrity of every person are, the basic, are basic to the ethos of the constitution and to any defensible civilization. Women in this country are entitled to the protection of these rights. They have a legitimate claim to walk peacefully on the streets, to enjoy their shopping and their entertainment, to go and come from work, to enjoy the peace and tranquility of their homes without the fear, the apprehension and the insecurity which constantly diminishes the quality and enjoyment of their lives. And we submit it is this fear, apprehension and insecurity that all misogynistic speech feeds into. Similarly, in F versus the Minister of Safety and Security, this court, this court stated quite clearly that the threat of sexual violence to women is indeed as pernicious as sexual violence itself. And it goes to the very core of the subordination of women in society. It entrenches patriarchy and imperils the freedom and self-determination of women. It is sad and unacceptable that few of our women or girls dare to venture into public spaces alone, especially when it is dark or deserted. And justices, we have debated the consequences of the particular speech in this matter, Mr. Golani's article, and the evidence led at the trial about um, the link to particular kinds of harm. And Mr. Nukatobi from the Human Rights Commission had explained the way in which speech can transition from words into actions. And we say those principles um, and what the court can learn from the evidence led in the case um, in the present matter applies equally to the situation of women in this country. The second way in which misogynistic speech um, infringes rights is that it perpetuates structures and systems that exacerbate power and balances. It silences and excludes, it creates, it reinforces patriarchal structures, which we all know in this court has accepted in Masia and more recently even in Shavalala. These patriarchal structures exclude, discriminate. It is the very origin of sexual violence. Very often it is these ideas about women and where they come from, men, men's entitlement to women's bodies that give rise, um, give rise ultimately to, this, to the actual act of sexual violence. And if I may at this point give an example, and I know some of my, my colleagues were anxious about examples in this context, but I think it's an important um, away point um, at the moment. If we imagine a situation of a young woman walking home at night in the dark, um, on a winter's evening on her way home from work. She passes some men sitting at a bar tavern who say, come and have a drink with us. She politely says, no, thank you. One of the men sitting with his friends calls, shouts out after her, you're just a whore. 
Now, that feels uncomfortable just to say it in this setting, but I want us to think about the, the impact of that speech. On our current jurisprudence and our current understanding of section 16.2, that speech would not constitute hate speech proper. It's unlikely to be, to be interpreted by the courts as speech which incites harm or violence or advocates, advocates hatred. However, we know that that speech is harmful. We know that that speech is referencing power relations in society. That speech is referencing the fact that men think they are entitled to women's body, bodies. It is sexualizing that woman. It is degrading her. It is referencing the very fear that she has to live with every single day when she simply walks home from work. And in that respect, justices, the Women's Legal Center submits that misogynistic speech that some may call benign, or as my learned friend called everyday sexist speech, that kind of speech is not benign. That kind of speech builds into patriarchal structures causes harm itself to women and forms part of the continuum of violence that women have to endure and ultimately that impacts women's rights every single day. That being the case, the question is, what is the state's obligation to do about that? Women's Legal Center submits strongly and we don't shy away from it. Um, Media Monitoring Africa is, is anxious about this proposition that the state somehow has an obligation um, to regulate this kind of speech, but, but we stand by it. The state has a special duty to protect women, particularly from violence. It has a particular duty, that would include verbal violence, it has a particular duty to promote equality, and it has a particular duty to eradicate systems wherever it finds it, them, even in places where appear neutral at a first glance. And we've set out in our heads of arguments the various um, ways in which this court has explained the state's obligation. This, this court has said that the state is obliged to directly protect the right of everyone to be, free from, to be free from private and domestic violence. It said the state must take appropriate steps to reduce violence in public life. And in Karma Shell, the court went as far as to say, at times, the, court, the state may have a positive obligation to take preventative steps in respects of violence against women. So too in the case of equality, I don't need to tell this court about the importance of the promotion of equality of women in this country. And in Folks versus Robinson, the court was very clear that the achievements of substantive equality for women is, a, is truly a constitutional imperative. We simply cannot have a, a true constitutional democracy without the equality of half our population. So if the court accepts these propositions, then it must accept that legislation that seeks to prevent or minimize this kind of speech, misogynistic speech that infringes rights of women, then that legislation will be legislation that promotes equality and dignity and the safety of women and which fulfills the state's obligation towards women. So the next question we have to answer is whether in this case, the state has done so in a way that's constitutionally permissible. And we accept that there are a number of ways that the states could have gone about this. Um, we, we have been accused by Media Monitor, Monitoring Africa of, of saying that, that Section 10 is the only way um, that the state could have done so. We, don't, we say no such thing. We say it is one way. Um, and, we ex and our position is that it is a constitutionally permissible way. We don't engage on the issue of interpretation. Our learned friends have dealt with that for the last two amici. We really Excuse just me, Ms. Hobden. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, following on the example that you gave us just a few minutes ago, and the submission made by the applicants that Section 10 is vague, overbroad, uh, I'm just worried I want to check with you. On that example, if something is said to a woman passing by, she would feel that she has been hurt and, and the words would be harmful to her. Wouldn't that be the case? And if she were to approach the, the equality court on the basis of how she felt about the words and yeah, how she felt about the, those words. Would she not have a justiciable case? Yes, Justice Matopa, th that is the very point. She certainly would have a case, again, under Section 10 of the Equality Act as it stands. She, 
should the provision be struck down and be adopted with the reading in of the SCA so that it simply mirrors 16.2, she wouldn't have a case. And our, our submission to the court is that is the very, that is the importance of section 10 in the context of our society is that it provides recourse to women in that particular situation. Because section 16.2, we submit, doesn't, doesn't necessarily incorporate all the kinds of speech that women are subjected to and which infringe their rights. If I can move on to the um, two points about interpretation that, that we wish to make, we, we align ourselves with the interpret, interpretation offered by the Human Rights Commission and the Amici, and, and we accept that um, certainly um, constraints such as um, whether or not the language impacts dignity, whether it's degrading, whether it relates to a prohibited ground, um, must, be, must be used as thresholds in, in section 10. However, we we reiterate what our learned friend for the Human Rights Commission said regarding um, the fact that words can gather meaning over time by the construction and interpretation of the courts. And this, is, this perhaps goes to the, the question of vagueness. Um, our submission is that we should perhaps allow the Equality Court time to develop its jurisprudence um, regarding what, what particular kinds of language are hurtful or harmful in, in, and what particular vulnerable groups um, should be affected. This is particularly important because of the way in which so much misogynistic speech is really just viewed as um, benign, um, everyday sexist language, language that simply um, doesn't need to be regulated. And secondly, we ask this court to keep in mind the patriarchal origins of our law. And as um, Justice Victor mentioned, the importance of the court's role in developing principles um, that will advance the fight against gender-based violence and, and safeguard the constitutional um, values um, of women. So those are just two principles we, we highlight in respect of the interpretive exercise, but, but we say no more. Our next point really is that Section 10 of the Equality Act can achieve its purpose of promoting equality and dignity of women. And we say so because it goes wider than 16.2 deliberately it moves into spaces previously unoccupied the law. And although some people are anxious about that, we say that is a good thing because those seemingly neutral spaces are very often spaces where patriarchy and bias and prejudice against women exist, particularly in the law. And secondly, it creates a process that we say creates a very important space and platform for these issues to be discussed um, and also an educative purpose. Um, Ms. Nkukotobi spoke about the value of the evidence that, that was heard at the trial about the experience of lesbians in the township. The Equality Court creates a platform um, for this evidence to be brought to light. Um, and we see that in the, the only case um, with regards to um, gender um, before the Equality Court, the Sonke, Sonke Justice Network case um, against Mr. Malema. And there, Mr. Malema was brought before the Equality Court because of statements he made. Um, he made a statement that a woman who has not enjoyed sex with a man will leave early in the morning. But if she has enjoyed it, she, um, she will stay for breakfast um, and ask for transport money. Now, that for many people is, was considered a very benign statement. Um, but what, what happened is Mr. Malema was forced to go to court. He was forced to listen to evidence of a number of experts about the way in which those kinds of statements perpetuate um, rape culture in society um, and rape myths, ideas about what a woman's consent is, how one tells uh, when a woman has consented, and what a woman's conduct um, should be or should expect it to be after, after she has been um, raped. So whatever, one, whatever view one takes about the outcome of that case, the Women's Legal Center stresses that the very process is important. Um, there's certainly not an equal playing field as my, my learned friend, Mr. Trangrove mentioned. And, and the suggestion that a woman who's met with um, misogynistic abusive language in a dark alley at night must somehow counter that language in the moment against to that man is, I don't want to use the, ridic the word ridiculous, but it, it really, it is as Mr. Trengo put more politely um, than I would, it simply doesn't meet with reality. What is required is for the, the state and the law to intervene to create, create a space 
um, for those debates to happen in a safe in a safe way. Our last point, justices, is, is simply that any limitation that on freedom of expression is proportionate, and this is simply because of the huge impact of the speech on women. It impacts life, safety, dignity, and equality. These are fundamental constitutional principles. They are core values. With that being the case, we look at what is actually being limited. What is limited in, in our context for misogynistic speech is really just men's rights to say hurtful, harmful, and violent things to women. And we say that is not speech that is, should be given um, undue protection um, under the Act. There's certainly no one suggesting that one cannot debate legitimate issues about gender and sex and patriarchy and society. What we are saying is that speech with little or no value that harms women and undermines their rights should be regulated. And in the circumstances, the Women's Legal Center um, submits that the order of the Supreme Court of Appeal should be overturned. We align ourselves with the submissions on remedy made by the previous two amici. Um, and our submission is that the provision as it stands um, should, the provision is constitutional and should be allowed to, to stand. We make no submissions on the factual um, case against Mr. Polani. If I may just check um, with my learned friend. Unless the court has any questions, those are the submissions of the Women's Legal Center. Thank you, Ms. Hopton. Ms. Meyersfer. Thank you, Justice Kampepe, members of the court. The position of the fourth amicus is very clear that section 10 of the Equality Act is constitutionally valid and that the publication by Mr. Twilani is in fact a hallmark, a paradigmatic example of hate speech, both in terms of our constitution, but also in terms of international law. The purpose, Justice Kampepe, of SALT's intervention is to bring to the attention the principles of international law applicable in this particular case to hate speech. And we do that for several reasons. The most obvious, of course, is that Section 20, uh, 233 and Section 39 of the Constitution compel this Honourable Court to consider international law when interpreting the Bill of Rights, and of course, to favour any reasonable interpretation of legislation that is consistent with international law. And our proposition is that international law does both with the result that section 10 must be read conjunctively and that it is not vague, but clear and precise or sufficiently clear and precise. But we also present the international law position, members of the court, because they help very practically to unpick the knot that has been anguishing the parties in this matter. International law has spent decades dealing with the arguments, the concerns, and the very legitimate questions that are floating now in the realm of argument before this court. And in particular, Salk will make three points at the stage of the proceedings. And the, point, the first is that sexual orientation according to international law, falls within the concept of gender. In other words, gender is no longer about the binary between male and female, and as I will explicate in a moment, it is in fact one and the same thing, and that puts to bed any discussion about whether sexual orientation should or should not be part of the, 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 the Equality Act, and I'll explain further why. That's our first point. The second point, is that customary international law obliges states to prohibit hate speech on the basis of sexual orientation. And that if sexual orientation were to be excised from the protective ambit of the Equality Act, that has the potential of placing South Africa in violation of international law. And the last point, and possibly the most pertinent for the purposes of the discussions before this honorable court, is that international law has developed principles over time that have crystallized into very practical, clear recommendations, definitional con concepts, 
have developed that help this court and with respect, all courts dealing with the Equality Act to navigate section 10 in a very reasonable and clear way. With your permission, Justice Kampepe, let me begin first with the principle about gender identity and sexual orientation in, gen in international law. It is trite that this court has recognized that gender is a socially constructed term. And the notion in international law is that gender includes not only the, the male and female binary, but that it also includes the way society organizes different sexes and what is expected of them in that role. And those who- Ms. Ms. Mayerfield, I, I don't really, I didn't wish to interrupt you, but I have to clarify this. Um, because my anxiety arises from the fact that it seems our constitution distinguishes between so sexual orientation and gender. And now the question that comes to my mind is how are we then going forward if we accept what you are um, proposing to us? How are we then dealing with it? Should we assume that all the time when, when, when there's, 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 there's talk of gender that it also includes sexual orientation or vice versa? I'm saying that because the constitution distinguishes between them. And, and that is precisely our proposition. At the time of the crafting of the constitution in 1994 and 1995, sexual orientation was an underdeveloped concept in international law. In fact, at the time, of course, South Africa was in splendid isolation and in actually including sexual orientation as a ground of discrimination. But over that time, since 1994, with the particular point being 2007, the United Nations adopted the Jogjakarta principles, which we cite in our heads of our heads. And later, where the Human Rights Council, which is one of the leading uh, councils in the United Nations system, several decisions coming out of international courts and out of the African Commission, and I will take uh, your justices through that, all of them are categorical. Gender and sex include sexual orientation. Now that does not denude the delineation made by the Constitutional Assembly in section 9.3, but it does mean that it would be inconsistent with the international law not to interpret gender in terms of section 16.2c as including sexual orientation. Now, as we will show, the inclusion of other grounds is not limited just to sexual orientation in terms of international law. But if this court is reluctant- I promise you, I'm not going to ask another question. Can I, can I just wrap up this question? Um, I think my anxiety stems from the fact that uh, there, is, there is a deliberate, um, there is a deliberate action let me put it, that, let me say that for, for the lack of a better word, uh, by the LGBTI community to be accepted and for their rights to be recognized. And I'm just worried that if we then, when we deal with those minorities, we then sort of put them under gender, whether we will not actually be, um, um, disadvantaging that, that community in a way, because my sense is that there are certain nuances or there are certain challenges that they face that are not really faced by people who are within the so-called or then, uh, you know, who, who, are, who are said to fall within the traditional gender of men and female. I, I understand is your, your question, does it dilute the importance given to sexual orientation? And the answer is twofold. The first is in an ideal world, there would be specific reference to sexual orientation, but more importantly, in today's international standards, 
gender itself is understood to include the way in which people perceive themselves and their sexual and gender identity. It goes beyond the binary of male and female. And it is that principle, whether it is one that is an ideal one, whether it is one that this honorable court feels is sufficiently extensive, is, is not with respect the point. The point is that if this court with respect were to remove sexual orientation as a ground, a protected ground against hate speech, it would devalue the concept of gender in section 16 sub 2c. And it puts pay to this question of whether sexual orientation should be included or not. Because if the international law principle, which this honorable court is enjoined to consider, lends an interpretation to gender that includes sexual orientation, then with respect, that is the interpretation that should be, that should be followed. And, and while I hear the concern about whether there is a diminution in the value and strength of protection against uh, LGBTI persons simply by merging them into gender, the answer is no, because it's rather that gender as a concept has been expanded beyond male and female. And we've seen this acceptance, if I may proceed, Justice Kampepe, members of the court. We've seen this acceptance because the, the innermost concept of male and female or a blend of one another has garnered a significant amount of violence. In 1992, the Committee for the Implementation of the Civil and Political, uh, the, the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights in the case of Tunin versus Australia, held that the reference to sex in the prohibition in Article 2 of the ICCPR, the International Covenant of, of Civil and Protective, uh, Political Rights, includes sexual orientation. That is at paragraph 8.7 of that case. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights, in the case of Riffo versus Chile, held categorically that sexual orientation and gender identity of persons is a category protected by the Inter-American Convention's reference to gender and sex. The similarly, the European Court on Human Rights, as recently as 2020, held that the prohibition of discrimination under Article 14 of that convention, the European Convention, covers issues related to sexual orientation and gender identi identity within the concept of gender. And the, 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 the similar component, the, the unifying factor between discrimination based on the traditional notion of gender and discrimination based on the current notion of gender being sexual orientation and gender identity, the similar, the similar problem is that society punishes people who do not conform with the way gender roles are constructed. That is the problem posed by gender discrimination. And so on that note, Salk proposes with respect that the term gender in section 16.2 of, uh, of the constitution should be interpreted not only as being a distinction between women and men, but also as protecting persons who identify as LGBTI from hate speech. And the second reason why- oh, Sorry, can I just interrupt you? Have you got those references in your heads of argument, Ms? Yes, Justice Victor, um, I right. do, and I can refer to those paragraphs as well, if you would like. Um, considered about the, the, the 2020 case. Yes, so that's the case of Bezaros versus Lithuania. Uh, and particularly the provision I'm quoting is found at paragraph 113 of that judgment. And there are other judgments. Pejdialant uh, is, is another um, case that we discuss extensively in our heads of argument, which similarly, similarly, confirm the proposition that gender includes sexual orientation. 
The next point regarding sexual orientation as a protected ground, and I'm aware that I'm focusing on sexual orientation, but I will come to discussions about the other enumerated grounds in the Equality Act. But it is a principle of customary international law that states are obliged to protect LGBTI persons from hate speech. And I'll take this honorable court with your permission, Justice Kampepe, through very briefly the development of this principle. But I also wish to explicate the reason why this principle has developed. And the reason why it has developed is because the notion because of the notion that one's sexual orientation and gender identity is as core and immutable as to one's identity, as race, ethnicity, nationality, and religion. And this has been recognized once again by a miscellany of courts. And, and we and, and by a miscellany of international courts, forgive me, and also by several bodies within the United Nations. So for example, the, twenty eleven report of the human uh, of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights noted that homophobic and transphobic violence is especially vicious compared to other bias motivated crimes. This was confirmed by the African Commission of Human Rights in resolution 275 in 2014. They spoke about the fact that sexual orientation is immutable and has resulted in corrective rape, so-called corrective rape, physical torture, murder, arbitrary arrests, and an array of other harms, all of which typically occur or are perpetrated against people based on their race or religion. In the 2012 case before the European Court on Human Rights, in the case of Fejdialand versus Sweden, the court specifically said, sexual orientation should be treated in the same way as categories such as race, ethnicity, and religion. Because sexual orientation is a characteristic that is fundamental to a person's sense of self. There are other court cases that I describe in our heads of argument. I will not go through them unless the court requires, but they all make the similar point. And this, this process of developing customary international law began in, one could arguably say in 2007 with the adoption of the Jogja Karata principles, which are now considered to be universal principles of the rights, the human rights of LGBTI persons. The Office of the High Commissioner of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is the highest human rights body in the United Nations system has called on states specifically to prohibit incitement of hatred, violence, and hostility on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity, and to hold to account those who transgress that. The Human Rights Commission has taken that approach several times and in 2016 actually appointed an independent expert in terms of the UN mechanisms to develop these principles around discrimination, violence, and hatred against LGBTI persons. And most recently, in, section, uh, in 2019, the United Nations Special Representative or Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, the entity responsible for protecting the speech that the applicant and, and the FXI and MMA are so concerned about, that Special Rapporteur has been categorically clear that given the expansion of protection worldwide, the prohibition against uh, incitement should be understood to apply to the broader categories now covered under international human rights law, including sexual orientation, and that is at paragraph nine of that report. In the same year, 
26 mandate holders, 26 special rapporteurs of the United Nations, all of them experts in their area of human rights, including the special rapporteur on freedom of expression, including the special rapporteur on racial discrimination, all of them came together presenting a statement that hate speech against LGBTI persons must be eradicated. And the reasons for that have been explicated by previous uh, parties before this court, not least of all by the Psychological um, Association of South Africa. So the point is, given this miscellany of instruments and court cases and human rights, the United Nations principles regarding the protection of LGBTI persons from hate speech, if that were to be excised from the Equality Act, it would have the effect of placing South Africa either in contravention of customary international law or certainly on the wrong side of it. But perhaps I could turn with the permission of Justice Kampepe, members of the court, to some of the knottier issues before uh, this honorable court that, that really are indeed quite amorphous. But because we're dealing with amorphous concepts of sexual orientation, uh, of hatred, hurtfulness, does not mean that they are not capable of consolidation. So let me start first by saying this. Very crisply, the line between that which is offensive, disgusting, distasteful, even vilification, but constitutionally protected speech is where there is this incitement. International law demands a triangular relationship. There has to be a connection between the speaker, the speaker's audience, and the target group about whom the speaker is speaking. In other words, if I say, in my opinion, a particular group of persons is morally deficient and exercises a way of life that is contrary to my moral compass and my religion. And I don't like them. That's most unpleasant. I reveal myself as a bigot, but it is protected speech. However, the minute I ask for my audience to take steps against a target group, particularly one that is vulnerable, then I've crossed the Rubicon into that which is hate speech. And what is this notion of hatred? There is an enormous body of authority in international law, starting from the Camden principles on freedom of expression and equality, all the way through to the 2019 reports and cases I've already discussed. And hatred is identified as an intense irrational opprobrium against a certain group. And it's rooted in hostility and intolerance. And what of this really contentious notion of, of uh, hurtful? Psych it's very simple. Psychological harm is part of the understanding of violence in international law and in South African law. Now, one has to incite people to hurt you, psychologically to be hurtful. That is the key difference. But it's perfectly acceptable to have that language in the Equality Act. And what is the manifestation of this difference? What is the manifestation between I don't like someone versus I want you to not like them too in a way that is going to be hurtful or harmful? That's the notion of advocacy. And we see this language in Article 20, Sub 2 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to which South Africa is a signatory and has in fact ratified. And it states that hatred, hate speech rather, is the advocacy of incitement to uh, is, is incitement to create discrimination, hostility, or violence against a target group. That is it. That is your test. I will repeat it. Hate speech is advocating, which is a manifestation of hatred beyond your mere opinion. It's advocating for the incitement of others 
to discrimination, hostility, or violence. And I want to pause here for a moment because throughout this debate today, there's been- Ms. Mansfield, as you pause, I want to remind you that you've been given 15 minutes within which to make your submission. Thank you, Justice Kampepe. Am I to understand that I have exceeded that yes, amount you, of time? Yes, you have. I will, I will very quickly uh, how much, conclude my- How much longer do you, do you need to complete your submission? With the indulgence of the court, another five minutes would more than suffice, but I also don't want to uh, take advantage of, of the court's time, uh, but five minutes should suffice. Okay, thank you. you Excuse me, Ms. Mayerfeld. Can I draw your attention to a paragraph in the judgment of the SCA? Uh, I think it's paragraph 69, where at page 274, where the SCA is quoting Professor Pierre Dufos. I just want to know what is your, your view on the opinion expressed by Professor DeForce, particularly if I were to quote where it says, it would be dangerous to ban all speech that could be construed as intending to be harmful to another person merely because of that person's race, sex, and sexual orientation. The emphasis here would be on sex and sexual orientation. I would argue, respond as follows, Justice Mapepo, thank you for that question. Um, that presents a problem if one were to read Section 10 disjunctively. International law requires a conjunctive interpretation of Section 10. If it was a mere hurtfulness without any invocation or evocation for more, then yes, it would be unconstitutional. Professor DeFosse's articulation of that provision appears to suggest that there's a disjunctive reading. And I, I would like to, if, if that has addressed your question, Justice Matoko, um, I would like to speak about the test in international law in the very brief time I have left to me, uh, because I do think it, it closes the circle on some of the outstanding questions. Very simply, the test in international law when prescribing any speech is that it must be prescribed in law, that there must be a legitimate aim, and it must be necessary and proportionate. All I want to say in that regard is prescribed by law does not demand absolute certainty or absolute rigidity. It demands only that a person, sometimes with legal assistance, knows with reasonableness is able to foresee what would be prohibited harm. And I'll conclude with a discussion of the six factors that international law has explicated to determine on a case-by-case -case basis when, sexual, uh, uh, when speech constitutes hate speech. The first is context. You have to look at the vulnerability of the group. Are there pre-existing tensions? In the case of Mr. Kualani's comments, we've heard at length the dire fear and violence in which LGBTI persons in this country live. The second, look at the speaker. The speaker and his interaction with the audience here are inextricably linked. In fact, the heading on this newspaper article is what's John got to say this week? He is a person of authority and that means he has a greater obligation to avoid discord in society. Third, was their intention? Let me say an answer to this particular question, intention is subject that, that was that person demonstrating intention is not about negligence or recklessness. It's a high standard. It's an activation of that triangular relationship. What about the content of the speech? Well, the content of the speech is not merely an opinion, is it? It's a dehumanization of the members of the LGBTI community in a way that resonates with the calling of Tutsis during the Rwandan genocide as cockroaches, with the calling of Jews during the Holocaust as lice and rats, all of which are exterminable. And 
the content of the speech calls for the exclusion of LGBTI persons from constitutional protection. That is not an opinion. That is an evocation of discrimination, hostility, and potentially violence. That speech, the reach of the speech is the fifth factor, and it reached over 25 million people. And the likelihood, which is the last factor, of, of harm occurring, not that it did occur, but the likelihood of harm occurring, I think needs no further description from us, given the nature of the submissions before us. If there are no further questions from this honorable court, I'll conclude our submissions and express my gratitude for the indulgence of the extra time. Thank you, Ms. Mayasfer. Mr. Oppenheimer. What about me, Justice Kampepe? Oh, no, uh, sorry, Ms. Gabriel. Ms. Gabriel. Justice Kampepe, it is late in the day yes. and we have the graveyard shift. So maybe take the court forward in time from the days of Leviticus to the 10th of May, 1994. And may we quote our patron, never, never and never again shall it be that this beautiful land will again experience the oppression of one by another. Therein lies the constitutional validity of the Equality Act. We make two submissions. We submit that the Equality Act is a form of a statutory delict. It's an act that provides statutory delicts based directly on the right to equality. Our law on delicts, which govern relationships between people in society, currently does not provide for a baseline protection of equality and the protection against unfair discrimination. And in this regard, we make common cause with what has been presented in terms of the genesis lying in section 9.4 of the Constitution. What that section speaks to is to ensure, for example, that the purpose listed in section 2 sub e of the Equality Act becomes the reality that our president spoke of. And that is to provide for measures to educate the public and raise public awareness on the importance of promoting equality and overcoming unfair discrimination, hate speech and harassment. Justice Kampepe and members of the court, may we say our primary submission is this. The Equality Act provides no more and arguably less than existing delictual remedies that cater to hurt feelings or concepts of pharma, corpus and dignitas. But this being our constitutional democracy, may we commend to the court what Justice O'Regan said in Kumalo and others, dealing with the Actio in Uriarum and dealing with the balancing of rights between personality and reputational rights and the right to free expression. And in that case, specifically at paragraph 27, Justice O'Regan noted that whereas the law of defamation is concerned with a person's inherent sense of worth, dignity as it is now regarded in our constitution places an additional factor on it. And this is how Justice O'Regan expressed it. She says, it includes the intrinsic worth of human beings shared by all people, as well as the individual reputation of each person built upon his or her own individual achievements. The value of human dignity in our constitution therefore values both the personal sense of self-worth as well as the public's estimation of the worth 
or value of an individual. So in the context of defamation, the delict of inuria, what is assumed constitutional significance is the right to dignity. We say that the Equality Act is the statutory equivalent with respect to the right to equality. And in that sense, we say that the statutory delicts introduced through the Equality Act are were not only constitutionally mandated, as argued by um, Mr. Trengrove, but that it is necessary and needed in this country. One has only to look at the differences between ordinary civil law remedies, delictual remedies, and the remedies that are available under the Equality Act. First, we can point to three, three major aspects as to why these are necessary uh, remedies in our law. It provides inexpensive access to the most marginalized group to have access to justice, to participate in decision-making over how they are treated. Second, it provides far wider standing, replicating as it does section 38 of the constitution to people who wouldn't ordinarily have a cause to complain under tr the traditional um, common law concepts of standing. The Sonke gender justice case is, is a case in, um, in point. Third, the remedies in the Equality Act are wider than our ordinary protections provided in law. They address not just the harm to an individual's feelings, but they address the harm to that individual as a member of a protected group. So the remedy that is provided is restorative and it is corrective and it inures to a protected group. So we say from that perspective, the Equality Act does no more and no less than the balancing of the right of free speech or freedom of speech with any other right in our law. That exercise has been done um, in many cases by this court since Kamalo and Holomisa and others. Then if we may turn our attention just briefly to our final point, and we, having sat here, have heard the debate between hurt and harm and insight and whether there is a difference or whether one is a subset of the other. And again, we think it would assist the court to go to events on this continent and to go to the words of the, a daughter of our soil, Judge Navanitham Pillay, in the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where Justice Pillay was considering the distinction between persecution and incitement to cause harm. And we've quoted this at page 10 of our heads. But that was the decision of prosecutor versus Ferdinand Nahimana, and we think it's instructive to understand why it is that our legislature has to keep intact the words hurt. This is how Justice Pillay approached it. And I'm quoting from paragraph 1072. Hate speech is a discriminatory form of aggression that destroys the dignity of those in the group under attack. It creates a lesser status, not only in the eyes of the group members themselves, but also in the eyes of others who perceive and treat them as less than human. The denigration of persons on the basis of their ethnic identity and other group membership in and of itself, as well as in its other consequences can be an irreversible harm. Later on in the judgment, Justice Pillay goes on to say that we measure not by intent, but by impact. And the words, the verbal aggression is itself the harm. That is what the words meant. Never 
will this land again experience the oppression of one by another? And then moving on to the difference between hurtful and harmful and in sight. We direct the court to what is well established now in, in international law, certainly insofar as convention on, of, on the elimination of all forms of discrimination, which the act expressly seeks to um, incorporate and give effect to. And what is prohibited there includes not just incitement to racial discrimination or violence, but also all dissemination of ideas, dissemination of ideas based on racial superiority or hatred. And with respect, we submit that the Supreme Court of Appeal may have been too hasty in its conclusion that other countries have not adopted similar legislation. We have provided the court with examples of the Gayson Act in France, as well as the Racial Discrimination Act in Australia, both of which con dealt with fairly innocuous speech, which didn't incite and didn't cause harm, and didn't um, actively propagate hatred, but it was hurtful in this sense it was denial speech. So to deny that the Holocaust happened. We observed very recently in this country, the shock waves that went through this country when somebody announced that apartheid was not a crime against humanity. That's hurtful speech. And that is why we say that when the legislature chose the three subsets, each has its place we would support the upholding of the Equality Act. And those are our submissions. Thank you very much, Ms. Gabriel. Mr. Oppenheimer. Uh, thank you, Justice Kampepe. I, I will endeavor to deal with um, the various submissions raised by um, the respondents and the amici uh, in as short a time as possible. Um, the, the first point that I'd like to make is that a number of the parties take the view that it would be constitutional to prohibit speech, which was the communication um, of hurtful words on one of the uh, 18 grounds uh, listed in the act. Now, a lot of very emotional language has been used to, to point out the sort of hurt that people feel when they, they hear words that they disdain, that they find shocking and offensive and repugnant. It is always very hard to try and uh, defend that kind of speech. Now, um, the difficulty is that on the one hand, a person is describing the abstract right to free speech. On the other hand, you have someone who is suffering an emotional trauma. And so there is a risk that the person talking about the abstract value of free speech will seem callous. But I'd like to point out some of the implications of having a test like that. Now, my learned friend um, for the Human Rights Commission says, well, it should be um, prohibited to demean someone on one of those grounds. Um, now, if we look at a ground like belief, now, belief encompasses a number of different kinds of beliefs that someone might have. Uh, for example, someone might believe that the earth is flat. I alluded to earlier the idea that if you call someone a fool, we should be pushed off the end of the earth for believing that the earth is flat. Well, then one would be saying something hurtful on the grounds of belief and communicating the idea, and one would be in breach. Um, similarly, if someone believes that a certain race is superior to another in the fact that they have a racist belief or a homophobic belief, that belief is a protected ground. And if one were to vilify them, to describe them as ignorant or foolish or disgusting or distasteful. Um, again, if the threshold is that the mere communication of words on one of those grounds is prohibited, then one would be robbed of the opportunity of speaking out against those sorts of beliefs. Um, similarly, if we think about um, those that are, are, are critical um, of what's described as white monopoly capital, um, 
that they'll be described as uh, land thieves who must return back to Europe. Uh, those words will be seen as hurtful on the grounds of race um, and will be seen as demeaning uh, and will be prohibited. Um, but in a, in a modern democracy, we expect this cut and thrust of debate uh, that people are able to use language to express their views often in a very strong way, in a way that will upset people and cause the sense of emotional distress. Um, but we tolerate it nonetheless. Importantly, toleration, we don't tolerate banal speech. We don't tolerate when someone says uh, the sky is blue. Um, we tolerate speech that we disdain, that we find offensive. Um, it is only that which is repugnant, which requires toleration. And the point made by, um, the, the, by Denise Myerson is that, and, and this last, last line um, of that quote, including my heads of argument, was, was left out by Council for the Minister, which is that when faced with this choice between tolerating that which is repugnant and not doing it, in other words, stifling speech and having actual eruptions of violence, we ought to choose toleration. And that is the point, that there is this vast chasm between speech which wounds, which causes emotional stress, and actual violence. Now, um, my learned friend for the Women's Legal Center has tried to erode this distinction by describing words themselves as violence. There is a huge difference between being subject to an actual physical assault or a rape and hearing words that one finds uh, demeaning. Um, now, we need to bear this distinction in mind because it's important that we don't um, create a situation where we have this, this pressure valve that is stopped when people are told they cannot speak, when they are told they cannot uh, protest, um, that there will be sanctions for it, that um, those women who have been the subject of genuine violence, who want to go out and protest that and say hurtful things like men are trash, are then told that you have breached the Equality Act and you shall not speak, it, you start to remove the options that are, that are available to that vulnerable group to react. We must also bear in mind um, that hate speech is meant to be of a certain sort. Um, and um, Ms. Myersfeld has, has dealt with in fantastic detail what those international standards are, that we are talking about the kinds of speech that leads to genocide. We are talking about situations like Rwanda or the Holocaust. It is rarefied speech. Um, and and she, she eloquently points out that it is not the mere advocacy of hatred. It is not just the vilification of a group. There must be this call to action. There must be an actual incitement. And that is what we see in the Rwanda case. In other words, it is not just calling someone a cockroach. It is this call to action that cockroaches must be exterminated, that that leads to the actual violence. Um, and the reason why there's a distinction is that if you have venomous speech being put out, it can be counted um, that we can, we can address it with more speech, that the, the best remedy to hateful speech is more speech. Um, and once we stop um, speech, we, we sort of remove those options. And as I say, that speech has played an important role in many progressive causes. Um, a number of people um, who would have lobbied um, for the right to gay marriage would have been described as heretics, that they were doing something hurtful, that they were uh, breaching the fundamental tenets of various people's religious beliefs, and that they should be silenced. And thankfully, they were not silenced. Uh, they were able to use their speech to persuade others through reason um, to change their minds. Ms. Mr. Ngatobi, Oppenheim, talking about... Yes? On your argument, it would be perfectly proper to call somebody a baboon. On, on that basis, um, there is a distinction to be drawn between hate speech, um, which refers not to a particular individual, um, but to a group. Now, all of the, the cases that are outlined in the Nelson Mandela Foundation's um, written submissions deal with, with situations where an individual is um, assaulted um, through speech in the sense that they are uh, referred to with a racial slur. Now, we know that um, in our law, since 1976, um, it has been actionable um, if someone uses a racial slur against you um, to seek compensation. Now, in other words, if we are concerned about individuals being demeaned on the basis of their race, being called baboons or having other racial slurs slung at them, they have remedies. Um, the example given um, 
uh, by Ms. Hobden is a particular woman who is called a whore. She has a remedy uh, and it is in the common law um, or it is in uh, particular statutes against harassment. But that is very different from someone who abstractly makes amusing about, um, about, about the nature of women who is not targeting a particular individual. And there we need to really accept that free speech um, is just fundamental. Mr. That's, that's not the point my sister is making. That's not the point my sister is making. The point is, what is wrong with this legislation uh, pro proscribing, if indeed it does, um, the conduct of calling a person a baboon? What is wrong with this legislation? That, that has nothing to do with whether or not there are remedies elsewhere. Please answer the question directly. Yes. Well, in other words, if the concern is that that individual will be left without a remedy, that is not the case. The concern is this, is that if someone were to say that um, those who believe in the fundamental tenets of capitalism are nothing but uh, filthy pigs or are baboons, that that speech would be prohibited, um, even if they're not speaking to a particular individual. And that seems to intrude grossly on free speech rights and on the kind of speech that we generally tolerate. There's also been this sort of suggestion that any reference to an animal metaphor must take us down um, the route of the Holocaust or Rwanda. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, it, is, it is common um, for politicians to refer to each other as hyenas or snakes um, or as baboons. And this sort of robust speech, this metaphorical language, we accept as part of the cut and thrust of dialogue. Um, and that those, those words don't always mean that someone should be exterminated or eradicated. Um, but the point is that the Equality Act goes beyond um, mere individual cases. As I say, to describe it as a, as a, as a delict uh, is improper in a couple of ways. The one is because we can have the state uh, acting as the complainant and we have this disparity of arms um, where the Human Rights Commission uh, can attract for pro bono counsel to, to assist it. Uh, because it is sort of seen as a righteous organization, whereas um, the individual who is subject to that might have to pay for their own lawyer and maybe a will to afford one. Uh, in a civil situation, both sides you know, have to employ their own counsel. And there's a limitation on the kinds of sanctions that can be put in place based on the particular injury that that person suffers. So there really is this concern that it goes beyond the realm of delict um, and is targeting not speech targeted individuals, but speech generally. If we think about... Um, how much, uh, how many opinion pieces would be hit um, because of um, generalized claims that could be deemed as hurtful to one of those listed groups? Uh, it is very restrictive. Um, so up and the solution was made that there has to be a triangular or some form of triangulation. So it's just not speech in the air. Yes, yeah, so the triangulation, in other words, um, if I understand Ms. Myersfeld, she makes the claim that we really need to take these restrictions on what we de de define as hate speech quite seriously. In other words, a proper intention test, not the test that we find um, in the Act. Um, in other well, words... Well, the Act does. Section 10 does have the, the intention. Well, um, Justice Victor, I submit that the, the ordinary it intention is test... On a uh, contended uh, reason would be contended to demonstrate a clear intention. So there's the protection. Yes. Well, if I might distinguish that description um, from what we find in, in the, in the delictual setting. In the delictual setting, if one must have the intention, in other words, the subjective um, belief um, or the, the intention to, let's say, demean someone. Um, so it is the speaker who must hold the intention. What we find uh, in Papuda is something different um, that could reasonably construe to demonstrate a clear intention to implies that a reasonable reader, in other words, not the person themselves having the intention, but the reasonable reader um, saying that it is possible that one could construe that this person had such an intention or that the words have the intention because it doesn't refer to a speaker at all, it refers to the words. Um, so it is a far cry from the ordinary intention test that we would find in the realm of delict, um, where we are looking at that person's subjective even assuming that, Even assuming that you are correct in that, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, then we, we start to be in the realm where, we, where men's ray plays no role whatsoever. And we ordinarily think that if we're going to be punishing people um, with, with fines um, or with 
forcing them to make apologies or having uh, other deterrent orders on them, that their mental states matter, uh, that in the realm of crime and delict, um, mens rea matters. And here, um, Section 10.1 talks about that the words could reasonably be construed. In other words, it places it in the realm of what the reader thinks is a possibility in which the way the words could be interpreted. That is a far cry from the international law requirements that Ms. Myersfeld refers to, where she says that there's a strong intention test. In other words, the speaker intended to do this, had that subjective belief. Um, and, and also, if we look at our constitution, when we talk about advocacy of hatred, advocacy implies that there is an intent to propagate a particular position to actively endorse hatred. That is very different from saying someone could read these words to imply that they are not even hateful, but hurtful. Um, so there is a vast gulf between what Section 10 uh, prohibits uh, and what the Constitution um, um, says is not protected. Um, there's something else which, which must be addressed. My learned friend um, for the Human Rights Commission says that Mr. Kualani um, never um, um, disputed the evidence that was put um, before the trial court. Um, and that he played no role whatsoever. Well, there's two things to be said. Before, before, before you move there, Mr. Oppenheimer, can you just at a uh, jurisprudential level in the, the context of uh, jurisprudence, can you just edify me what belief means? Yes, well, I would think that a, a belief could be any kind of belief that one could have. In other words, a belief in a moral system. Uh, in other words, if if one is a capitalist, one believes in free markets. Um, if one is religious and believes in um, a particular deity, uh, belief is an incredibly broad, um, broad category. Uh, in other words, it, it is seen as distinct as well from mere religion. Um, in other words, a, a belief could be on all sorts of things and that there's no judgment no, about no. the nature of the belief. As you see there, I'm not putting you in a corner or anything, but as you see there, you are not able to maybe point me to jurisprudence that has uh, carved out what exactly this means. And uh, so that one has an idea of the parameters and so on. So as to be able, for example, to engage properly with your examples about uh, somebody being pushed off the edge of the earth. Yes. Um, um, Justice, I, I'm, I'm unaware of a particular class. I'll, my, I'll ask my learner junior to, to have a look um, while I proceed. But, but I would say that in the absence of any particular uh, gloss on the term belief that it must bear its ordinary meaning um, and that that belief could be directed at, at any number of different um, objects. Um, as I say, one could believe in the existence or non-existence of God or the, uh, the superiority of um, certain kinds of systems. Um, uh, belief is broad. Um, it's not just true beliefs um, or good beliefs. Uh, it's uh, all beliefs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you would seriously say all beliefs. Well, that is the point. That is the difficulty. And, and to, to explain why, um, in the discrimination setting, we might think that it is improper. In other words, if, if, one of, if someone's employee um, came out and said that they believe that the earth is flat, and someone said, well, I'm firing you on that basis. I'm discriminating against you. Um, we might think that there, there is good reason to prohibit that kind of discrimination, um, that it is not fair discrimination, uh, assuming the person's not a geography teacher. Um, and, but that's very different from the speech case. Um, it, it might also be on, before I move on to my other point, to draw out some of these distinctions between speech and discrimination. Uh, it would be useful to look at how discrimination is defined uh, in, in the act. Um, so in section one of the act, um, we find that discrimination means any act or omission including a policy, law, rule, practice, condition, or situation, which directly or indirectly imposes burdens, obligations, or disadvantage on, or withholds benefits, opportunities, or, or advantages from any person on one or more of their privileged grounds. Now, that seems very distinct from speech. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Trengove, was at pains to say that, that speech is a form of discrimination. Now, speech is defined differently in the act, that the act throughout talks about prohibitions on discrimination, harassment, and hate speech. They are seen as distinct categories, not interchangeable categories. This definition of discrimination talks about acts. In other words, the act of firing someone. 
to say that that's that a speech. Yeah, uh, but, uh, when Mr. Mr. Nguyen Toby came in with uh, maybe related but slightly different nuance, and uh, I'm paraphrasing his argument, he said uh, it is artificial to say that hate speech is not about discrimination. Speech may be and often is a manifestation of the workings of a mind that subscribes to unfair discrimination. As I say, I'm paraphrasing, but that is how I understood his argument. What's wrong with that? Well, it may be the case that someone holds discriminatory beliefs, and because of those beliefs that they hold, uh, they then espouse hate speech, genuine hate speech, let's say. But that is not the same to say that... I'm sorry to interrupt, um, so that you give a fuller answer. Um, 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 and, and what, look at what uh, Advocate Mr. Nguyen Toby says in the context of what this act is about. And uh, Mr. Trengov did tell us uh, what the act is about. Uh, of course, we are yet to decide whether he's correct, but bearing in mind what uh, Mr. Trengov said. So look at Advocate Mr. Nguyen Toby's argument or the point he made in the context of what the act is about. We, it seeks to do away with inequality with the unequal treatment of, of people. So now Mr. Nugai Tobi makes this submission and he says, you cannot simply divorce utterances or hate speech from discrimination because this may be a manifestation of exactly how a discriminating mind works. So the two cannot, or at least at face value, one cannot just say the two are different. Well, what do you say to that? Well, Justice, I would say that the Act has multiple um, objects. Some of it is to um, prohibit discrimination, and the Act has a number of sections where it prohibits um, discrimination. And the other object is to prohibit hate speech. Now, it may be the case that people who have discriminatory beliefs or people who discriminate also engage in hate speech, but it doesn't seem to be the case that that's always so. Um, one, could, um, one can see them as entirely separate activities. In other words, the person who um, discriminates may not um, say discriminatory things um, or, or say things that amount to genuine hate speech. The, the, the other, to, to explain this further, Mr. Trengoves adopts this position where he says that Section 9.4 of the Constitution created an obligation on Parliament to pass legislation which included all of these grounds to prohibit discrimination and it implies speech. Um, now, it would be odd. Uh, in other words, he, he states earlier that the Constitution should be read as, as a document that is not at, in contradiction with itself. It would be odd for it to require Parliament to produce legislation which eroded the free speech rights in Section 16.1. Now, we know that uh, everything that is not, um, not talked about in 16.2 is protected speech. In other words, uh, 16.1 gives you all the speech rights that you have. And 16.2, it says it doesn't extend to these things. The implication is, in other words, that um, advocacy of hatred on a ground not listed and that constitutes incitement to cause harm is protected speech, unless it can be shown um, uh, to, be, to, be, to be, in other words, a limitation that could be justified in terms of section 36, but it falls part of the 16.1 right. Um, we know, for example, in, in Durek that child pornography was seen as part of the free speech right, repugnant speech and ultimately a, a limitation on child pornography can be justified, um, but it's still part of the right. So it would be odd if there was an obligation on parliament to pass legislation which eroded a free speech right. The other way of marrying so the, the constitution, two Sorry, Mr. Oppenheimer, it, it was quite clear, Mr. Uh, Trengrove's submission was quite clear. The constitution must be read uh, harmoniously. Yes. In other words, so and if it is- an obligation in terms of 9.4, it doesn't detract from 16.2. Section 16 of the Bill of Rights. Uh, yes, Justice. In other words, it must be read harmoniously, and the way to read it harmoniously would be then, in other words, to read 9.4 and 16.2 together, um, which implies that one could not import all of the grounds um, in 9.3, because 9.2 makes it clear that when we're in the realm of speech, that it's limited to those four. Um, so, in other words, if they are to be read together, it cannot be that there's an obligation to restrict speech on the grounds of belief, culture, marital status, and language. Um, I mean, if we think about the kinds of language debates that have gone on in South Africa over the last couple of years about what languages ought to be taught at universities um, or which universities should be subsidizing particular languages, often that speech will be quite robust. Some people might want to say that a particular language is the language of the oppressor. 
and the people who speak that language um, you know, belong in the dustbin of history. Um, that kind of speech is the kind of speech that we tolerate, but on the reading of uh, Muslim Gatobi, it would be prohibited speech uh, because it would be to demean someone or say something hurtful about them on the grounds of language, uh, which would then stop a, a discussion about what a particular university's language policy ought to be. Um, the difficulty is that there are costs involved in restricting speech, and those costs are not being taken into account. Sorry, 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 sorry to disturb you. Uh, before you depart from that point, I'm just thinking of the danger uh, of, 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 of finding that, of restricting discrimination only to conduct and taking speech out of it because it would then mean that um, unfair discrimination is only restricted to conduct. Well, I don't yeah. know if I'm making myself clear because if, if, if we find that speech does not form part of unfair discrimination or can never form part of unfair discrimination, it would mean that what is discriminatory is only conduct and that whatever a person says can never be uh, uh, said to be, to, be, to be discriminatory. Well, Justice Chiki, I would say that, in other words, that is our ordinary understanding of the term discrimination, um, that it requires conduct. And that is, the, that is the definition that is contained in the act, that speech is something else. And we can restrict speech in other ways, um, but we must use the appropriate tests for the restriction of speech. Um, that, as I say, that there is, a vast difference between denying someone a job because of their marital status, because they're divorced, and saying something demeaning about that person, um, which they might say, well, I feel discriminated against because you've said that divorcees have, um, have, are, are untrustworthy because they ended their relationships. Um, there is a difference, uh, and we must respect that difference, that, that actions um, really do speak louder than words, that actions have different kinds of impacts on people than words, that people can often rebut words. Uh, they might hear a speech that they, they deem to discriminate against them, um, but they can speak out against it in a way that might be much more difficult if one has been actively discriminated against, if one has been subject to an act taken by someone else. That example that was given by my sister Theron uh, about whether that would be discriminatory or not, if then I accept what you've just said, then it would mean that that is not unfair discrimination at all to call a person that because that is a form of speech. Yes, I think it's, I think it's better characterized as an invasion of that person's dignity. In other words, to refer to someone as a baboon um, it implies a dignity assault, but to say that it discriminates, um, just, just the insult of it seems to be a distortion of language. Um, and then I think we must, we, must, we must bear in mind that the Constitution wants to create, or well, does create separate categories regarding action and speech, and that to muddle language in this manner uh, will create a muddle jurisprudence. Um, if, I'm, if I might then turn to um, something which was stated earlier by my learned friend, Mr. Ngutobi, about uh, Mr. Kolani's um, participation in the proceedings. Um, the claim is that he um, played no role whatsoever. Um, this is inaccurate. Um, he, under oath, deposed to an affidavit. Um, and then the nature of equality court proceedings is that they can proceed either through oral evidence um, or through, through affidavits. Um, and then if we look at the particular statements that were made, in other words, it was claimed that he didn't deny uh, any of the, um, the allegations against him. Um, this would be inaccurate as well. Uh, if we turn to page 30 of the bundle at um, paragraph 127, this is an extract from Mr. Kalani's affidavit. He says, while it is so that there are instances of harm perpetrated against homosexuals as documented by some of the complaints addressed to the ombudsman, I respectfully submit that the mere expression of an unfavorable opinion towards homosexuals, no matter how tasteless it may be to some segments of society, does not carry with it the risk that persons will proceed to carry out physical violence towards homosexuals. What is required in section 16.2c is the existence of a causal nexus between the advocacy of hatred and the likelihood that the expression concerned will incite violence or cause harm. In the article, I did not advocate hatred nor call for harm to be brought upon the members of the gay and lesbian community. 
uh, the required causal connection therefore simply does not arise. Now, Mr. Kalani is making a claim about his about the speech itself, about his article, and it is done under oath. To, to say that he um, didn't participate um, or didn't put down a version is inaccurate. Furthermore, there is a finding um, from the High Court and from uh, the Supreme Court of Appeal that there was no causal nexus between uh, the speech and, and verbal and physical attacks on the gay community. Now, what my learned friend is trying to do is um, look behind that fact finding by referring to evidence in a trial transcript. But in his notice of appeal, he makes no appeal. Uh, he does not appeal any of the fact findings of the court. There is no All right, claim. Mr. Mr. Oppenheimer, may I just stop you? Where does the High Court make that finding? In his judgment? You said there's a, fi a factual, there's a finding in the High Court's judgment about the causal link of la or lack thereof. Where in the High Court judgment is that? Um, you could also, you could always answer later and ask your junior to look at it, but in the meantime, yes, uh, you say there's no, there's no cross appeal. One doesn't appeal against factual findings, you appeal against uh, an order. And that goes for a cross appeal as well. Uh, yes, there, but there's no suggestion in, in the papers that the court erred in its finding. Um, in other words, there, there is no sense of trying to upset the fact finding of that court. Um, I, 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 will, I will ask my learned junior to find that particular section um, in uh, Judge Moshidi's judgment. Um, but it is quite evident um, at, I think it's paragraph 33 of the SEA judgment. Um, um, if I might. Um, I, I will I will address those those concerns that have been raised once I once I can pull up the, the correct notations. I thought I would deal with something else, um, which is that um, Ms. Hobden talked about um, wanting to restrict intimidatory speech, um, misogynistic speech directed at women. Um, now there is some sense in which this can be done on the individual level uh, through something like the Harassment Act. Um, or through uh, in Uria cases. But also this question has come squarely before this court before um, in the matter of Moya, where the Intimidation Act was examined and ultimately found to be unconstitutional and was struck down. Uh, the wording of that act was as follows, which is that any person who acts or conducts himself in such a manner or utters or publishes such words that it has or they have the effect or that it might reasonably be expected that the natural and probable consequences thereof would be that a person perceiving the act, conduct, utterance, or publication fears for his own safety or the safety of his property or the security of his livelihood or for the safety of any other person or the safety of the property of any other person or the security of the livelihood of any person. Now, we find that that sort of intention test is quite similar. Um, that's here. In other words, it's, it is about how the person hearing the words would interpret them. Um, that it is about creating a sense of fear about their... Um, about themselves or their or their about their persons, um, and that this court found that such a prohibition went well beyond the restrictions in the constitution, um, and was found to be uh, unconstitutional. Um, so the suggestion that the state ought to be able to regulate um, everyday sexist speech uh, or speech which which inspires fear has really already been adjudicated upon by this court and found to be um, beyond the call of, be, beyond its powers. Um, uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, may I uh, just briefly return to the aspect I was dealing with earlier. When you look at the judgment of the High Court at uh, page 204, that's in volume three, at paragraph 49, it's quite a long paragraph, it goes over to page 205. It seems to me there that the Leonard Judge Mashidi Jay is discussing 
the offending statements in the article in the context of the evidence that was led before him by Professor Nell, by Ms. N, and by Ms. McQuenna. And in particular, if you look at page 205 from lines four onwards, uh, he, he, he places that evidence within the, within the realm of the, of the statements in the article. And he says later, it's clear that those statements have the potential to cause harm to members of the LGBTI com uh, community. And he links it to the evidence that he has heard from these witnesses. And then in the next paragraph 15 onwards, he deals with the, with the, with the case law, including National Coalition for Gay and Lesbian Equality and others. So it seems to me on the contrary, the, the, uh, the judge in the high court did draw that link, that causal link between the evidence and, uh, and the article. Um, well, Justice, I would say that, in other words, what's said by the High Court there is on this, um, this potential um, for harm, um, which is different from, in other words, whether the article did cause harm. Um, um, but so if we all, I'm asking you, all I'm asking you to do is to point us in the judgment to a finding by Moshidi J that there is no causal link, a, a, a positive finding that there is no causal link, because I couldn't find. Yes. Um. Did you feel the Cool. Yes. Um, ju just as if I can refer, refer you to page 196, um, which is that paragraph 34. Um, the cross-examination of MN was limited and focused on certain issues only. Uh, she does not know the applicant personally except seeing him in the press. She believes that the applicant has never interacted with people like her who he hates. Like McQuenna, MN conceded readily that the incidents perpetrated on her cannot be, direct, cannot be directly linked to the applicant's offending statements. Um, that is the, that is the, the finding. Well, well first, firstly, uh, read, the last, read, read the last sentence. However, she added that the offending statements were exacerbating the current situation where people like her are being harassed. That's point number one. Point number two, all that Mashidi J is doing here is he's narr narrating uh, the evidence are you summarizing the evidence that was laid before him, isn't it? It's not, uh, a, it's, not a it's not a finding on his part. Yes. Um, just as I, I, I must then submit that, in, in other words, the finding is less strong in the High Court uh, than it is in the SEA, where it is clearly said in the SEA that there is no link. Um, but there has been no, uh, no attack on that finding um, from the SEA. Um, but... If we, if we take seriously um, what is said by, by Selk um, on the kinds of requirements that the international law sets for genuine hate speech, um, and we think about the examples uh, given by Ms. Meisfeld, where someone expresses a strong moral view on someone else uh, and disdains them and disparages them and describes them as being immoral, um, we find that that is... Um, really the kind of language that we find in Mr. Polanyi's article, that he's making a moral claim about the nature of homosexuality, um, that his calls to action um, do not meet the kinds of calls to action one would find in, in an incitement matter, because really what he does is he, say, he says, I pray that, that politicians would have the balls to change the constitution, and that really is the expression of a desire, and it is not a desire for homosexuals to be harmed in any manner, uh, it is a desire for legislative reform. To say that he wants to withdraw um, legal protections um, on the gay community is inaccurate. Uh, we're not talking about a situation where Mr. Polanyi says that people should be uh, free to assault homosexuals or that they shouldn't be given the protection of the, uh, the police services. Um, the claim is merely that uh, gay marriage shouldn't be allowed. And bearing in mind, of course, that um, three years before, gay marriage was not allowed uh, and, and was not allowed um, throughout South African history up until 2006. Um, so in other words, what he was calling for was a legislative change. Um, 
And that is the kind of um, expression that we ordinarily think that people ought to be allowed to engage in, even if we think they're wrong. Um, and that others should be free to point out why they're wrong, um, again, using speech. So if, if this, the, the sort of various options before this court appear to be to accept um, a version of the act which prohibits the mere communication of hurtful speech uh, on some of the listed grounds, which would, which would prohibit much of the speech um, that we readily accept in our societies. Um, when I earlier uh, made reference to Leviticus, not to endorse the content of Leviticus, to point out that we are talking about a text that is readily available, um, that is owned by many South Africans, um, read from in churches around the country, um, and that many people would feel incredibly uncomfortable about the idea that it would be banned, that it would be um, a, a sanctionable offense to publish it or to communicate from it. Uh, and certainly what is said in Leviticus um, is much, much, much more offensive um, than that which is said by Kulani. Um, in Leviticus, it is claimed that homosexuals deserve death. Um, Mr. Kulani never goes anywhere near that. Uh, all he does is uh, express the concern that um, gay marriage is legal. Um, there's also been this ongoing claim that Mr. Kulani has compared gay people to animals. Now, I think part of that claim really is because the article was placed next to the cartoon. And it's important to revisit this notion that the cartoon was not placed there by Mr. Kulani. Uh, that is a cartoon by Mr. Findlay and published there by the newspaper. But it creates the impression that Mr. Kulani was drawing this comparison. Uh, at no point in the article does Mr. Kulani say that gay people are pigs or dogs. Um, he has this, this line at the end which says that soon some idiot could demand the right to marry an animal. Um, but that is not to say that, um, that homosexual marriage is the same as, as engaging in acts of bestiality. Uh, it is to point out that someone else might misconstrue this link and might demand such a right. And he says that person would be an idiot. Um, to try and make the claim that it is so direct to say that all gay people are animals uh, is, is a, a rather uh, um, unfair reading of the article. Um, and, and then to further say that any reference to an animal implies um, the same sorts of things that are said in Rwanda, that in other words, to call someone a cockroach implies that they should be eradicated again, is to, to go down that path in an unfair manner. Um, really, Mr. Polanyi's words must be read as they stand. Um, and they are the kinds of speech that um, Ms. Meisfeld has described as, uh, as the kind that are protected. They might be deemed as offensive and repugnant and disdainful, but they are expressions of a genuinely held moral belief. Um, and, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oppenheimer, just to go back again, you have now just referred to cockroaches and I raised a question with you earlier. I think my concern is, Mr. Oppenheimer, that speech need not necessarily constitute incitement in order to fall under the rubric of advocacy of hatred. What do you say about that? Uh, yes, there's a distinction to be drawn between the advocacy of hatred and the incitement of harm. Uh, that the constitution makes it clear that these are two different things. Um, to advocate hatred um, against the group is different from um, calling for them to be harmed. But the constitution says that both must be present for it to amount to genuine hate speech. Um, so there is a distinction to be drawn. Um, and we might, as I say, in the individual cases, in other words, when someone says something particularly vile and insulting to a particular individual, grant that person a remedy in the common law. Um, but that is not the same as saying that all hateful speech is hate speech, um, that it falls short, that genuine hate speech requires um, this incitement to harm elements, as Ms. Myersfeld has set out. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Ngatobi, talks about this idea of a uh, utopian society where we have um, racial harmony. And I think that is an ideal worth striving for. Um, but the difficulty is that legislatures may have a, a good, noble intent, but that there are consequences um, to the way that they draft. And if we look at the legislation that um, this court dealt with in Islamic unity, um, at paragraph 22 of that judgment, um, the, um, the CASA regulation is, is mentioned, clause 2A provides that broadcasting licenses, licensees shall not broadcast any material which is indecent or obscene or offensive to public morals or offensive to the religious convictions or feelings of any section of the population or likely to prejudice the safety of the state or the public order 
or relations between sections of the population. Now, it's that last phrase that the court um, directs its attention at. In other words, the idea of, um, um, of destroying relations between sections of the population. Now, that is a noble end. In other words, it would be best if all sections of the population got on with each other and treated each other with mutual respect and regard. Um, but sometimes people say things that are unkind. Uh, they express strongly held beliefs and sections of the population will be angry with that, um, that and they will feel threatened by that um, and they will feel offended by that. But that is what we allow in a democracy. We allow this idea that people must be free to speak um, and that they are going to offend each other along the way. And even if there is this noble end of trying to create harmony, um, that doing so uh, can be dangerous. And that's what we found through um, our, our apartheid past of, of restricting speech on the grounds that it would be um, bad for racial reconciliation, that people were told that they couldn't publish certain works, they couldn't say certain things, they were persecuted because of the political positions that they held. And that is a, a very, very dangerous path that we ought not to be um, going back towards. Um, and that some of the suggestions that we should be prohibiting speech which hurts people's feelings, even if it's on a listed ground, um, really would quell so much discussion that is vitally needed in South Africa. While you're pausing, Mr. Oppenheimer, you had promised to for your junior to look for some references in response to a question from Justice Matlanga. Section 27. Um, yes, my learned junior uh, alerts me to the following paragraph from a case in the SCA. Um, the, the citation is, it's uh, the matter of uh, Kievit Skrin, 2014-1, SA, um, 585, and paragraph 27. Uh, the following is said, um, our courts are familiar with and equipped to deal with disputes arising from conventional medicine, which are governed by objective standards, whereas questions regarding religious doctrines or cultural practices are not. Courts are therefore unable and not permitted to evaluate the acceptability, logic, consistency, or comprehensibility of the belief. They are concerned only with the sincerity of the adherent's belief and whether it is being invoked for an ulterior purpose. This is of necessity involves an investigation on the grounds of violence to demonstrate that the belief exists. In other words, what we have in that situation is not to adjudicate whether the belief is right or wrong, um, but really whether it is there. Um, and so the term belief then really is going to encompass all of the belief states that I've alluded to earlier. In other words, those that believe in the existence or non-existence of God um, or the roundness or flatness of the earth, uh, all of those beliefs are going to um, be subject to protection um, as long as they are honestly held. Um, on 